Black Key Books presents Riven, The Riven Trilogy, Book One, by A.R. Knight, performed by J. Ossing. The Angry Dead She'd been dead for a month, but damn if I didn't love her. Selena looked back at me from across the room, an ashen square occupied by swirling sheets of paper, a lone chair, and a closed door that Selena stood near. The walls were cracking, bits of mortar falling to the ground before getting swept up in Riven's ever-present breeze. Selena gripped the doorknob, but she wasn't going to open it. Not till I was ready. My right hand slipped to the hilt on my waist, tied to my belt. My fingers fit into the creases on the leather grip. I lifted it free of the holster without a sound. As I held it up, the lash unrolled and played out along the floor like a snake waiting for its chance to strike. At the end of its long tail, the lash split into a pair of metal points, points that glowed a faint blue. I've seen that enough times to not be impressed, Selena said. Her voice came with a thousand memories, scratches and scars, underlining every word. It's part of my style, I said. I walked forward to the door and took Selena's hand off the knob. No reason to risk her for this. My gloved hand took her place, and I twisted. The door opened inward, revealing an even greater disaster on the other side. Rubble from a caved-in roof spread across the floor. Stone blocks split in half or smaller pieces scattered around. Dust swirled and danced in Riven's cold light. The same gray cast colored everything in this world. Sitting on the rubble, head between his hands, was a man. Or at least what used to be one. His hair was thinning some spare spidery wisps falling to touch his dirty white collar. A bow tie hung askew beneath his neck, the lone spot of black until the man's torn trousers. He'd lost his shoes somewhere on the way to here. I noticed the watch on one hand, gold and shining. Rare to see something like that come through. Must have been a present, a treasured gift. Be careful, Selena whispered. This one's got an edge. It won't get close, I replied, and raised the lash. As my lash went into the air, its length whipping up and stretching over my right shoulder, the man looked up at me. No matter how many times I saw their eyes, they never failed to send a shiver running through my nerves. Pale blue fire burned where their pupils should be, the sign of a spirit that had been consumed that had lost what little remained of who they were. Now you've come again, the man said, standing. Come to take what's mine, as you have so many times before. This will be the last, I promise, I said. And then I swung the lash. It went forward, snapping in the air. The lash wrapped around the man's neck, the metal points digging into the spirit. The points made the man's gray skin stretch and warp as they dug in, and then I twisted my wrist. The lash turned the same color as the man's eyes, blue fire tracing from my hand down the length of the lash and through those points into the man. The spirit howled, an otherworldly noise carrying all the pain the spirit had suffered to bring him here to Riven, and to let him stay. As the blue flames covered the man, he fell to his knees and grew silent. Seconds later, I saw his eyes extinguish and twisted my wrist back. The lash returned to its normal black, and with a flick of my arm, I withdrew the coil and watched. The man stood and walked towards me. I stepped aside, back into the room with the chair, and Selena moved with me. The man kept walking, right by us, through the room, and down the stairs at the other end. 
He would keep walking on a long journey until he reached Riven Center, the thing that both made Riven necessary and terrible, the cycle. I thought you said this was a bad one, I said to Selena. He didn't even put up a fight. You heard him. He was angry, Selena said. You always say to let you know when there's an angry one here. You weren't wrong. I heard him talk, I replied. He didn't know where he was anymore. Thought I was someone else. I hate that. I hate it when they talk about before. All of them do that. Even you. But you saw his eyes. Mine aren't like that. That's true. Any spirit with those burning blue eyes was lost. Needed to be sent back. I looked at Selena's face. The smooth curves and the long scar down one side. Her eyes were gray, like the rest of this place. But her body, the blouse and pants that she wore, those still held color. And there was warmth in her lips. Warmth that I felt as I leaned in and brushed them with mine. Selena took the gesture, then looked away. There are more of them, Selena said. I keep seeing them, Carver. Keep seeing them running through the streets, losing their minds faster than before. I think they're feeding on it. Then we'll just have to work harder, I said. I told you what's happening out there. A lot of lives are being lost. Riven is going to be crowded for a while. I feel it, too. What do you mean? The rage. The anger at all the loss, Selena said, pointing to her heart, and then her head. It's like a sickness, festering inside, whispering to me, and telling me to lose myself in it, and follow the feeling to the end. I looked at her, studied those gray eyes for any hint of the fire. If you caught a spirit early enough, there were giveaways. Twitches and tells, like clawing hands and snapping motions. The surest sign was a flicker behind the pupils, a spark that always led to the angry flame. Selena had none. I realized she was staring at my hand, my hand that still gripped the lash. You're bound, I said. That should keep you safe. You can draw on my will, my life, whenever you feel that anger. Selena nodded, the same nod that she had probably given to her husband when she was alive, quiet and confident, but I could tell there was plenty left unsaid. She didn't explain, just turned and walked from the room. As I followed, a far-off bell clanged, ringing through the vast gray maze of Riven City. That sound meant it was time to go home. Time to wake up. Forbidden. The building's first floor consisted of a single room occupied by a lone table split down the middle, its two halves leaning into each other. Square windows with no glass, were bordered by empty bookshelves, long ago cleared out by other guides, before my time. How long had you been here before I found you? I asked Selena. She paused at the exit, a single doorway with the door no longer attached. Hinges hung off the sides at odd angles. The old door had been ripped off long ago. We didn't like leaving hidden places in Riven. Thirty days. Selena said. Thirty days before Wiley lost his mind. Wiley, her last husband. The one that gave her that scar. After she gave him one far worse. The man? The guy upstairs? I said. He'd likely been here a week or more. Long enough to lose himself. You and your husband had each other for help. He had no one. You promise that won't happen to me? As long as I'm alive, you'll be fine. Selena stayed quiet. She did that a lot. Whether that was because I couldn't hold a decent conversation or because she had too many memories to dive into, I couldn't be sure. 
Riven was a place for silence, though. There weren't chirping birds. No noise from machines moving, crowds talking. Only the blowing of the wind. I followed Selena into the avenue. Like the building we'd been in, the avenue was a mixture of ruins, empty storefronts, and unlit lampposts. A ghost town, filled with literal ghosts. We could see plenty of spirits, a dozen wandering the street as we looked up and down. Most were in various stages of being called, pulled to the cycle where they would vanish and find their way back to reality as a new life. Some, held through a stronger bond to something left behind, wandered with more purpose, looked at the buildings with actual curiosity or longing. Those were the dangerous ones, the ones that would inevitably turn to anger if they resisted for too long. Selena and I walked through them, passed by spirits wearing everything from rags to the wealthiest and most ostentatious of suits. There was no telling what a spirit would be wearing when they died. Overhead, an endless stream of thin clouds muted the light. Riven had no sun that I could see, only a constant gray cast. Ash filtered through the air. It was always there, had always been there, though none of the guides I'd ever asked knew where it came from. Not even Bryce. My eyes moved to Selena. Even here, she held her head high. That confidence, that willingness to confront whatever stood in front of her, I had noticed first. On the street not far from where I had crossed over. She had been fighting Wiley, right there on the road, tearing at each other. I wanted to go, Selena said as we walked along. Wanted to be cycled. But then I kept seeing them, their mindless faces as they went on. I just couldn't do it. So you explored. She turned like this every once in a while. Reflective. Curious. And I wrote, Selena said. Don't forget that. You're going to memorize those and take them out of Riven, remember? I promised, didn't I? I've heard a lot of those. I keep mine. We reached the main square for this part of Riven. On one side, opposite where we came in, stood a large clock tower. The hours themselves were meaningless here. But the count, the number of those hours you spent in Riven, that meant everything. Do you want me to walk you back? I asked. I'll be fine, Selena said, a flash of disappointment. You'll be back tonight? Should be, I said. All depends on what we hear today. Another one? With the war, we have to keep in close contact. It's getting rough out there. As I finished the sentence, my eyes took a jog around the courtyard. The large fountain in the center drew the most attention, spraying Riven's water high into the air. I walked over to it, held out my hand, and felt the splatters on my palm. Lifted it to my mouth and tried to take a sip. The liquid went in my throat, over my lips, but it tasted like nothing. Carver, are you forgetting something? Selena held me captive with a small smile. It twisted the scar, cutting across her face into a sickle, and I loved it. It seemed so fitting for this place, for Riven. Beautiful imperfection. I can't risk it here, I said. Her face fell, settled into a line. Sorry, Selena. If they found out, they'd blind me from Riven. Tonight, though, I'll meet you at the apartment. That didn't quite knock the sadness out of her eyes, but Selena pulled her mask back on, slipped one last smile, then left me alone in the courtyard. I went over to the clock tower, pulled the handle on the large double doors leading inside. The spacious chamber was full of stacked bookshelves, racks with various weapons, each one labeled for the guide who owned it. A round table and chairs sat in the center. And behind that, leaning against the far wall, was a line of beds. I slid the lash into its holder on my rack. 
pulled the long knife out of its holster on my left and slotted it beside the lash. The next rack over held a giant double-edged spear Bryce called a volge. Waving symbols were etched into the thing's pole. Bryce carved one every time he took out a ghoul. Something I hadn't done. Hadn't even seen. Bryce always said I was lucky for that. I went over the beds, chose the one on the far right, and laid down. Almost as soon as I'd settled in, my eyes shut, and sleep took me. I crossed over. Every morning. The morning paper shot over my head as I woke up. The end of the tube came in over my window, looking out over the streets west of downtown Chicago. The tube launched mail, paper, anything small enough to fit up from the ground and into my apartment, where it landed in a small basket. The wall behind that basket, a jutting edge made just for this purpose, was padded with a thick cushion I'd nailed on when the first cracks from repeated impacts started to show. The start of the tube, at street level, had a small gate that only opened if you pressed the correct sequence of numbers on the keypad next to it, prevented any kind of nasty bombs or pranks that people would otherwise send through the mail. Outside the window, Chicago's hazy morning was beginning. The sun bled yellow through a smoky filter. Buildings played staccato in the distance, and in between their rises shifted the occasional hulking mass of a mech, given away by their belching smokestacks. The sky overhead was peppered with thick blotches of varying length. Zeppelins, carrying passengers, products, or in the case of the large one persistently hovering over Lake Michigan, prisoners. The cloudless March sky made it look like it would be a nice day. I stood up and took the three steps from my bed to my kitchen, a squat affair with the table on one side, my icebox on the other, and the single oven in the middle. I pressed the button on the top of the icebox, and it appeared to split, the cover rising to reveal two sides. On the left were the truly frozen items, an empty half, save for a bottle of Nikolai's finest vodka. I reached for it, then paused. Not this morning. There was a meeting that I'd have to be presentable for. The other side was loaded with small packets of food. One, labeled breakfast number three, was on the top, and I grabbed it. Breakfast number three was the best. Eggs and bacon. Only two of those per week. I slid it into the oven and turned it on by rotating a small dial on the front. Sparks sprayed out the back of the machine as it spooled up, adding their singes to the black smears on the wall behind. Then I had the chance to actually take a look at that paper. The usual headlines about the war dominated. Wins, losses, speeches by generals and politicians about how this was either the greatest time or the end of time. I hunted for the numbers. They were buried, hidden in small boxes at the bottoms of the articles. A thousand here, another five thousand there. Each and every one of those would be going to Riven. Most would be angry. Everyone worried about the cost of war for the living. Nobody seemed to care what it meant for the ones who watched the dead. The oven dinged, a noise more seen than heard, as the thing stopped its shower of sparks, and the front door popped open. A pair of tongs hung on the wall next to the oven. Using its hook, a spindly metal grabber, I fished my breakfast out. I picked out my utensil from the container on the table, a tall cylinder with my name, Carver, embossed into it, a welcome gift from the other guides when I came here. The utensil was a thick tool with a slider built into the stem. I slid it back a notch, hiding the spoon and revealing the fork, stabbed it into the mix of bacon and eggs, and stuck the salty goodness in my mouth. They'd done a real nice job with the taste on this one. A glance at the label on the package, breakfast number three, and beneath, flavored with cheddar. That'd be why. Every once in a while, the processors got a deal on something tasty and stuck it in. 
I took an extra minute to savor every bite of this one, as I probably wouldn't get another for a month or more. Then, a brief visit to the shared showers on my floor. Always a crowded squeeze, given the hot water for our building only lasted for an hour in the morning. Five o'clock to six o'clock. That's what you had if you needed a hot shower. Most days, I didn't care. But today, there were standards. Today, I'd be going outside. I put on an undershirt, and the only sweater I owned. A faded green, with the letters CR sewn into the back. My initials. Another gift. This one from a girl I'd known a long time ago. She would have laughed if she knew I still wore this thing. Thick work pants, loaded with pockets. And then, the coup de grace. My coat. A marker of status. Thick and long. Originally black, but now a dusty gray. With twin lapels stretching off the collar and down part of the front. A hood that tucked behind my neck and could be pulled out as needed. Only guides wore these, and they opened doors. Shut a few, too. As I left my place, I grabbed one more thing. My mask. The metal was cool on my face, but it settled under my chin and around my ears perfectly. Every year or so, I had to take it in, get it adjusted. It had to fit tight. I rode the elevator down, and as it opened, I pressed the button on the side of the mask. A switch woven into the curling black metal, with bits of topaz sprinkled in. I'd wanted it to look like embers in the night, and the guides had delivered. I pulled over the hood and stepped onto the sidewalk. The mask started filtering out dust and dirt from the air, the lenses dulling the sunlight's bright edges from my eyes. The streets were crowded, the masses generally going in my direction, making their way to the trains going either into or out of the city. The streets themselves busy with ranging carts, treaded steel beasts hauling cargo or passengers arrayed on lines of benches, wheels crunched into gravel, sprinkling the sidewalk with pebbles. The train station was a block away, its looping entrance arch watched over by a three-story tall mech. The machine stood on four legs that bled into a squat sphere of a body. Lights coated the bottom, directed wherever the driver chose. Twin smokestacks on top sat still. They'd only belch when the mech was moving. On the sides of its body were a pair of thick guns, their bullet belts streaming down and wrapping around the machine so that it seemed to be literally cloaked in golden death. These days, most people looked up at the mech and smiled. Waved. I did too. Find your peace. I nodded to the conductor as I stepped on the train. Behind me, the next passenger pulled out her chit, and the conductor punched it. Another perk of being a guide? Free rides. The train car was crowded this morning, but a pair shuffled away from a bench and let me sit down. I took them up on the offer and settled in against the window. It was as cool on the train as it was outside, a temp I was comfortable with. In the summer, wearing this coat wasn't always a pleasant experience, but without it, I didn't get the perks. So even if I was liable to become a pool of sweat, I wore the damn thing. Across from me, a man and his son stared open-mouthed at my face. Their masks were of the ordinary variety, a plastic covering that did its job, but nothing more. That lack of personality was echoed by the man's uniform, the plain white shirt and trousers, an average briefcase, one that probably didn't even expand when opened, didn't even have a shock lock. The kid, though, made up for the boring outfit with a healthy helping of personality. His eyes seemed to get wider and wider the more he stared at me. I smiled back at him, but he couldn't see it from beneath the mask. Got a question? I asked the kid. No, he's fine, the dad said. Let him talk, I replied, and nodded at the boy. The dad gulped, but kept quiet. Come on, kid. 
Not every day you see a guide. What's it like? The kid blurted. Over there. They always asked the same question. The same one that could be found answered in any magazine in any given month. None of these people ever read anything. Riven, not over there, I said. You want to know what it's like? It's like walking into a nightmare. The scariest thing you've ever seen, and it only gets scarier every step you take. Eventually, if you live long enough, you realize you can't be scared anymore. That the things you were scared of, well, now they're scared of you. I thought the kid's eyes would pop right out of his head. But he got himself pulled together enough for follow-up. What were you scared of? The kid asked. You ever see a body? I said. And the kid shook his head. The dad next to him kept getting paler and paler. That's the thing that happens when the stuff you only hear about in stories turns out to be real after all, and closer than you think. Well, you've got these chopped up, mangled people wandering the streets, and they're getting angry every second that they're there. They're frustrated that they have to live in this terrible place where there's no sunlight, no real food or drink, nothing to do but think about what you've lost. And eventually, they forget who they were. Then they find someone to take it out on. Someone to tear apart, because that's the only thing they can think of to do. Those people are what I was scared of. The kid was into it, nodding like he wanted me to go on. The dad looked like he was going to be sick. He grabbed his son's hand and stood up as the train started to move. Pulled the kid off the bench. We've got to move up for the next stop, the dad stammered, leading the kid away. I barely had a moment to myself before another body slid into the bench across from me. A woman going by the cream dress, one already showing stains at the edges from the air. Her mask, though, that caught my attention. Not the cheap stuff, but a silver plate with weaving white ceramic around the eyes, the usual filters over the nose and mouth bordered with gold. Flashy. So you're a guide, the woman said. I spread my hands, palms up. Didn't the coat make it obvious? It likes to scare children. Riven should scare children, I said. But it doesn't scare you. Not anymore. You go anywhere enough times, even the strangest of places start to feel ordinary. Have you been far over there? Far. A word like far didn't really apply to Riven. Where you were over here affected where you came out over there. I'd never seen a map of the place, but all of the guides crossed over in different parts of the city. Maybe just outside. That's where the spirits were, and that's where we stayed. No reason to explore a world of horrors. I've seen enough, I said. Outside the window, the train was drawing closer to the city center. The wide apartment structures, like the one I lived in, were gradually being replaced by taller offices, wide warehouses for factories, and the occasional metallic buildings that housed laboratories the places that experimented and invented the things that would go to the factories and then to our homes. Most of the laboratories were thick and windowless, owing to their tendency to explode or catch on fire. Then you know what's happening, the woman tilted her head as she asked the question. I got the impression that she didn't think I had a clue. Her voice, coming through that mask, had the same sort of tone I got from Chicago's finest, when they asked if I could find a murder victim in Riven, that I was a problem that had to be endured. The same thing that's always happening. More spirits to wrangle. Now her eyes lit up. Apparently I'd found the right word. More spirits. So you've noticed, she asked. We've all noticed. When you've got a war this big going on, Riven's going to get a little crowded. And when it gets too crowded? Don't think that's going to happen, I said. We've got enough guides, and Riven is a bigger place than people think. The train whistled to a stop, one before mine. 
The woman glanced outside the window, then turned back to me, digging into a pocket in her dress. She pulled out a card and a pen, scribbled something on it, and then handed it to me. I think your world is about to get a lot more dangerous than you expect, the woman said, standing up. I can help you. I turned the card over in my hand. On one side was a floral design, a simple slogan reading, find your peace, and a number to call. On the back, in her handwriting, was a street address, not far from where we were now. I looked back up, but the woman was already gone. Newsman. I took a deep breath as the train stopped at Union Station. You wanted a real taste of Chicago, you came here. Preferably in the morning, when Union Station was a pit of chaos. Everyone going somewhere, and everyone else trying to sell them something for the trip. I followed the crowd out of the train car and onto the platform, where my ears were blasted with shouts for a thousand things I didn't need. It was a weekday, so most of the goods for sale were targeted at workers going to their places. Newspapers, food packages for lunch, shoe shines, or lint rolls. One guy, wearing a halter over his neck that connected to long, portable shelves, sold tubes of whitener, guaranteed to remove pollution stains from your clothes. Whenever the sellers caught me in their eyes, though, they fell quiet. Guides weren't anyone's target market. Another benefit to being a guide? Even though I was in a crowd, everyone kept their space. It was like moving in my own private bubble. Plenty of room to breathe, to look around, to walk without tripping over someone else's shoes. So long as you didn't mind the stairs, it was a good deal. At least, it was until the reporter showed up. Carver, Opperman said, appearing as if by magic on my left side. He held a scribe tablet in front of him, a nifty little gadget that recorded everything we said as punches on a thick paper. By running those punches through a player later, the paper would recreate the sounds we made, and thus the words we spoke. Care to comment on the war this morning? War is bad, I said, not stopping. The main plaza of Union Station was a miraculous place to see. I still remembered my first time when my train arrived from the East Coast. Seeing the tubes covering the station ceiling, sending packages and letters to the various platforms where they would be loaded in mail cars and shot across the country. Each of those tubes colored so that, plastered up against each other, they formed a painting. A great circle with three colors, green, black, and blue, that represented Chicago's main industries, food, mechs, and research. The spire of humanity graced the center, the tall tower at the heart of the city, the seat of government for the middle third of the country. A giant display of train times, standing on a copper tube, sat beneath the painting. Each departure and arrival tracked and entered by a team of people working switchboards around the base of the column, all in plain view because, so I'd heard, the operators wanted people to know how much work it was keeping their trips on time. That's it? That's all you've got? Opperman continued. What did you want me to say? I replied. Save yourself some time and tell me what you're fishing for. Opperman nodded, his head bobbing violently. Sometimes I wondered if the man subsisted only on coffee. His movements were so jerky and his voice went so fast that it sounded like one of those children's toys wound up too tight. Have you seen it? Opperman asked. The spirit that's causing all the problems? Now I turned my head, looked at him through my mask. Causing all the problems? What spirit? My sources tell me... What sources? Opperman shrank back a step. You know I can't tell you. My hand moved to my waist, but there was nothing there. I wasn't in Riven. I didn't have my lash. Even for a guide, traveling around the city armed was a good way to get in trouble. Chicago was weapons-free, like most of the country. If you weren't in the military or enforcing the law, 
you'd find yourself in a cell before they even bothered asking questions. Then I can't trust your information, I said. Come on, Carver, you know how this works. You give me the story, and I drum up support for the guides. Make sure you have the funds you need. I haven't seen it, I said. Don't know what you're talking about. If you want, I can tell you about the spirit I wrapped up this morning. Anything interesting? An angry widow claiming she was wrongly murdered? Maybe a kid? How about a man driven to despair by this rotten city? Opperman rolled his eyes, but kept pace with me as we neared the exit. Carver, I can't get that above the fold. Maybe page three. How about an opinion piece? What kind of opinion do you want? Do you think the guides are able to handle an uprising, a mass of angry spirits led and directed by one even worse? An uprising? That was a new term. Angry spirits weren't exactly disposed to cooperation. They tended to, you know, tear each other apart. Opperman leaned forward, staring at my mask, holding the tablet up. The guy thought this was an important question, so I bit back my sarcasm. There were benefits to having the biggest paper in town on your side. Look, Chicago has three guides alone, and there are hundreds across the world. More than enough to deal with a bunch of angry spirits, I said. Remember, we're still sane. They're not. Even if they have numbers, we've got the brains, the equipment. Riven will be fine. If it's not, you'll know, because all of your dead friends will come back to find you and you won't be happy to see them. Opperman switched off the tablet, slipped it in his pocket as we went through the door and out into the street. He held out his hand, and I shook it. Now that's the quote I was looking for, Opperman said. I'll try to get the story in for the afternoon, evening edition at the latest. Can't wait. Opperman turned to walk down the street, opposite of where I was going. I let him get four steps away. Opperman! Your sources have any more useful info, you be sure to get it to me, I said. If there's really something dangerous out there, there's more to worry about than selling papers. The reporter held up his hand and kept walking. The man stuck to his principles. Had to give him that. As I turned towards Ezra's, I couldn't stop thinking about what he'd said. One spirit ruling a bunch of others? I'd never seen that before. Never heard of it. Even when Riven was crowded, Bryce said, there still wasn't any organization. Just one big, angry mob of ghosts waiting to be sent on their way. This time wouldn't be any different. Bar Times Ezra's looked over the river, stuck between a pair of bridges at the base of a bank. From the outside... All you saw were the thick gold letters hanging above the door. Nothing more than the name flanked on either end with the guide insignia, a circle in the middle, and four lines spaced around the outside. They didn't quite form a square, leaving the corners blank, but the impression was clear. Those lines kept the circle from expanding, kept Riven from breaking out. Ezra's door, unlike Union Station's, was a purifier. Most stores were these days. I opened the first metal and glass entrance and stepped into a small room, big enough to hold two or three people. The door shut behind me, and I pulled a small lever on the wall to my right. The movement opened a seal, leveraging air pressure to force the dirty haze back out into the city. The lever crawled back up, and by the time it clicked into position, the air inside the room was clean. A snap announced the inner door unlocking, and I pushed my way into the best bar in Chicago. The first thing anyone noticed about the inside of Ezra's, and the first thing my eyes went to even after all this time, was the automatic orchestra hanging above the bar. It was massive, covering the length of the back wall. Instruments carved out of wood, brass, and canvas made a collage that appeared to go deep into the wall behind as though you were actually looking into an orchestra pit. Beneath the carvings, an intricate set of speakers piped music in from the player behind the bar. Like Opperman's tablet, the thing ran on reams of punched-in paper. I'd watched them loaded a time or two, 
the bartender slotting in a scroll that weighed 20 pounds and letting it play. If you weren't sitting right at the counter, a crimson-stained bar, Ezra's had more than its share of tables and cushioned chairs. Fake candles hung from the ceiling on wires, their flickering light pointing down as though they might drip wax right on your face. It created the illusion that it was always late at night, always classy, always mysterious. You going to stare at that thing all day, or are you going to sit down and have a drink? Bryce, my mentor and Chicago's oldest guide, said to me from our table. Ezra's wasn't all that crowded in the morning. A few night shifters drinking off their hours. A dozen more putting off the start of the day with some coffee and eggs. Bryce already had two mugs in front of him, each of them ceramic, the same color as the bar. I sat down, leaving my coat on. Bryce hadn't taken his off either. He had, however, set his mask on the table. An emerald and white affair that looked like frost-kissed vines. I did the same. No need for the things in here. You want to tell me where you were this morning? Bryce asked. The man spoke in tender tones, rusty at the edges from decades in the city. Despite the question, I could see in his eyes and his raised eyebrow that it wasn't an interrogation. Tracking an angry one. Took care of it, I said. The steam coming off the coffee said it was just about the right temp. I lifted it up, took a sniff, that hot, bitter caramel curling through my nose and a second later down my throat. Pleasure burn. So, you hit your quota? One over, actually. You? Bryce grinned. It was a stupid question. The man carved up spirits like a runner carved up miles. Every single one, another routine. Something to be dealt with. The more he wrangled in a session, a single night in Riven, the better his score. Watching Bryce at work was fascinating. Sometimes he would line up angry spirits, lead them all to the same avenue, with them growling and yelling at each other, and then use that volge of his to carve through them all in a single dash. If what I did was work, what Bryce did was art. Glad you're getting better, Bryce said, and here his smile faltered. Word is, things aren't always going to be so easy. Speaking of, I ran into Opperman this morning, I said. He hinted at some sort of controlling spirit, one that was keeping all these war casualties in line, giving orders. You ever hear something like that? Bryce took a long drink of his coffee, then shook his head. Ghouls come close. They're terrifying enough, but they don't make friends. They don't lead. Did Opperman tell you anything else? I tried, but he wouldn't give up his source. Maybe we'll find out on the call. The whole reason we were at Ezra's that morning was the call. A chance to get our orders from up above. Normally only happened once a month. A couple hour-long breakfast chat about which region had the highest numbers, or if anyone had a new guide to introduce. A fallen one to remember. Lately, though, the ward bumped these up to every other week. You ever have frequent calls like this before? I asked. Happens every so often. If there's a big event and we need to step up the guiding, or there's some new practices going into effect, like when we first split the regions. Riven wasn't all that large. For a long time, the guides had all been based in London. Now, they were spread out all over the world. Recruitment happened in every area. Regions had designated times to patrol Riven. Guides worked around the clock to keep the spirit count low. It was crowded back then, right? Every hunt, every night was a chance for disaster. And glory, Bryce said. All of us would go to Riven at once, and we'd spend the night slaughtering spirits, catching ghouls that had pulled together during the day. It was harder, and we lost a lot of good guides. Still, I said, glancing down at my coffee, 
Wouldn't mind seeing one of those someday. With what's going on now, you just might. Bryce pushed himself back from the table, and I followed suit. We grabbed our mugs and headed towards a small door left of the bar. Our logo was pasted on the outside. Bryce reached into his pocket and pulled out a card with the cutout of the circle and lines, slid it into a slot in the door, and it unlocked. In the room sat a table and chairs. A gadget took up most of the middle of the table. A squat box with a speaker on top. There was only a single switch. When Bryce tapped it, the speaker rumbled with static as it connected to the line. Time to get our orders. The Guides A voice on the line was already talking, the rolling baritone of the guide leader, Peter. I'd never seen the man, only heard his voice, but I imagined the body behind that much bass would have to be huge, thick, with a thousand cigars consumed in the making of it. With the continued disruption in our European region due to the war, Peter was saying. Other regions will need to increase their quotas. This is on top of the increases made to account for the war dead. Peter sighed, audible through the line. In the background, hints of whispers made their way through. Bryce looked like he was listening intently, so I matched his expression. It was important information, sure, but hardly a surprise. I was told by our Athens sect that a ghoul was sighted just hours ago, Peter said. They did not manage to track it down, but it is evidence that we are not working hard enough. Riven is a dangerous place, and it only becomes more so as we let our efforts falter. Peter kept going, but I fixated on the ghoul. It hadn't been caught. There was one in Riven, right now, ready for me to find and take. I glanced at Bryce, but he didn't meet my look. Would probably consider it immature excitement anyway. Lastly, Peter said, take care of yourselves. This is not the time for bravery, but for cooperation. Hunt together. I have had to replace five guides in the last month, and that is far too many. That was news. Five guides. Now both Bryce and I looked at the empty chair on the far side of the table. Alec never came to these calls, preferring instead to spend the time hunting spirits or hunting love in Chicago's dark corners. Bryce let Alec go, though, because the guide was absolutely vicious in Riven. I'd seen him carve up five spirits in a row, a group of enraged lab workers decimated in an explosion that morning, still in their coats. They had come at Alec as a group, and the guide had held up his hand, warning me back. Then he'd begun what Alec called his dance. Gauntlets made of serrated silver lined Alec's arms up to the elbows, and with the same snap of the wrist that activated my lash, Alec set them glowing blue. The first spirit, howling, came within reach, and Alec sidestepped the charge, let the spirit blow by, and with a right backhand, smashed the spirit in the back of its head. At the same time, Alec's left hand jabbed out into the second one. As the gauntlet struck, their edges ripped holes in the ethereal skin of the spirits, igniting their bodies with blue flame. Using the second spirit as a shield, holding on to it with his left hand, Alec forced the next two spirits to step around. The last one, though, felt braver than its fellows and jumped over Alec's burning spirit shield. I was going to yell, but Alec saw the move and stuck his right hand into the sky. The leaping spirit impaled itself on the fist, while Alec let the burning body go from his left hand. That left a symmetrical moment, Alec with a spirit held in the air above, and a pair surrounding him on either side. As the two spirits lunged at him, 
Alec pulled his fist out of the spirit in the air and skipped back, landing three feet away on his toes. The two spirits collided in the space where Alec had been. Alec used their moment of confusion. Jumping forward, Alec brought his gauntlets together in a sweeping arc in front of his chest, collecting the spirits' heads along the way. They met in the middle, bursting into blue fire and collapsing. A moment later, all five spirits rose again, calm and dead-eyed, and began their last walk to the cycle. Alec turned to me, tipped his wide-brimmed hat, and... You weren't paying attention, Bryce said, breaking me out of the memory. I noticed the speaker was silent, switched off. I drifted. I glanced again at the empty chair, wondering about Alec. I'd say he can take care of himself, Bryce said, frowning at the space. Except for Peter's warning. None of us should be out there alone until the ghoul is dealt with. I nodded. When, then, do you want to hunt? Bryce looked at the clock hanging in the room, a black and gold piece on the wall. The carved yellow hands turned slowly against black numbers. Still early. Two, Bryce said. I have to head to the spire today. There are, unfortunately, some new members of our esteemed government that doubt the dangers of our work and would seek to reduce its funding. What are you going to do? Scare them. I found the best way to teach new bureaucrats is to make them realize all they could lose, Bryce said with a shake of his head. Yourself? Any events today? Going to go for a long walk, I said. It's been a while since I've gone around down here. Telling Bryce about the woman on the train wouldn't get me anything other than an inquisition either an admonishment that I was listening to non-guides talk about Riven, or a stern warning not to look into it without him along. Nothing against Bryce, but I didn't need him for everything. I'm envious, Bryce replied. One of these days, I'll pass off the role of liaison to you, and then I'll be the one enjoying strolls. Yeah, like that'll happen, I said. One day, Bryce said as we stood up, one day, Carver. Back out on the street, after Bryce had made his way off towards the city center and that tall black spike reaching towards the sky, I took out the card and read the address. Less than a mile away. Time to take that walk. Beneath the streets. The address wasn't even a building. It was a building to be. Blocks and bars stuck out of the ground at the construction site. Workers were gathering, looking at the plans on a giant rolling board. Nearly eight feet high, the metal board resembled a series of overlapping drapes. Levers on the side raised and lowered sections, each one with a different level or diagram presented. I watched the shifting plans for a minute, then double-checked the card, this was definitely the place, only the place didn't seem to exist. Can I help you, sir? A worker, this one's uniform bearing the blue slash across gray cloth that indicated a foreman. I held up the address so he could see. Oh, that's over here, beneath the site, the foreman said, his face breaking into a confidant smile. Didn't expect someone like you to want to see them, but I'll show you where to go see them? The foreman glanced at the workers, then back at me with a slight shake of his head, nodded for me to go along with him. We moved around the board and kept walking along the edge of the site into what would be an alleyway once the building was finished. The foreman leaned in as we went. Being truthful, sir, these people are making our work here pain. They're a mess for morale. Nobody here likes thinking about the other side the foreman said. You wouldn't be, uh, planning to get rid of them, would you? I stopped walking. The foreman took another step before he realized and looked back at me. Be straight. Who lives here? The foreman's eyes brightened. A chance to make his case, no doubt. The worst, sir. The worst, the 
foreman said, moving closer to me and sinking his voice to a whisper. You know the type, the ones who pretend to do your work. Ah, that explained the woman's attitude. Sneaks, we called them. Everyone called them. People who had the gift to go to Riven, but who either couldn't be or didn't want to be a guide. Constantly getting themselves killed by spirits they didn't know how to deal with. Sneaks sold their gift to desperate people, ones looking to send a last message, or maybe to hear one, searching for proof that a missing friend might be dead. Our work has nothing in common with a sneak's, I said. We keep people alive. A sneak profits on one's love for the dead. That's what I mean. The worst people, the foreman said. You'll find the stairs a little further ahead. They have the basement. I, uh, I must be getting back, you know. I nodded, and the man dashed away to his board. Sneaks. I squared my shoulders went ahead to the drilled-out stairs, heading down to a heavy door. There was a knocker and a handle. I pounded twice. Waited. Pounded again. Still nothing. So I tried the handle. The latch clicked, and the door swung open, revealing a short, dim hallway leading to a wide room. I walked in. On either side of the hallway sat a pair of shut doors that I ignored. The middle room appeared to be lit by candles, long ones stuck into the walls, and a candelabra on large stone table in the center. In downtown, there wasn't a reason to go without electricity, so why were they using candles? Then, above, I heard the pounding start. The construction, of course. Perhaps they had no power here. As I went into the room, however, any curiosity about the candles disappeared. All along the walls, nailed between the candles, were thick canvas maps. Dark lines stood out, with plenty of lighter versions beneath that had been partially erased. Developed as they'd gone along, then. The map's method didn't interest me so much as their contents, however. For the maps were of Riven, and of its different regions. I'd never seen any maps like these before. The guides didn't bother. The majority of the spirits were in Riven's main crumbling city, so there wasn't a need to venture outside of it. Here, though, Riven expanded into a world I'd never imagined. The city alone covered three of the maps, streets broken out in their wandering lines. The maps were covered with different colored markings, red, blue, and yellow dots scattered throughout. Their placements seemed to be at random, as I couldn't distinguish any pattern to them. Where our clock tower stood, there was a black star. I looked and found other guide entrances to Riven, marked with black stars as well. All of them. This group of sneaks wasn't a bunch of fools. They had plotted out where we were most likely to be. I moved to the next set of maps. I'd never been outside the city walls, but close a journey with Bryce to show me that Riven did not truly end at the city's edge. On one side, a vast plain with waving white stalks of grain, never harvested, always blowing for eternity in that dead wind. The map here had fewer dots, no stars. The next one covered the region on the city's west side, a dense forest, one I'd never seen, but by Bryce's account, a place to avoid. Angrier spirits stayed there, monsters we didn't have to face to keep Riven in line. The cycle stood beyond that forest, and the map dwindled in detail the deeper into the woods it went, eventually dropping into blank canvas. The third map on that side of the wall appeared to go beyond the plain, and it also disappeared into nothing. An outline of some buildings, but none of the city's detail. No interior sketches. I'd never heard of a second city, but if it followed the same trend as the forest, then perhaps it was too dangerous to be worth exploring. The last wall of the large room was split by another hallway and had one blank map hanging in the available space. The mountain written on it in deep black marker, but nothing drawn below. 
A pity the guides are trusted with a world they do not even know, said a woman's voice behind me. Something hit the back of my head and thrust me into a world of darkness. Sneaks I'd had hangovers before, but waking up to this headache was in another realm entirely, as if thought boulders were being thrown inside my brain, shattering against my skull. I didn't even want to open my eyes. If I'd been at home, I'd slip into Riven. A different world, a different body. Easier to work it off over there. You're not killing a guy down here, said the woman's voice. A familiar one. Too many would have seen him. Now I forced my eyes open, let the real pain bleed in. I was in the chair at the table in the center of the room. On the other side of it, the woman I'd seen on the train that morning was talking to a shabby man. Mangy coat, dirt-stained pants, a scarf tied tight, serving as a mask. Then I noticed the bar held in his right hand. Looked like it might have been pilfered from the construction site up top. He saw the maps, Anna. He knows what we're doing, Scarf said, the cloth muffling his voice. I tested my hands. Found out my wrists were tied to the chair I was sitting on. Thick, dark cable wrapping around the wood. More cast off from the construction site. I wondered if the foreman knew how much he was losing to these people. Did you think of how he found this place? Anna said. I gave him the address. Why in Riven's name did you do that? We need help, Lawrence, Anna said. You know as well as I do that more of our targets are angry now. It's too dangerous. Good to know, I announced. Thanks for the information. Mind letting me out? The two of them started. Then Lawrence raised the bar. I stared at him through my mask, trying to communicate the many, many ways I would make him suffer if he hit me with that again. Then Anna pressed her hand to the man's chest and pushed him away. She, still wearing her white mask, stood over me. How's your head? Anna asked. Got a show going in there, I said, but I've tuned it out for the moment. I shifted my wrists, tried to remind her that they remained shackled. Anna didn't make a move. How much did you hear? Doesn't matter, I said. You didn't say anything interesting. You had to find a cocky one, Lawrence said, sitting in another chair letting the bar clang against the floor. Only thing worse than a guide is one with a mouth. It's a fact, I said. Riven's dangerous? You think we don't know that? We've got people in Riven all day, every day, wrangling spirits to keep the numbers down, getting hurt, dying. Anna sat back on the table, folded her arms across her chest, and looked down at the floor. I jiggled my wrists again. There were limits to my vast patience. At least you're armed, Anna said. We're left to run and hide, which is why we need your help. Already helping, or I would be if I wasn't tied to a chair. If you'll please let me out, I actually have things to do today. You know who we are? Anna met my stare with serious eyes. Yeah, you couldn't hack it as a guide, and now you're here selling snake oil to people who'd give anything for one more message to their kid. Their husband. That girl they love down the street. The acid pity dripping from my voice was intentional. There we go. That's what I was waiting to hear today, Lawrence muttered. We bring people closure. Anna said. You exploit their pain. I couldn't see her face under that mask. The long silence had me picturing a series of angry responses crushed into control. What about your pain, Carver? Anything worth exploiting there? Carver. My name. 
She shouldn't have known that. I preferred my anonymity. Used it as a cloak, a shield from less than pleasant beginnings, the dangers of the present, and a muddy future. As long as I had that cloak, I could be anyone I wanted. I had no past. Repressed all that years ago, I said. Time to let me leave. I wanted to push her about my name, figure out where she'd found that information. Only I was late. Bryce would be waiting. I have an offer, Anna said. One that I think can benefit us both. I'll send you descriptions of spirits we're looking for. You can let me know where they are, or if they're already crazy. In return, I'll help you find your mother. I thought sneaks only worked in Riven. I asked the question to cover my surprise. Anna not only knew my name, but also knew that I'd never met, never seen, or heard anything about my mother. Not that orphans were exactly rare. Even in Chicago, plenty of kids lost parents to disease, war, or a machine gone wrong. Still, I go where my clients need me. So, you'll accept? If it'll get me out of here. Lawrence unlocked the cuffs, and I sprang free from the chair, rubbed my wrists, and didn't wait for another word before I walked across the room, up the stairs, out of the building. Flipped on my mask's respirator as I stepped into the dirty air and rumbling noise of Chicago's downtown. Anna could send me her list. Now that I was free, I had no obligation to answer. No way would a guide help a couple of sneaks. As for my mother, I'd never known her, and I'd made it this far. Even if Anna's offer was real, even if she had information, I didn't need it. Too smart. I swung my legs out of the bed and looked over at Bryce as he raised the cup from the small table. Riven through its muted gray light into the clock tower's windows, the usual flakes of ash fluttering around the room. It always took a moment for my body to catch up with the new sensations. The hard switch from the smells and sounds of the city to Riven's blank expanse. The first couple of times it was jarring. Now I'd learned to give myself a moment to sink into the new reality. I'd say you're late, but you already know, Bryce said. Sorry, the walk ran long. Bryce didn't ask for a follow-up, just nodded and drained whatever was left in the cup. Drinking here was more of a joke than anything. Whatever liquid existed bubbled up through pipes that no one had ever built, came out of faucets no one had ever installed, tasted a pure and perfect nothing, like drinking air. Most guides didn't bother, but I think Bryce found it calming. A bit of normal in a strange world. Grab your gear, Bryce said. With that high quota, we've got a lot of work ahead. Can't wait. Armed with my lash and the usual assortment of guide gear, I followed Bryce outside. My partner had his giant volge strapped to his back, the blades at either end gleaming against the murk. Bryce raised a finger, and I took a small tube from my belt, held it up, and pressed in a button on the bottom. A bright blue light shot up into the sky, split and sparkled azure color above the dead city, right over the fountain which I figured was a nice touch. Over the next couple of minutes, other sparks shot up and appeared in the sky. Red, gold, green, each identifying another set of guides at work. One area, to the south, showed no flash. See, this is what happens when you take too long, Bryce said. You know you've been wanting to go back. It had been a while since we had last gone into the Warrens, of the places to go hunting in Riven, the Warrens were, well, less fun. Or more, depending on how you looked at it. Bryce chose to shake his head and walk towards the south. I followed. The streets around our clock tower were mostly deserted. A few blank-eyed spirits wandered down the avenues. 
So many guides came through here that anyone even close to changing would be wrangled within moments. On the right side of the street, beneath a bending lamp post, was a melancholy man. You could always pick out the interesting ones by how they stood. A spirit that had simply gone out on their own time, wasted away from a disease or old age or passed off in their sleep. Those always looked lost, ready, as though finding their way in this next life. This guy, though, he wore a set of army fatigues, the vest and pants with the whole pack attached. What drew my eyes to him was his face, the open mouth, a silent scream stamped onto his expression, a giveaway of a person who hadn't meant to die, who couldn't believe where he was. How long you think for that one? I asked. I give him a day, maybe two. You want to wrangle him now? Save some time? Bryce hesitated, then shook his head. Potentials were always a risk. You could usually get the drop on a spirit that wasn't angry yet. They wouldn't be expecting the guide to strike. But if you messed up, or if the spirit proved better than you expected, there was always a chance it could go wrong. One of the first things I learned about Riven was he didn't go picking fights he didn't need. There's always a chance he'll be cycled, Bryce said. Always a chance. If he bites me later, I'm blaming you. It took nearly 20 minutes of walking to reach the Warrens. You could always tell you'd arrived by the way the crumbling buildings rose higher and higher, coupled by more and more stairs leading down from the sidewalks, below the ground. If Riven had ever been a real city, this is where the masses would have lived. Bryce paused between a pair of tall towers. The guides called them the Ghoul's Gateway. Any chance we'll see one today? I asked as Bryce looked the two towers up and down. It's been almost 50 years since the fight that named these things, Bryce said. Don't get your hopes up. Someday. I knew the remark. The comments about facing a ghoul always got under Bryce's skin. Sure, we'd all known guides that hadn't made it. Maybe it was disrespectful to hope for danger. At the same time, though, I wanted to see a legend live. There were a couple of ways guides started a hunt. You could wander around and hope you stumbled upon something interesting, but that usually meant relying on luck. Or lots of time neither of which we wanted to waste in a place like the Warrens. So instead, we had a couple of tricks. Let's listen, Bryce said. Not a bad call. The Warrens were tightly packed, with plenty of spirits wandering through these rooms. Using the resonator made sense. I took the small box off of my belt and placed it on the ground. The box itself was covered with mesh, wires that would vibrate if they were hit by a certain frequency of sound. Sound that Bryce and I couldn't hear. The sound of a spirit losing its mind. A scream too high frequency for our ears. I flipped a small switch on the top of the box, and we waited to see what the Warrens had for us today. It only took a minute for the resonator to vibrate. With the heat of the vibration, the wires closest to the sound glowed a faint orange. That pointed us in our direction. Straight up the street. Deeper. That was fast, I said. Getting a strong signal out here meant one of a couple things. Either we were really lucky and we had a spirit real close by. Or, worse, we had some strong waves coming in. Which meant either one very, very angry spirit or a whole bunch of them. We get a whole group... Maybe we can fill our quota in a single fight. I'll take ten single spirits over a group any day, Bryce said. It might take longer, but you're probably going to be alive at the end of it. Holding the resonator in my hand, we walked down the street, followed the tinting of the wires as the glow shifted from straight ahead to going right. The sound led us down an avenue, towards a tower that was holding together well. Few cracks in the outside walls. No collapsed floors. The base was built as an ornate restaurant. Silver letters above proclaiming it 
the castle. Above the restaurant stretched at least eight floors of a hotel, a hotel that had never been occupied, just as the restaurant had never served a single meal, at least not so long as the Riven we knew had been around. Bryce pressed on the door, a thick revolving one with four slabs that slid against the tile floor. Slid well, too. Riven was a study in paradoxes. Some things wore down, others kept working, as though the elements never touched them. I had asked Bryce about it before, but he had shaken his head. Said that Riven had its own rules, and whomever wrote them wasn't around anymore to explain. Be ready, Bryce said as he stepped into the lobby. It took me a moment to see why. The floors and walls were chipped, gashed. Chunks were missing, and not the usual crumbling of decay Riven had elsewhere. These had all the hallmarks of collateral damage. Irregular slashes and tears in the sides. An entire corner carved out of the dark wood desk that in some other time and place would have served as the greeting spot for customers. I uncurled the lash and let it dangle behind me on the floor as we moved through the lobby following the marks of the fighting. Equipped the resonator back to my belt, flipping off the switch. We were too close now to bother taking up a hand with a tool that had no use with a spirit grabbing for your throat. The damage led us back through the restaurant, a line of overturned chairs and broken tables suggesting the fight hadn't been going in a good way. The goal was always to get your spirit wrangled as fast as possible, as cleanly as possible. Drawn-out fights could always drive other spirits to investigate, bringing in more enemies than you could handle. The carnage here suggested something more desperate. Bryce froze as we neared the back of the restaurant, held up his hand, folded down his fingers so that only two pressed together and pointed straight up, the symbol for silence. A moment later, I heard the reason why. The gnashing and scrambling the tearing of a spirit in its frenzy. I wasn't a fan of this place. Too many things my lash could get stuck on. Too tight. But a guy didn't have the luxury of choosing where he worked. Bryce pushed his way through the swinging doors into the kitchen. There, lying on the central island where food would have been prepped, was a body. On top of it, chewing away with its hands covered in blood, was the ragged form of the spirit that had lost its mind. Another soldier, though this one's outfit suggested he'd suffered his death at the hands of the enemy's guns. Holes peppered the spirit's uniform. Bullet-sized pockmarks rippled up and down his arms. Some spirits came to Riven as they wanted to be, in their mind's eye, their ideal form. Others, too swept up in their own tragedy, came the same way as they left life. The vulture's edges flashed blue as Bryce, with his right hand, whipped the weapon off of his back and brought it as he ran forward, slashing at the spirit. The move was fast, but the spirit was faster. He rolled off the body and behind the island as Bryce sliced the air where the spirit had been. Pincer, Bryce said, moving around the island to the left. I went right. The spirit stood looked at each of us in turn. Blood ran down his ruined face, a hole where half of its mouth had been. No wonder the spirit was angry. His death had been the thing of horrors. As I moved directly across from the spirit, I swung the lash over and across the island. The lash was ten feet long, more than enough distance to strike the spirit. Only as my arm flipped the weapon forward, I felt a body tackle me from below. A new spirit drove me into a counter, and I rolled away from its grasping hands. Another soldier, though this one less torn up than our first friend, hiding among the dishes and pans beneath the island. The spirit lunged at me again, and I threw up my arms to block his grasp, dropping the lash and gripping the spirit's scrabbling wrists with my hands. His mouth hurled soundless curses at me, and I stared into those bright blue eyes, burning with pale fire. Then I brought my knee up into his stomach and slammed the spirit into the counter on my left. There are three, 
Bryce shouted from across the kitchen. The rattle of metal on tile announced another spirit, bursting from beneath the island, thankfully not on my side. I let go with my right hand and jacked the spirit in the face, trying to keep his biting teeth from getting a grip on my fingers. The punch knocked the spirit back a few steps, gave me just enough space to draw my backup weapon, the standard-issue long knife that every guide had, twisted the hilt, and the blade glowed blue, ready to wrangle. On the other side of the island, Bryce danced between the other two spirits. The quarters were too tight for his volge to be any good as one large weapon, so Bryce had pulled the neat trick of splitting it into two separate blades. He stood with his back against the cabinets, one blade facing each of the spirits on either side of him, trying to delay till I could come for help. My target gave a ripping howl, or tried to. His throat wasn't in the best shape. The wound that had probably killed him slashed through his vocal cords so that the scream came off as a crackling wind. Then he charged. I stepped forward with the knife, hoping the spirit would just impale himself and make this easy. But the soldier had just enough experience to dive below the blade and hit my legs, knocking me down. I felt the spirit's hands digging into my ankles as I tried to roll away, but he wasn't letting go, was trying to get behind me as I struggled with my face against the floor. Not good. Then the spirit was on my back, climbing towards my neck. I felt the hands on my throat, the cold, clammy grasp of bloodless fingers. Should have stayed down, I said. I stabbed my knife over my head, into the air where I hoped the spirit would be, and felt it bite into the thing's skin. The spirit's fingers loosened, and he rolled off of my back. I sprang up and glanced at him, but the blade had done its work. The pale fire was gone from the spirit's eyes, and the only thing left was a blank gaze. In another minute, he would start his long walk to the cycle. If you're all done over there, I could use some help, Bryce yelled. Oh yeah, guess that would be the nice thing to do. Ambushed. Bryce dove across the island as the two spirits flanking him charged. As the guide rolled off the other side, he somersaulted, landing on his feet with his back to the spirits. Without waiting, Bryce whirled around, slashing the blades behind him. If the spirits followed him across the island, they'd have been caught in the attack. Except they didn't. Not as mindless as their friend, I said as I picked up my lash. I'll take the left, Bryce replied. The man never was one for mid-fight banter. That left me with Swiss Cheese Man. Bullet riddled and bloody, the spirit came around the island towards me. I cocked the lash in my right hand, wrist ready to whip the weapon forward. The spirit's pale blue eyes locked on the lash's tip. If I just came at him, the spirit would be ready to dodge. He'd proven himself more capable than your average enraged ghost. In my left hand, I held the long knife. That was going to be my real weapon. I took a step forward with my left leg as the spirit moved in, swung with my right hand, and cracked the lash. The tendril swung through the air, straight towards the spirit's head. As I started to move, the spirit, with his right hand, swept a pan off of the island and shifted it in front of the lash blocking the strike. What the spirit didn't block was my follow-up. As the spirit focused on the lash, I stepped in with the blade, cutting beneath the pan. I felt the knife bite in, but only to the spirit's clothes. That bulky uniform had my strike missing wide left. The spirit pressed forward, allowing my blade to get tangled up in his uniform and shoved the pan into my face. Another dirty fight. I turned with the spirit as he pushed and used my grip on the long knife to shove the spirit forward. I stuck my right foot out and it collided with the spirit's ankles, tripped the bloody bastard. My long knife cut its way free in the motion so that when the spirit hit the floor, sprawling out, I was ready to close the deal. Duck! Bryce yelled and I didn't second guess, just dropped to the floor. Over my head, I felt the rush of wind as the second spirit flew by. 
a reckless dive, one that would have taken my head off without Bryce warning me. The second spirit bounced off the wall and turned, standing up, arms spread with a pair of serrated knives in his hands. And then one half of Bryce's volge sliced through the thing's face and embedded itself in the wall behind. The spirit at my feet started to scramble away, but I pinned him with the knife, right in the calf. The blue fire shot down the blade and into the spirit, draining away his rage and leaving him lying there, senseless. For the first time in what felt like forever, I took a deep breath. A pointless breath, as there wasn't really air in Riven, but it felt good anyway. Sorry, was the first thing Bryce said after he retrieved his weapon from the wall, the split-headed spirit falling to the ground. I've never seen one turn away from a fight and go after someone else. Me either. We studied the body lying on the island, the source of this whole thing. The outfit was easy to recognize. A guide, though not one from Chicago. A newer one, going by the slim tool set on his belt. You know him? I asked. Bryce nodded. Part of the latest class. He shouldn't have been out here alone, Bryce said. The name was Felix. Out of Europe. You going to tell Peter? Bryce nodded. It's my job. Then, without warning, Bryce slammed his fist on the island. I backed up a pace. He shouldn't have been here. His mentor. Where was he? Bryce said, though I could see he wasn't really talking to me. We don't have enough guides for this. We can't lose people because they decide to play lone wolf. Especially not now. Bryce, I said. Think about it. We came in here, saw one spirit, and thought it would be easy, but there were two more hiding. Felix probably had the same setup. Saw one, got ambushed. Spirits don't ambush, Bryce said. These just did. Bryce chewed the scene for a moment, glancing around the island. Then he snapped his volge together and slung it over his back. I have to go report this, Bryce said. Three is short of our quota. The quota won't matter if we're getting killed. Guides need to know that some of the spirits aren't the usual mindless drones. If they're setting traps, then Riven's a lot more dangerous than it used to be. Which was just what I'd asked for, right? More danger? I needed to learn to shut up. A past prodded. I dropped Bryce back at our headquarters, the old clock tower in the fountain-centered courtyard. Try to find Alec if he's in here, Bryce said as he went through the door. Yeah, I'll keep an eye open, but I think Alec only gets found when he wants to be, I replied. Bryce nodded. Be careful. If you're chasing your quota, don't go following any spirits down alleyways. If these were a trend... Don't worry, I can handle myself. Felix probably thought the same. Bryce held up a hand, then vanished through the door. I was not jealous of the conversation he was about to have. Any dead guide resulted in a massive review, an investigation into what led to the fatality and what could be done to prevent the next one. That's why we now carried sparkers and tried to work in pairs as much as possible. All of our tools had come about through failure. Survival today, due to the deaths of those that came before. Leaving the courtyard, I struck out to the west. Unlike the Warrens, the buildings here weren't as tall, weren't as run down. As though whomever built them had an eye for beauty rather than simple efficiency. Along the avenues I walked. Two-story shops and bungalows with swooping fronts and faded marquees dominated the sides. Had this been a real neighborhood, I imagined it would be filled with families on a night out. People looking for restaurants, a play, or a chance to see the newest fashions on display. Here, in Riven, it was like walking through a half-realized dream. I paused in front of a larger building. This one went three high stories, the tallest one on the block, each floor separated from the one beneath 
with small balconies, bordered with weaving iron, made to look like vines crawling up the side. My favorite place in the neighborhood. The place Selena and I chose for her. You around? I said as I walked into the third floor apartment. Furniture in Riven was, by its nature, a dull gray affair. But Selena and I had found enough interesting pieces to give her apartment a sense of character. A long, thin table sat in the living room, surrounded by a few different types of skeletal chairs. One metal, one wood, and another seemingly made of wicker. It was a mystery how anything like wood, made from something that had been alive, could exist in Riven, but it did. The walls were decorated with hanging, unframed drawings. Selena's. Most were of Riven cityscapes, the scenes she saw as she wandered. A couple were portraits of people I didn't know. One, of a girl and boy, I assumed were her children. I hadn't asked, and she hadn't offered an explanation. I'm outside, Selena called from the balcony. I went by the kitchen, a galley-style affair that was pointless in the food and drinkless land we were in, and out through the opening, onto the balcony. No door, no barrier for the non-existent bugs here. Selena had her hands on the railing, looking out over the city. Riven's endless haze gave the vista a fog effect, the rows of structures collapsing into the mist in the distance, as though the world vanished into nothing. It's a nice day, I said. The hair always nice, Selena said. One of the things I miss the most, and I didn't realize it until the other day, is a bit of rain. I followed her eyes up to Riven's cloud-smeared sun, or moon. It was hard to tell exactly what hung behind the cover. All we knew was that it was always in the same spot, never moving, giving Riven the constant pale cast. Look at it this way. It's never cold here. It never changes, Selena said. That's a strange thought, isn't it? That what I want more than anything else is change? You might be in luck, I said. We found something different today. Selena turned away from the sky and looked at me. That scar, those big beautiful eyes. Still no hint of the pale blue fire. I swallowed away the nervous flutters that always bustled up the first time I saw her face. Even now, there was so much packed in that simple look that I had to prepare myself before I could continue. Bryce and I, we found a dead guide. The spirits that tore him apart, they were working together. I thought all the angry ones were mindless. That's what I thought, too. I wanted to ask if you'd seen anything strange. Selena shook her head. But it's not like I'm looking for them. Unless I'm with you, I try to stay away from the angry ones. Probably a good idea. You'll keep an eye out? It's not like I have much else to do, Selena said. I wander around the city, and eventually I come back here and wait for you. I didn't know what to say to that. It wasn't like I could gift her something new. I didn't even know what she wanted. If, beneath all the grief at her past life, she wanted to find something here that could take that away, or if she just wanted to stay for a while and live with her memories. Eventually, she would go to the cycle, as would all of us. Nicholas wants to talk, Selena said after a minute's silence. He's got something he wants to show you. I suppose it's been a while, I said. You want to go for a walk? Aren't you afraid we'll be spotted? Selena's voice slid into a mocking tone. That you'll be seen with me? Anybody says anything, I'll just pretend I'm wrangling you, I replied, slapping a smile on my own face. The joke didn't get the reaction I was looking for. Selena looked away and nodded. Someday, maybe, I'd understand how her mind worked. Back on the street, we continued west, towards the edge of the neighborhood. The spots for Selena and Nicholas made sense, because they were quiet. Like Selena was saying, angry spirits had a tendency to find each other, to go where other spirits already were. We saw a few wandering around here, this part of Riven. 
was never sure why, just that it was empty. Maybe Riven's creators wanted to keep the area pristine, and so kept most of the foul things away. The other bonus was that guides rarely went here, so Selena and I had to spend less time ducking into alleys to hide. Do you ever think about your family? Selena said as we crested a hill, the street bending through what would have been a beautiful park in the real world. Leafless trees stood in plots of dead grass. Shells of bushes lined the sidewalks. On the other side, the nice neighborhood fell away into a long series of broken factories and warehouses. If I wanted to fill my quota, I'd be able to do it there, no problem. What family? I said. Bryce? No, Selena said. I mean, the ones you love. I think about mine all the time. Every day. I think about you, if that's what you mean. I don't really have anyone else. So you say. You think I'm lying? I said, guiding us to a bench to sit down for a minute. Once we reached Nicholas, it'd be hard to have a moment to think. I've never known anything other than the guides. You've never tried to figure out where you came from? What's bringing this up? I asked. Selena wrapped her arms around herself, took a slow look around the park. We used to come to places like this when I was alive. I loved to run and play. My mother, father, we would go here and have picnics on the days when he didn't work. That's not really an answer. Isn't it? Most people, they have childhoods full of memories of their parents or friends or family. I'm trying to find yours. Why? I said. They aren't very interesting. Because a woman has a right to know a little about the man who's trying to win her heart. I can tell you that I didn't go to a park like this, I said. I can tell you that I went to a series of schools, that I moved around a lot as certain houses guides had the space to take me. I was never around anywhere long enough to make real friends. That's sad. That's life, I replied. Only now that we're talking about it, you're not the first person today to bring up my family. Selena gave me a questioning look, and I told her about Anna, the sneaks, and the offer about my mother. You're not going to help her? Selena asked when I was done. Why? She'll just get herself killed running around Riven. Better if her work fails and she does something else. That's her problem, Selena said. What matters is that Anna might help you find out who she was, your mother. I'll think about it, I replied. I'll help you, Selena said, her hand reaching out and grabbing my wrist. It'll give me something to do, something to fill the time here. I wanted to say no, to tell her that risking herself in this whole mess wasn't worth it. But looking at that face, feeling the pressure from her hand, I didn't want to take that away from her. So I nodded, then stood. Come on, let's go see Nicholas, I said. Whatever new toy he has is bound to be thrilling. So long as it didn't kill me. The Bound Scientist Nicholas Salzer, a man so brilliant he blew himself up in a West Side lab district not long after I came to Chicago. I found him in Riven two days later, looking around, trying to take notes using a rock and a wooden board he'd found on the street. Like Selena, I'd helped him find a home. In return, Nicholas built my lash. The building we chose for the lab was a squat, wide structure that might have been used for machining, or maybe as a school. Inside was a large, empty space. Nicholas seemed to take the vacancy as a challenge, and filled the building with random junk he found, wandering through Riven. Selena and I came up to the front door, one that had been wood when we first found the place, now replaced with a slick steel slab. Worked metal was a rare find in Riven, but the factory district near here had a fair share for the taking. There wasn't a handle on the door, only a button on the right that, if pressed, 
would set a series of lights aglow in the lab. Nicholas insisted the lights were a better way of alerting him, as there was usually so much noise that a bell would go unheard. I pressed the button and winced. I have it. More than once, Selena and I tried Nicholas's inventions and found them to be a tad more dangerous than the inventor had explained. Nicholas blew himself apart here in Riven with unsettling regularity, pulled himself back together through the simple magic of not being alive in the first place. The door popped open, literally popped, shot off its hinges and fell over to the side, bits of smoke rising from where the door had been attached. That wasn't quite the result I was looking for, came the breezy voice of the inventor. Nicholas, wearing a set of makeshift goggles, nearly disappeared into his large, very stained and burned lab coat. His waving hand stuck out from the wide sleeve like an island in an ocean. Answering the door was getting to be too much of a hassle. I thought perhaps a more automatic means might save me some steps. How many times are you getting visited? I asked. So far as I knew, Selena and I were the only ones aware that Nicholas existed. Oh, just you. And Selena, of course, Nicholas replied. So you're building this to save yourself time for one visit every few days? I asked. It's really more of the principle, Nicholas said. It's something that is less efficient than it could be. Therefore, I must do what I can to fix the problem. Also, we're in Riven, Selena added. It's not like we don't have time. Right, time. I've been thinking about that, Nicholas said. Do you know the extent of your binding ability? Nicholas addressed the question to me, but I didn't know the answer. A guide could, as could a sneak if they really tried, bind a spirit to Riven, prevent the cycle from calling them, leave the spirit in limbo, essentially. There was always a chance a spirit could grow angry, and so guide rules forbade binding a spirit unless you had a good reason. Nicholas and the things he made qualified as a reason. Selena, well, that was complicated. Let me know if you start feeling any weird urges, or if you start getting angry, I said. Don't want you deciding the best use of your inventions is to go killing me or anyone else. No urges beyond the usual, Nicholas said. His eyebrows bounced. I'm glad you're here. I've got something fun for you to try. What are the odds it'll kill me? I replied. If you point it at yourself, high. Point it anywhere else, low, Nicholas said, ushering us inside. The lab was arranged into a large U-shape. Long tables, made from smaller desks and other furniture cobbled together, were arranged along the outside walls. In the middle, compiled tools and stacks of books sat on the hard floor. Books, in this case, being sheafs of paper that Nicholas had filled up with notes and bound together. Paper that Nicholas had made on his own by processing the wood that could be found around Riven. On the back wall sat a boiler, hooked up to a mechanism that leveraged steam to generate electricity. How Nicholas powered his lab in a world that had no other options. Nicholas led us to the central part of the U, a workbench that had on it a crossbow. It wasn't the basic kind that I recalled from medieval tales. No, this one was longer, bulkier. A lever along the main shaft cycled between three separate series of bolts. I reached for it, but Nicholas blocked my arm. Now, here you are talking about how you hope I won't kill you, and then you go grabbing for it, Nicholas said a laugh tweaking the edges of his voice. You might think that this is just a simple crossbow. Believe me, I don't think that at all, I interrupted. I suppose it is a tad obvious. I couldn't find an efficient way to hide the extra bolts. Trust me, I tried. I'm guessing there's a reason for the different types, I asked. Looking closer, the bolts were shaded, feathered with different colors. The first set was black, the middle blue, and the last orange. No, I just did this all for fun, Nicholas said. The scientist's sarcasm was like getting hit with a wet sack of flour. Of course they're different. The first ones are your run-of-the-mill bolts. They'll shoot through a spirit and pin it to the wall. 
or, you know, do a number on any living thing you run across. I'm not planning on killing a guide anytime soon. Not saying you would, only saying you can, Nicholas said. Moving on, the blue ones you can probably guess. They give you a shot at wrangling a spirit from afar. The orange ones, well, it's best if you see those in action. Without waiting for my reply, Nicholas picked up the crossbow from the table. From the way he hefted it, I could tell the thing wasn't going to be light. He shifted the lever on the shaft to the third setting, the orange bolt. Then he pulled the crank on the right side. As the crank turned, an orange bolt slipped out of its slot and shot up to the front of the crossbow, where it latched into place. As Nicholas continued turning the crank, the string tightened, pulling the bolt back into a firing position. Now, it's probably better if we try this outside the lab, Nicholas said, looking around. I'd rather not rebuild this whole place. Outside, on the street, Nicholas moved us to the center and aimed the crossbow towards the factories. He pointed it at a large container a couple hundred yards away, one probably made for holding industrial liquids in another time and place. Then, without any warning, he raised the crossbow and pulled the trigger. The orange bolt streaked off down the street and struck the container, bursting into a fiery lightning that crawled around and arced off to the surrounding building and even to the ashy flakes in the air. The burning rays jumped from object to object, expanding in a bright nova for a dozen yards or more in every direction before slowly petering out and leaving only charred wreckage behind. Riven has unique physical properties, Nicholas said into the silence. I'm still learning how it works, but the possibilities are very interesting. How hard is it to make more of those? I said. Selina and I have been making expeditions, finding the materials, Nicholas said, glancing at the woman with a thankful smile. So long as we continue, and Riven doesn't get too dangerous, keeping you supplied shouldn't be an issue. Have you noticed more angry spirits way out here? Nicholas nodded. I don't go exploring as often anymore. There are voices on the wind. Spirits, loud ones, talking with each other, making plans. The kinds of things they should not be doing. Note them for me, I said. I'll make sure they get taken care of. Nicholas handed me the crossbow and backed away a couple steps. I held it up, shifted the lever to the regular bolt, and turned the crank, ready to fire. Then I lowered it. This thing have a holster? I asked. What do you think I am? Nicholas replied. An amateur? Top Hat The guides called it the Tar Pit, the part of Riven City made up of broken-down factories. Containers, like the one Nicholas shot with a crossbow, littered the landscape and were full of unidentified sludges, liquids, or worse. After saying a brief goodbye to Nicholas and snagging a quick kiss from Selina, I went on into the tar pit to fill my quota. Bryce and I needed to get ten, and we had wrangled three back in the Warrens. That left more than enough fun for me. The crossbow hung across my back, a new weight I wasn't especially fond of, and I'd have to be careful about rolling anywhere with that thing. But if someone hands you an amazing weapon, it's worth putting up with a few inconveniences. Fifty yards into the tar pit, and I was surrounded on all sides by the cracked, massive buildings. Tall and wide, the factories took up blocks at a time. Smokestacks, silent and ominous, lanced into the sky. Fences bordered dusty lots, their chain links as often splintered and unwound as they were together. All in all, it gave the impression of a war zone, whose war had ended decades earlier. It wasn't a good place to be alone. I kept my eyes scanning the windows, what few of them there were. My ears hunted for the sounds of spirits venting their rage. The resonator might have worked, but the thought of giving up a hand to hold the thing made me hesitate. Normally, the tar pit wasn't a hard spot to find prey. 
Something about the desolate nature of the factories seemed to attract spirits who wanted space to rage. I was so focused on the factories around me that I almost didn't notice the spirit standing in the middle of the road. But when something has its eyes deadlocked onto you, you eventually feel the itch, especially when it's not friendly. The spirit was a large one, a man standing tall and straight. A wide-brimmed stovepipe hat sat on his head. Strands of scraggly hair leaked beneath the hat to below the man's chin, collecting into the collar of his ragged suit. The gray jacket cloaked over a white undershirt and brown suspenders. In one hand, the spirit held a three-foot-long hammer with a fixed spike driven into one end. On the other wrist was a gauntlet that vanished up the suit's sleeve. It was rare to see a spirit even notice the environment around it. Seeing one actually picking up weapons, that was a whole other level of dangerous. I stopped my walk ten yards away and stared at the man. The spirit's eyes held no pale fire, no sign that it had given into the chaos. Strange place to stand, I said. Any place here is strange, wouldn't you say? The spirit replied. Maybe. All the same, I'm wondering what you're doing here. That's easy. I'm waiting for you. I moved my right hand to the lash and took it off the belt. Heard that a lot today. Why? What's your name? The spirit asked. Why? I replied. The man shook his head. Because it's what people do when they meet. Spirits normally didn't ask questions. At least, not beyond the usual set, wondering where they were, how they got to Riven, how they could leave it. They definitely didn't want to know who I was. Then, today had already been one for the surreal. Might as well keep riding that train. Carver. Carver Reed, I said. You can call me Graham, the spirit replied, though I hadn't asked for his name. Tell me, Carver, do you want to see the most amazing thing? In Riven? In anywhere. Graham was starting to really mess with my head. Spirits didn't offer this kind of stuff. Didn't play games. Whatever was going on here, I made up my mind to wrangle and send Graham to the cycle. He wasn't playing by the normal rules, which meant he was dangerous. Show me, I said. Maybe Graham would give me some clues as to what made him who he was. Graham half turned back down the street and gestured with the hammer. It's a short walk this way. You're not too tired, are you? Seeing strange spirits with hammers like yours has a way of waking me up, I replied. We walked and I kept my distance, always staying a few paces behind Graham, my eyes crawling around to make sure the spirit wasn't setting me up for something worse. You ever think about what a terrible place this is? Graham said. Not really. Of course not. You get to run away. Go back to where you can feel the sunlight on your skin. Taste real coffee. Feel the world spin beneath your feet. Pay real rent. Breathe terrible air. Those are nothing, Graham snapped, glancing over at me. Any spirit that has to look around this place for more than an hour would take every disadvantage of your world for another chance at it. They had their chance. Some live a long life before they come here. What's your point? You and your brothers and sisters drive spirits to be cycled. Force them out of this place and into nothing. Why not go the other way? Bring them back. In front of us, the street ended in a large building with a curving roof. It took up more space than Union Station. The doors facing us spanned half a block, standing one after another, waiting for a crowd. Graham went right for them. Even if we could... Even if we could bring every dead spirit out and make them alive again, that would be chaos, I said. 
So many spirits don't even retain their identities. What would you do with them? I would give them another chance, Graham said. He grasped the handle on one of the doors and pulled it open. Unlike the sliding door back in the Warrens, this one screeched in protest as old joints ground against each other. Inside, there was nothing more than darkness. Graham stepped into it and disappeared. I waited for a minute, and then a flickering light burst out of nothing. Graham, now holding a torch, showed up back in the doorway. We're almost there, Graham said. Can't wait. I followed Graham into the building. Images of Felix, torn apart on that kitchen island, flitted about my mind. This was exactly what Bryce was saying not to do. Go alone with a strange spirit into an area where you could be trapped. We walked deeper down a wide hallway until Graham's torch stopped fluttering off the walls and its light disappeared into a blackness too thick to overcome. Graham paused, turned to look at me. When was the first time you felt like that? Graham said. The feeling that you're not just like the rest of them. What are you talking about? Carver Reed. Where'd you get that family name? It was given to me. I kept it. My right hand gripped the lash tighter, and my left moved towards the long knife. Ask them, Graham said. Ask them where your name came from. Ask who, I replied, but Graham didn't seem to be listening. He'd turned back to the wide open dark. And when you do, Graham said, tell them that the dead are ready. Graham leaned back and threw the torch. It whirled through the air, spinning into the dark. As it rose, the torch's light bounced off of girders and bars holding up the ceiling, and that light reflected into the corners of the factory. Standing there, standing everywhere, were spirits. Dozens. Hundreds. As one, the torch still flying in its arc, the spirits turned to look at me. Pale blue fire roaring in their eyes. Then the torch hit the ground, broke apart, and died. In the darkness, I heard the screams of the spirits as their feet pounded against the ground. Graham's cackling laugh echoed off the walls as the damned descended upon me. Chased. As my heart jumped into my throat and my eyes bugged out at the sight of the pale fire streaming towards me, training took over. My left hand abandoned the long knife and grabbed the sparker. I spun to where I thought we'd come from and pressed the button holding the tube out in front of me. A blue spark launched out through the dark. It went down the corridor and exploded against the line of closed doors. I ran after it. Behind me, Graham's laugh died, and the only noise was the growling chase of the spirits. I was five paces away from the doors when the first spirit grabbed my coat. I nearly fell, the sudden jerk stopping me and dragging me sideways as the spirit's own momentum kept it moving left. I turned with the motion, trying to keep upright, and faced back down the corridor. In the dying embers of the blue spark, all I could see was an endless line of pale, fire eyes. Some stood on top of each other, crawling over the other spirits, or crashing them to the ground, a stampede for my blood. I backpedaled, and a moment later, smashed the spirit on my back through the doors and out into the Riven Street. The tar pit loomed around me again, the sight of Riven's cold light bringing me just a bit of hope, at least until the spirit dragged me down. The spirit crushed itself beneath my body, the crossbow digging into it, but its arms were still tearing at my clothes. More were coming, leaking out through the door and charging at me. With my right arm, I flicked a lash at the oncoming wave. The lash wrapped itself around the leading spirit, 
and I jerked its feet out from under it. The spirit collapsed, and the ones immediately behind it tripped over its body. Bought me a second of time. I rolled off of the spirit, tearing myself from its grasp, and scrambled away. Pulled up to a crouch, just in time to catch the spirit's swing. The spirit looked like an old woman, wearing a ragged dress, but she swung with plenty of rage. The fist struck me in the chin and knocked me to the ground. Beneath me, the crossbow made an angry crunch as it struck the stone street. As fights went, this one wasn't going very well. The spirit closed again, her wild old eyes matching her manic grin as she went for my face. Only now I'd had time to grab my long knife. I stabbed it up as I rose, taking the spirit's punch on my forearm as I drove the blade in. The knife's blue flame swept up and into the spirit, driving the rage out of her eyes. The old woman slumped forward as I pulled the knife free. Then I looked up and wished I hadn't. Surrounding me was a line of spirits, easily three or four deep, with more streaming out of the factory every moment. Dead was too nice of a word for what I was going to be. Carver, getting a little brave over there, a voice from up the street shouted. I couldn't see the speaker, but I knew that accent. Alec. A few more than I expected, I shouted back. Some of the spirits started to turn, but they weren't fast enough. Alec crashed into the outer line, and I saw spirits fly, their bodies wreathed in blue wrangling fire. Too many wrangled for just one guide, even Alec. Then I saw the other guides wading in, throwing knives, axes, spears. He'd brought friends. The spirits weren't done. They were rage incarnate, and they came at me anyway. The three closest to me rushed forward, hands outstretched, clawing for my face. I cracked the lash wide, sending that blue tip in an arc around the three of them, biting into the right shoulder of the far one. I ran after the swing, tightening the lash around the three as its fire cleansed the first spirit. With the lash keeping them from moving, I finished the last two spirits with the knife. I looked around and saw a true battlefield. At least a dozen, and maybe more, guides were sweeping by me, led by Alec. They hacked, slashed, and burned their way through the disorganized spirits. Or they did, until some whistle we couldn't hear, some call that only the spirits could answer, caused the horde to turn away and run, to scatter back through the tar pit and leave us panting and standing amid a crowd of wrangled spirits waiting to walk to the cycle. Not all the guides had made it through unscathed. Some were scratched. Others held arms or favored legs that bled for more vicious strikes. Yet all of us appeared to be alive. Where is Bryce? Alex said. I only saw you go in there. Long story, I said, then blinked. Are you following me? Alex shook his head. Graham, that's the spirit's name, right? I nodded. I've been tracking him for weeks now. I've seen traces of this, this gathering, but never so many spirits in one place. You think he's the one behind it? I replied. Alec looked back at the factory. I don't know if it's just him, but he has an agenda. He's not corrupted, not enraged. I relayed what Graham had told me, but left out the part about my name, the part about asking the guides who I was. I wanted to ask Bryce first and get his opinion. Most of the guides, including Alec and I, went back to the clock tower or other bases. The time was drawing late, and I had a lot of questions. Questions that Riven couldn't answer. Death's Details my eyes opened to catch the last glimpse of the sun setting on West Chicago. Even the last few minutes of blaze orange and violet clouds were such a different palette than Riven that I laid there and soaked in the color. After hours in Riven, I tended to think I wouldn't see anything other than ashy gray again. Then my eyes fell on the small stand of collected mail 
shot in by the overhead pipe. On top of the usual assortment of bills and advertisements sat an envelope with my name on it. Inside were three pieces of paper. The first one, a note. Carver. Enclosed, you'll find a list of people we're looking for. Names and brief descriptions. If you happen to find any while wandering Riven, if you wrangle them or notice they're on their way to being cycled, let me know and I'll be grateful. You can find me most evenings at the Broken Beaker in the Lab District. I know you're probably thinking that helping sneaks doesn't fall in with your normal mode of doing things. I'm hoping I can persuade you otherwise. As a sign of good faith, I've included a little bit more about your mother in this envelope. I hope we can work together. Anna. The second page was the list of names and descriptions. Children, wives, husbands. The list was long. I shook my head as I looked at it. Spirits weren't exactly the talkative type. You had to catch them in the right mood. You had to get lucky. And Riven was a big place. It wasn't like I could just stroll down the street and call out some names, and they'd come running. I folded it up and stuck it in my pocket anyway. The last sheet was a surprise. It was a formal paper, thick white, with the letterhead of the main Chicago Medical Center across the top. The spire of humanity set into a red aid cross. Immediately beneath, in thick letters, were the words, Notice of Death. Catherine Reed was found dead this morning in her room, having apparently passed in her sleep overnight. Prior to this incident, Catherine had expressed difficulties with her recent pregnancy and childbirth and had been admitted to the psychiatric ward after repeated assertions that she was being threatened. Beneath the note were some signatures of doctors and the medical examiner, and beneath those, a scrawled line. I couldn't find the rest of her records. The hospital said they were lost. Anna. Died in her sleep. An answer to a question I'd never bothered to ask. At least now I knew she wasn't out there somewhere. I hadn't been abandoned at birth. I sat down on the bed and reread the certificate. Took in the doctor's names. People to find later, perhaps. Now, though, I had more urgent problems. The spirit named Graham had a death wish for me, and an army at his back. I needed to talk to Bryce. If anyone knew how to tackle Graham, he would. History Lesson We met at Ezra's, as usual. When I got there, Bryce was already a couple rounds in. His face and its dead frown said as much about his day as did the empty glasses in front of him. They don't care, Bryce said. Peter says too many guides are dying to bother with the particulars for each one, that nobody has the time anymore. I hate to say it, but I kind of agree with Peter on this, I said, taking the first sip of an amber ale. I found the multi-flavor played well with the lingering aftertaste of Chicago pollution. A frothy, stinging drink. I nearly died this afternoon. Bryce looked up, slanted his head in a questioning look. Went hunting the tar pit and found a spirit. He was holding a hammer, and he talked to me. Holding a hammer? Bryce said. Yeah, one with a spike in it. Had something on his wrist, too, but I never found out what that was. A goofy outfit with a top hat. Bryce sat back in his seat after the description, rubbed his chin with his hand. I waited, but Bryce didn't say anything, and eventually nodded for me to continue. Not exactly the reaction I was expecting. Graham led me to this big abandoned building. There were hundreds of spirits inside, all angry. If Alec and a bunch of other guides hadn't arrived, I'd have been dead, I said. Hundreds? Bryce said. It's been a while, but it wouldn't surprise me if the war created a breach. That's what I was thinking. Now, I mean. Then I was mostly just panicking, I replied. A breach appeared when large numbers of people died near each other, 
particularly in traumatic fashion. All of the spirits dumped into Riven at a single point, and, due to both the number of spirits and the way in which they got there, the whole group became angry very quickly. When a breach was found, groups of guides would work together to close it. It probably won't be the first, Bryce said. Large-scale wars, you're going to get things like this. What I didn't understand, what I don't understand, is why they listened to Graham. Because Graham isn't a normal spirit, Alex said, coming into the bar and sitting down next to us. He was a guide long ago. A good one. Better than you. Thanks, I said. That was Alec for you, delivering the unvarnished truth. Bryce was nodding. I suspected when Carver mentioned the hammer. So, wait, he was a guide? I asked. Why hasn't he been wrangled then? I thought that was standard policy. A spirit must be caught to be wrangled. Graham, you see, he's very good at getting away, at being found only when he wants to be, Alex said. So you're saying the spirit of a dead guide is hunting me? Hunting you? I don't know why he would, Alex said. But with the three of us, I bet we can catch him and ask him, politely, what he's up to. First things first, Bryce said. If you really found a breach in there, we've got to close it before it gets any worse. Two hours, I said. So long as I'm down here, I want to take care of something. Bryce and Alec nodded. I finished my drink and left. With Alec there, I didn't want to bring up what Graham had told me about letting the spirits back through, about asking for my name. Nothing against Alec, but he didn't need to know everything. Back outside, my mask on, I jumped a short train heading towards the lab district. If Anna had found out more about my mother, I wanted to know. The Broken Beaker the lab district was the opposite of everywhere else in Chicago. The opposite of Riven, too. Brightly lit, with more technology than the rest of the city combined, stepping off the train into the lab district's sparking avenues buried my questions beneath a frenzy of light and noise. On either side of the broad avenue in front of me, buildings glowed with gas tubes of every color. The center of the street was closed off to normal traffic, because a new Zeppelin was getting ready to launch. A warbling man with a looping horn boosting his voice declared that this Zeppelin was powered through batteries. A thousand fans working on top of the ship provided the charge. A horde of workers, scientists, and students clustered around the Zeppelin as it started to rise in the air. Two blocks to the left, the colors were more muted. A concession, one of the few, made to sleep around here. Cheap hotels specializing in hourly rates and single bedrooms targeted the frantic pace. The lab was the home, and when you needed to sleep, the hotels gave you a place to pass out, shower, and then get back to it. Between the larger facilities, bars and diners showed off cheap beers and fast food. Others offered exhibition galleries to go with their beverages, a chance to taste the excitement with your cocktail. Past the Zeppelin, which slowly crawled up the sky, I found the broken beaker. Standing outside, white mask on and watching the experiment, was Anna. You weren't kidding, I said. It's my favorite place in the city, Anna replied, not bothering to look away from the Zeppelin. The energy here is addicting. You don't get enough excitement in Riven? Anna laughed, then shook her head. When I'm there, I'm not looking for dangerous spirits. Most of the time, I'm finding a loved one and reading them a note from their daughter. Not so thrilling. Speaking of, I'm not sure I'll be able to help you. I took out the list of names Anna had sent me. We don't exactly write down the details of every spirit we see. Anna nodded back towards the broken beaker. Talk about it inside? She led the way which was good, because I would have fallen over, or turned around and left without her. 
the broken beaker wasn't my kind of place. Not like Ezra's, with its classic dignity. No, Anna's favorite bar was a blend of humanity's brightest lights and loudest sounds, mashed together in an overwhelming blast to the senses. Beyond the array of tables dominated by scientists and students shouting inches from each other's faces, sat a large stage on which, at the moment, a contraption resembling a train car ground out a ferocious noise. It's demo night, Anna shouted into my ear. Tonight's theme is noisemakers. Great, I replied, wondering how many minutes we'd be in here. Having functional ears was, you know, a perk. Anna grabbed my hand and led me through the crowded floor towards the sidewall more specifically, to a spot that sported a picture of a sunflower. She pressed it, and a door swung inward. The room on the other side was cramped and featureless, except for a second door with another flower, this one a fragile-looking lily. Sound damping, Anna explained, somehow sensing my confusion, even though my mask was still up. Her words proved themselves a second later, as we went into the broken beaker's back half a quiet array of couches and low tables, overseen by walls of chalk bearing scribbled equations. The only sound was the bartender, rattling cocktails. Marginally better, I admitted, as we snagged a spot. A lot of people don't realize this is even here, Anna said. Great place to meet clients. Which is what we were talking about? All business, aren't you? Anna replied, slipping off her mask. I nearly died twice today. I copied the move. The air felt good on my face, even with the scent of booze underlining every breath. Makes you rethink small talk. I'd ask how, but I can imagine. Bet you couldn't. Not this, I said, enjoying her questioning look. There was something fun about holding information from a sneak. I'll tell you later. Anna shrugged waved for the bartender's attention, and then held up two fingers. I hope you like gin. There are worse things to drink, I said. I wanted to ask you about your mother. Lucky guess. The paper says she died, Anna said. Only I don't think that's true. At least, not the way they said it happened. Her comment knocked me back for a moment. Not what I'd been expecting. What do you mean? Died in her sleep? Your mother wasn't very old. She wasn't in the hospital for injuries, Anna said. I get a lot of requests to talk to the dead, Carver. Guess how many just turn up that way without a scratch, and without any investigation? You're really running with this. It's not all hunches, Anna said. But I can't tell you any more. Not without a favor. I already said I couldn't help with the list. As I spoke, the bartender dropped a pair of wide-bottom beakers on our table, each one bubbling with a set of gin and soda. Limes wedged into the neck. That was just to get Lawrence off my back, Anna said. I was hoping he wouldn't be there when you came by. What I'm looking for, Carver, is to be one of you. I took a long drink, felt the pine needle gin run down my throat glanced around the bar to make sure nobody I knew was around. There's not a chance, I said. They'd never give you approval. Why not? I can get to Riven. I'm savvy. Because you're a sneak. Anna's eyes narrowed, and she leaned forward across the table. That's something you're going to have to come to terms with. That's the deal. You want to find your mother? You get me in. Anna picked up her beaker and slammed it, finishing the cocktail in a single pull, and then stood up, walked away. He's buying, Anna said to the bartender as she pressed the flower and left. Getting a sneak to be a guide was impossible. We were chosen young, evaluated when, as kids, we had our first crossing. You came tumbling down to your parents, your teacher, and talked about how you spent the night wandering around another world. Then the law kicked in, and you were sent to the nearest guide headquarters and evaluated. I drank my way through those memories in the broken beaker after Anna left. 
the constant shifts between Riven and the real world, teaching you to control the crossing, to link your own bed to a place on the other side. If Anna hadn't been accepted as a guide, there had been something wrong. There were no second chances. And if Anna wouldn't help me find my mother, I knew someone who could. The Breach I'd never been in an army, never stood rank and file with comrades and looked across some vast plain at an opposing force. But standing on the street in Riven, with a score of guides around me, staring at the factory that I'd run out of only hours before, I felt a surge of energy, pride, confidence. There were a hungry, angry spirits or more, and we were going to go in and wreck them. Positions! Bryce called. He was the senior guide there, the leader for the mission. At his call, ten guides on the edges split out and moved around the factory. The rest of us went forward, into the teeth. The first spirits rushed towards us a minute later as we neared the doors. They burst out, scrambling, yelling, and grasping at the air with their hands. These weren't the smart, tactical ones we'd encountered in the Warrens, just your usual rage-filled ghosts looking for some sort of vengeance. We cut them down. My lash sliced forward with crack after crack, lancing through and wrangling one spirit after another. Still, I was only one, and other guides chose arms more suited to mass attacks. One, her arms pumping, launched what seemed like an infinite supply of small knives into the waves of spirits. Wrapping her body was a copper construct that, with her motion, cycled knives from a pack on her back down along her arms and right into her hands. Another swept aside two or three spirits at a time, swinging the largest axe I'd ever seen. Its double-sided head fell into a haft with blades along each side, catching spirits running inside its reach with blue fire. They didn't stand a chance. When we broke through the doors, Bryce, myself, and three other guides pulled their tubes from our belts and launched sparks down the corridor. The blue, green, and red fires hit spirits while showing the way forward. The sparks provided the signal. The guides back at the doors saw the flashes and sent their own sparks up to the guides on the roof, the ones who'd moved around at the start of the fight. Those guides punched holes in that roof. They used hammers and spikes to create holes and rake back metal slats. Riven's gray light streamed in as we pushed forward, giving us our first real look at the breach, the first one I'd ever seen. It looked like a puddle, a huge one in the middle of the factory floor, a watery mass that, instead of reflecting the world above it, showed a different landscape beneath. The battlefield in the real world, where all the soldiers were dying. They crawled up through the breach, as though swimming out of a pool, splashing their way up and into Riven. I ducked the wild swing of another spirit and paid back his aggression with a stab of my knife. Looked up and saw that we were close, only a few feet away from the edge of the breach. Carver, you want the honors? Bryce shouted above the chaos. My pleasure, I replied. Bryce, his volge in one hand, reached under his belt and pulled off an ancient device. I recognized it from training. A stone slate with a sapphire in the middle. A sapphire that glowed with the same pale fire burning along our weapons and in the eyes of the spirits we sought to quell. It's ready, Bryce called, and then he threw the object to me. As more spirits crawled up from the breach, their hands grasping the edges of the factory floor and pulling themselves out of the muck, I ran towards them. Above me, guides provided cover, launching arrows, firing single-shot rifles with burning bullets, or dropping down to crush spirits up close. I stepped on the breach, and my shoes felt like they were being sucked into the mud. Bits of the real world splattered on my ankles as I ran forward. A breach had to be closed from the center. If even a little bit escaped the reach of the device, the breach could reopen. I felt the hands of spirits brush my feet as they crawled up, but the newest spirits would take a moment to comprehend their surroundings. 
That moment was all I needed. Once I got to the center, I pressed down on the sapphire in the device. Every part of it, the gem, the stone, turned teal as energy flooded out. The light gushed like a river and poured off into the breach, flooding its surface and sealing it off. The hands of new spirits retracted, fell back through the muck as the light ran over the breach. They would still be coming to Riven, but now they would be separated, would wander, and perhaps would be cycled without the need of a guide to get them there. Then I stood in the center of a factory floor, surrounded by a score of exhausted guides and many more glazed-over spirits, starting their long walks to the cycle. Well done, Bryce said, slapping my back and reaching for the device. This was a small one. If the war gets worse, we'll see breaches double or triple the size. That goes for the rest of you, too, Bryce announced to the other guides. We found this one by accident, but there might be others already. Keep your eyes open. Don't hunt alone. If we catch the breaches early, they'll stay small, and we'll stay alive. Good work. He's right, you know, Alex said to me as we moved out of the factory. You shouldn't go alone. I won't be watching every time. I'd find it a little creepy if you were, I replied, and Alec laughed. A Search Request When Bryce and Alec went back to the clock tower, I went in a different direction. Dating someone in Riven wasn't much different than doing it in the real world. Still had to stop by from time to time, find places to go, experiences to share. The dinner options were a little lacking, but we figured it out. Selena was in the middle of another one of her drawings when I showed up. This one showed the tar pit, and she was halfway through one of the tall smokestacks, a stark line reaching towards the top of the paper, paper that Nicholas undoubtedly gave her. You're still alive, Selena said as I went through the door. When you didn't say anything, when you didn't come back after going to the tar pit, I figured that was the end. That's grim, I said, pulling out one of the wicker chairs and plopping into it. You'll have to forgive me. My mind doesn't run to happy places all that often. Selena set her pencil down and leaned back in her chair. How was it? Did you meet your quota? I gave her the details. Graham, the scrambling, the near-death experience, and then coming back with the others to close the breach. Through it all, Selena just stared at me, nodding every once in a while. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about that. Selena said when I finished. On the one hand, I don't want you to die. On the other hand, that would bring you here, forever. Until we both went crazy, or to the cycle. It's going to happen eventually, right? Selena asked. Not so long as you're bound, I said. What's with all the fatalism lately? I'm a person, or at least I was. I need more than just sitting here. I'm not enough? Selena laughed. You're not here all the time. Even if you were, I don't think it would matter. I need more. More than wandering around with Nicholas, looking for random things so he can build his inventions. More than these drawings. I might have something, I said. I had thought about taking the task to Nicholas, seeing if he had any ideas but Selena might be even better. There's a spirit. His name is Graham. I need help finding him. You want me to do it? Selena looked skeptical. He said something to me. Said that he thought that we should be working to bring spirits back. Back to the real world. Wouldn't that be a disaster? If we did it for all of them, sure. Selena's face changed as she understood what I meant. Her hand went to her hair, twisting a pair of strands between her fingers, what she did whenever she was really, actually interested in something. You think I could get back? I don't know, but we could try, I said. 
They'd never let you stay a guide if they found out. I'm already risking that with you. You know, Selena said, sometimes you really come through for me. Other times, I can't tell if you care. But this, if you're willing to try, would mean everything. I lived for that look that came over her eyes then. That hopeful, wanting glance that said I was the only thing she was thinking about at that moment. That my future and hers were one and the same. And that we could get anything we wanted. Be anything we wanted. Together. Selena stood up from the table, took my hand, and we left the half-finished drawing of the smokestack and all thoughts of Graham behind. Two Souls The pounding on the apartment door ruined the moment. I rolled off the bed, the hard pallet barely a foot off the floor, and shrugged my way back into my clothes. Selena was faster, throwing a dress over her head and going to answer the knock. Is he here? I heard Nicholas's voice around the corner. I'll be out in a minute, I said. Getting the belt back on and situated took a second. Then slinging the crossbow over my back took another. Finally, after slipping on the gloves that kept my hands from getting bit off by angry spirits, I was ready to go. Nicholas, however, clearly wasn't. The man's lab coat was torn. Spirits didn't bleed much, but they could get roughed up plenty, and Nicholas had scratches all over his face. His goggles hung askew, one of the lenses missing. They told me to find you, Nicholas started as soon as I came into sight. Told me that you would be here, that they would stop if you came. Stop doing what? I asked. They're tearing apart the lab. They're ruining my experiments. Who is they? I said, as Selena bounced her eyes between the two of us. Graham, or at least that's who they say they're working for. Spirits, not like ones I've ever seen, Nicholas said. They talk, but they're not angry. There's no fire in their eyes, but they're destructive, determined. Actually, they'd be a rather intriguing study if they weren't wrecking everything. Well, I can fill tomorrow's quota today, I said. You two stay here. I don't think so, Selena said. You said that Graham nearly killed you earlier. I can't sit by and just let that happen. If you go, we go too. I didn't argue. She wasn't wrong. The three of us left Selena's apartment and went down the street, over the hill, to Nicholas's lab. Standing in front of it were a pair of spirits. They didn't look like soldiers, and they were dressed in the same sort of formal wear that Graham sported. Dirty suits and tall hats. Nicholas was right. No fire in their eyes. The one on the left held a large cane and rested on it. The one on the right had grabbed hold of something from Nicholas's experiments. A spiked bar that had blue fire channeling between the needles. Heard you were looking for me? I called as we came closer. Got a message for you. From Graham, the one with the cane said. I'm all ears. He says it's time to come home, Kane said. I expected a laugh, maybe some sort of manic grin, but the spirit's face stayed serious. What, that's it? I said. No explanation? Now Kane got all squinty-eyed, clenched those knuckles around his fancy stick. I gave the lash a twitch, made sure they saw it hanging ready. Are you sure you can handle both of them? Nicholas whispered behind me. They look rather intimidating. Selena, keep him out of it, I said, then put some distance between us by launching myself at Graham's two spirits. To their credit, the spirits weren't surprised. Kane went forward at my move, trying to close the distance so the lash wouldn't be so effective. Spike, as I nicknamed the other one, hung back, waiting for an opening. 
which was fine with me. I swept the lash low, banking on Kane getting inside the pointed tip. He did, but the rest of the lash hooked and wrapped around Kane's ankle. I pulled the lash tight, and Kane crashed to the ground in front of me. My left hand went for the knife. Easy pickings. Watch out! Selena's yell jerked my head up in time to see Spike copying his friend's assault. My lash was still tight around Kane's ankle, and Spike's club was coming in fast, so I dropped the lash and dashed left. I reached behind my head and pulled out the crossbow, held it up as Spike adjusted his advance. Careful, I said. This thing hurts. I'm already dead, Spike replied. The spirit had a point. I turned the crank anyway, slotting a normal bolt, and, as Spike went for a swing, I fired the crossbow in his face. The bolt struck Spike in the nose, the shock of the hit robbing Spike's swing of its momentum, but not all of it. The club hit my left arm, and I felt piercing pain as one of the spikes drove in. A spirit in Riven doesn't have real blood, doesn't feel or operate the way a body does. A guide, or a sneak, or anyone crossing over, though, they bring part of their physical selves along for the ride. Get your knee shattered here, it would be broken back home. Get your ear chewed off, good luck hearing anything after you cross back. So when my arm went hot with my own blood, I screamed. Then I hit back, literally struck Spike with a crossbow and pushed him to the ground, dropped the weapon and reached across my waist with my right hand and pulled the knife free. Spike's broken face, split by the bolt, stared up at me in mangled rage, but I hesitated. No pale fire. None. Even in a situation when the spirit should be losing control, Spike didn't look lost. Kane tackled me, rammed me off of his partner, and threw me onto the hard stone of the street. The knife bounced from my hand along the ground. The pain would have been excruciating, would have thrown me into shock. Should have. There will be moments, Bryce's voice flew through my panicking head, where you will be at the very edge, where you will be one breath away from the end. But you will still have that one breath. Use it. Cain moved over Spike, barreling down toward me like a nightmare version of a carnival barker, cane and suit blowing wide, top hat long gone, and revealing a head of wispy hair. On my belt, my hand found the spark tube. I pulled it out and pressed the button as Kane raised his namesake weapon to bash in my skull. I filled his eyes with burning blue fire. Spirits might not bleed, but damn do they still hurt. Kane reeled back, roaring out something I couldn't understand, and I pushed myself to my feet. Kept after Kane, kicking him in the stomach and pushing him back into Spike. Kane fell over his friend, landing on the ground hard. I went over and picked up the knife, tried to flex my left arm, and couldn't. Not good. Ready to give up? I said, my voice pained. Weak. Spike, he of the split face, didn't reply. Not sure he was capable of it. Kane just growled and scooted himself back off his partner, who tried to get up as I stabbed him. The knife's blue fire ran down the hilt and over Spike. As the spirit's eyes went blank, I felt a surge of relief. One down. Then Kane was on me again. I swept up the knife to block his swing, but Kane's strength was incredible his namesake bashing away my hand. The knife flew to the other side of the street, bouncing away. I backpedaled, and Kane followed. You could have come with us, Kane said. Could have made this easy. That's not really my style, I replied. Kane responded with a bigger swing, going for a two-handed head knocker. I ducked forward, getting inside the attack and leading a right shoulder charge into Kane's midsection. His elbow connected with my temple, sending the world spinning as we fell over. My eyes blurred in and out of focus as I rolled off of Kane onto my back. 
It was like my nerves were scrambled. Directions were getting lost and root to the muscles they were for. I closed my eyes for a second to try and correct myself, and when I opened them, Kane stood over me. One, two, three quick strikes with the cane to my chest, jabbing straight down. Not going for the kill, not yet. There's a price to be paid, Kane said. Always a price where I came from. When I paid it, I wound up here. Now it's your turn. I tried to come up with a retort. Tried and wound up coughing blood as Kane delivered another shot to my gut. Then he stopped, scowled at me. Except he doesn't want you dead, Kane muttered, his eyes twisting up and looking above, like the man was getting a communication from the beyond, or having a stroke, if spirits could have such things. Selina smashed Kane from behind. I didn't even see her just the end of Spike's club driving into Kane's back. The blue fire wrapping the spikes, the fire that had done nothing to me, burned its way through Kane. He dropped his weapon and collapsed. And next time, I coughed, a little sooner? Crossing. As a guide, there was a certain indignity about being carried by a pair of spirits. However, given that I was a messed up hunk of battered flesh at the moment, I shelved my pride and let Selena and Nicholas drag me along the streets back to her apartment. In between the spasms of pain from, well, everywhere, I tried to figure out why Kane hadn't bashed my head in. He'd had the chance. Could have turned me to pulp right there on the street. Something... No, someone said no. There weren't many ways to control spirits. If you were a guide, you could bind one or two, like I'd done with Nicholas and Selena. I couldn't make decisions for them, but they knew that if I let them go, the cycle would compel them quick, or they'd lose their minds and become a target for my lash. Bryce had spoken a few times about ghouls being able to control spirits in their vicinity. Their sheer menace collected spirits and warped them in the same way a cloud of perfume twisted the minds of men late at night. These two were following Graham's orders. Another spirit's orders. I'd heard Graham call off the horde outside the factory near the breach. There must be something he was doing that could tie these spirits to him. One more reason I wanted to find Graham and get some questions answered. Are you still with us? Selina asked as we neared the clock tower. I'm worried if they find us with him. He is still breathing, Nicholas said, which, despite being unnecessary here, shows evidence. I'm alive, I said. Bryce and Alec just went back. They shouldn't be here. You can talk, Nicholas announced. Excellent. I'd feared the blow to your head had scrambled your mind. Oh, it did, I replied. I managed to get my legs under me long enough for Selina to open the clock tower's door. Then it was a short series of steps to the main chamber. I counted each one of those steps in searing stabs for my abdomen. Straight to the bed, please, I said when we made it into the main hall. I need to cross back. Not that my real body would feel all that much better, but the thing about Riven is that there wasn't any alcohol. Or doctors and hospitals but mostly alcohol. Carver, a question before you go, Nicholas said, as Selina laid me on the mattress. Go for it, I replied. About my lab, I took the liberty of checking inside while you and Selina were dealing with those goons, and it seems they were thorough. My work has been set back considerably. Can you rebuild it? I would question the effort, Nicholas said looking at the floor and wringing his hands. If this Graham knows where it is, then I should think he might attack again. Then move it to the apartment, I said. What? Selina and Nicholas said together. It's got room. Selina, you said you were lonely. Why not? The steps would make moving equipment difficult. 
Nicholas said, but his wandering eyes gave away his thoughts. But it would be more secure. Having Selina nearby would make it easier to experiment. I'm not your plaything, Selina said. Nicholas bowed his head in an apology, then went to go check the door, make sure the courtyard was still clear. Talk it over, I said. I'm sure you'll work something out. So long as he remembers that it's my place first, Selina said. Then she turned back to me. I'm going to go look for Graham, like we talked about. Now, after seeing what he did? I said the words, but didn't put much punch into them. If Selina was able to find Graham, learn more about what he wanted, then it would be worth the risk. That's why I have to try, Selina said. He's just going to keep hurting us. I could feel the blurred edges of my vision closing in. Crossing back and forth from Riven was like falling asleep. Only instead of sinking into any dream, I had to drift my mind towards where I wanted to go. In this case, back to my little apartment, to my bed, tied to the clock tower. In a normal situation, without my blood dripping from a hole in my arm, it would be simple. A habit, like walking or blinking. Now, with the constant ache, I couldn't maintain the picture. I was falling unconscious, not shifting over. And if I collapsed here, I might not ever wake up. What's wrong? I heard Selena talk, her voice sounding far away. Come on, Carver. I forced my eyes back open, beat away the blurred edges. I need to be numbed, I said. I can't concentrate. Numbed? Selena asked. Get Nicholas here, I said. He'll have an idea. Selena yelled for the scientist while I clung to consciousness. My stomach lurched. Something burned in my chest. Wouldn't be surprised if Kane had done deadly damage, despite trying to keep me alive. You have any morphine? I asked Nicholas as he came in the room. Have you forgotten where you are? Nicholas replied. Riven lacks the necessary ingredients for any chemical drugs. The pain's keeping me from crossing, I said. It's getting worse. Nicholas glanced at Selina and shook his head slightly. Scientist out of ideas. That wasn't good. Selina turned to me, and I must have looked terrible, because her eyes quivered and her mouth fell slack. Don't tell me, I said. I don't want to know. Be quiet, Selina said. Focus. Cross over, Carver. I was about to slide into sarcasm and say that was the whole problem when Selina leaned over and kissed my forehead. The slight pressure, the warmth from her lips, blunted the pain. Not a lot. The stinging, raging ache from my stomach and arm were still there, but quieter, countered by Selina's affection. Her lips moved, crossing my forehead and making their soft way down the side of my face. I closed my eyes, sank into that sea of near unconscious, and, with Selina's soft voice whispering in my ear, I latched onto my home and didn't let go. Cross over, Carver. The Ordinary it was not a good morning. I awoke from the crossing like I'd run a marathon while taking a gut punch every mile. At least, that's what it felt like. My muscles, particularly in the left arm, were sore. My stomach was nauseous, and I stumbled out of bed to the bathroom upon waking up. Things weren't pretty. But I was alive. After far too many minutes putting myself together, I fell out of my apartment to the train station and got on the next line downtown. My body wanted to lie there and suffer, but giving Graham time to plan another attack was what we in the guide business would call a bad plan. Ezra's was more crowded earlier in the morning, the clock barely pushing 7.30. Third shifters saying goodbye to the night. Bryce would still be here, though. He told me before that his wife did some sort of government work downtown, had to be in the office early, and they regarded the morning train ride together 
as a sacrosanct ritual of their relationship. Bryce probably enjoyed the hours of coffee and reading in Ezra's that followed just as much. With my usual mask and coat getup, I approached the bar. The air was hazy, a buildup the papers attributed to the factories ramping up war production. Exactly what we needed. More pollution, more dead soldiers clogging Riven. Great times. Carver! Speaking of great times, here came one. Opperman waved from near the door. Haven't seen you, and guess what? There's another quote needs giving. Can't you find another guide? I replied, trying to walk past him. But Opperman shifted himself in front of me. Bryce doesn't even look at me anymore, Opperman pouted. I don't even know the name of your third guy. Some journalist you are. I focus my efforts on what matters to the people, Opperman said. And what matters right now are the rumors that guides are dying left and right. They are? Don't you know? Opperman gave me a quizzical look, his recording tablet punching holes. Riven's more dangerous than ever, or so they say. Catastrophe, as more guides are mauled by angry spirits. Who are your sources again? Opperman wagged his finger. Come on, Carver, give me a response. Tell me, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to keep the people safe? I paused for a moment. Bryce would ream me out if I gave any sort of promise to Opperman. On the other hand, someone had to talk to the media, keep the public informed, and hopefully paying for us to keep Riven clear. Tell you what, Opperman, I said. How about we trade? I'll give you an opinion if you do a little digging for me. Digging? There's a, um, nasty spirit I'm dealing with in Riven, I said. Need to find out more about her. Can you look and see if there are records of a woman named Selena? She was killed by her husband? Here or anywhere? Because, you know, I can't... Selena had never told me where she died, but we'd talked about Chicago before. While spirits could pop up all over Riven, most of the time they were concentrated to certain areas. That's what made wars so dangerous. Whole districts of Riven could get overwhelmed as so many people died in a single spot on Earth. It seemed like, with the current war ramping up, the tar pit was going to be a mess. Somewhere in the Midwest, I said. You're the journalist. Do the digging. My part of the deal? Look, being a guide has always been a difficult job. A lot of risk, not a lot of reward, I said. With the war going on, things are going to get dangerous. But we've kept the world spinning for centuries, and we won't stop now. Opperman nodded when I'd finished. That's what I needed. Now, smile! The reporter waved behind him, and a woman I hadn't noticed ran up to my face. On her shoulders, she wore what looked like a jumble of metal parts. On her head was a massive lens. She pressed a pair of buttons, one in each hand, and the lens blasted me with light. Your picture, Opperman said as the woman backed away. Should get on the front page. I'm wearing a mask. I replied. Even better, Opperman exclaimed. Guides are mysterious, scary, and that's what you are. Thanks, I said, brushing past him. Selena, remember. Sure thing, Carver, Opperman said to my back as I slipped into Ezra's. Bryce was at our usual table, immersed in the morning edition. Ezra's had its music playing bright ragtime, pianos bouncing along at a frenetic rate. Bryce looked up when I sat down across from him, narrowed his eyes when I took a pour from his coffee. Feeling spicy this morning, Carver? Got the crab kicked out of me last night, Bryce, I replied. Just happy to be alive. That bled into an edited recounting of the encounter with Kane and Spike. I left out Nicholas in the lab, Selena saving me, and turned it into a two-on-one slugfest that had my physical heroics carrying the day albeit not so well that I'd dodged any harm. You and Alec have the same problem, Bryce said when I was done, both going out alone, against orders. There aren't enough of us, I said. What orders am I supposed to obey? The quota or sticking together? Bryce set down the paper and rubbed his eyes, the same look he did any time I confronted him with an impossible question. 
You have your sparks with you? Bryce asked. Always, I replied. I forget to shoot them. Please don't. They'll save your life. Know what else might save my life? I said, telling me what you know about Graham. Now Bryce sat back, confused. Did you see him again? These guys, they said they were working for Graham. That's right, spirits working for each other. I glanced around Ezra's. No Alec in sight. I didn't mention this earlier, but Graham talked to me. The first time. Saying what? Essentially that he wanted a way out of Riven. Back here. For him and all other spirits. That sounds like Graham, Bryce said. Not that I knew him well, but he wasn't one to settle. Always pushed the limits for a guide. Like you, dove into one messy situation after another. How'd he die? Spirits? Bryce shook his head. Illness, if I remember right. It's been a long time, and I was going through training. Then how is his spirit still around, if he died that long ago? When a guy dies out here, they can last for a long time in Riven, because they know what it is, how it works, Bryce said, his eyes sliding into a thoughtful stare. Even so, the cycle should eventually get them. I'm not sure how he's lasted so long. We talked for a while longer, me taking the opportunity to get my own coffee and sip the steamy brew. Then Bryce took a long pause, staring over at the bar. I followed his glance, realized he wasn't looking at anything in particular, and took in my mentor's face. Bryce was looking, and this felt strange to think, old, or rather, used. Slight wrinkles threaded his face, and Bryce's eyes were rimmed with tangled red. Strands of gray intermingled with his auburn hair. You can probably tell, Bryce said when he caught me looking. I'm getting tired. Decades and Riven will catch up to you. Didn't want to say anything. Bryce reached inside his coat pocket and brought out a book, leather bound, only inside weren't pages, but pictures. Bryce handed the book to me. Take a look, Bryce said. I obliged, flipping through. Black and white smiles flashed back at me. Bryce, his wife, their two children. As I turned the pages, I noticed that all of the pictures with Bryce were around Chicago, in their house or a park. Pictures elsewhere just had his wife and the kids. You never leave? Do you? Bryce replied. I hadn't thought about it, but the answer was no. No, I didn't. Chicago was my area, and even though I could cross into Riven from anywhere, I might not appear in the same place. Wouldn't be able to respond to a crisis. And guides didn't take vacations. You're going to retire? Soon, Bryce said. When the war calms down, I think. I want you to take my place. Not Alec? Bryce smiled. You think he would want it? Having to police the other Chicago guides? Make pitches to the city for support? We both laughed at that one. No way would Alec and his ego work in that environment. He'd probably have us run out of town in a month. Then Bryce turned serious again. You ever think of having a family? Bryce asked. Never really had one, except for you and the other guides, I replied. The remark brought my mother's strange death floating back through my head, and I frowned. Probably for the best, Bryce said. This life isn't a kind one. I nodded, took the last drink of the coffee. Family. I'd had one once, for a moment. Maybe it was time to find out what happened to it. The True Cause
the Chicago Medical Center, or the CMC, as the newspapers called it, took up five blocks south of downtown. From the top floors, I'd been told, you could make out the lake on a clear day. This was not one of those. The haze was thick, making the strings of lights directing patients and visitors to the entrance less of a decoration and more of a necessity. As I walked towards the main doors with a dozen others, tinny speakers played recorded messages when we stepped on certain plates. Directions for patients, guidelines for visitors, and so on. By the time I was standing in the purifying room, the haze sucking away, I felt I knew every little detail of how CMC worked. I wanted to see the doctor that had presided over my mother's treatment, whose name was on the certificate Anna had sent me. Thankfully, he was easy to find, because he was also my doctor, and the physician for all of Chicago's guides. Carver Reed, Barrington Farth said to me from behind an enormous pair of spectacles. The glasses, which always took a second to get used to, weren't just lenses. They had a series of gadgets attached to them that allowed Barrington to zoom in for a closer look, register air quality, and, so he'd told me once, even pick up the frequency of a heartbeat from inches away. That's my name, I said. You're early for your annual checkup, Barrington said, glancing at a folder with my name on it. Not here for that. Thanks for taking the time to meet on short notice. My contract with the guides requires it, Barrington replied. What do you need, then? I wanted to ask you about this. I said, taking out the certificate and setting it on Barrington's absurdly crowded desk. Papers and knickknacks, tools that had no purpose I could discern, littered the dark wood surface. Barrington leaned over, so close that I thought his wrinkled skin might droop down and touch the sheet. Your mother, Barrington said. I'd ask how you acquired this, except it's here so such a line of inquiry would waste our time. You want to know how she died? Sure, let's start with that. It was a long time ago, Barrington said slowly, dredging up the memory while reciting it. But a patient like Catherine stays with you, if only for how much she fought to bring you into the world, and how fast she went after. Fast? Yes. Even in the lead-up to your birth, she had been claiming people were coming for her. Other guides, even. It was the start of a problem that would kill her. Other guides? You mean my mother was one? Barrington gave me an odd look. Of course. You didn't know that? Not many people talk about my parents, Doctor. No, perhaps not, Barrington said. At the time, my priority was to ensure she made it through the pregnancy. Her obvious psychosis could be dealt with later. Except it wasn't. No. She had you, and then, within days, she was gone. We'd transferred her to a safe ward. She was monitored. Few visitors. In the end, however, Catherine slipped away. You have no idea why? Here, Barrington paused. I could practically see him measuring and discarding words, picking the proper phrase. I wouldn't say that, Barrington said. I did an autopsy, after all. I waited. The doctor put his elbows on the desk, leaned forward, pushed his massive spectacles towards my face. It's hard to tell what goes on with a guide's body when they cross over. On the outside, it resembles sleep, or a coma, Barrington said. On the inside... That's an open question. 
So, when your mother expired, I took the chance to see. Then he paused, as though remembering that talking about dissecting a man's mother right in front of him might not be the most polite thing in the world. It's fine, I said. It definitely was not fine, but I wasn't here to be emotional. This was about finding what happened to my mother. Tell me what you found. In short, it was multiple organ failure, Barrington said. I assume something happened to her over there. She was crossing quite frequently, you know. I think it helped her stay sane. What do you mean, assume something happened to her over there? The damage must have come from a riven event. It wasn't natural. Barrington shrugged. If she'd been a normal patient, a normal person, I'd have said she'd been poisoned. Going Hunting I woke up, back in the clock tower. My body was still sore, but the hole in my arm didn't exist. My stomach wasn't a pillar of pain. Crossing worked miracles. I stood up and stretched, enjoying the muscle ache because of its familiarity. I could deal with this. Barrington left me with questions, but there wasn't time to tackle them now. Alec, by way of Bryce that morning, had asked for help with a hunt. We had our ten-spirit quota to fill for the day, and with Bryce pulled into another hours-long diplomacy session in the real world, it was up to Alec and I to keep Chicago in the black. This fountain is a mystery, Alec said to me as I left the clock tower. He stood beside the basin, staring at the knot water as it flowed. Riven has no power, a questionable relationship with physics. Yet, here this fountain pours. Chasing answers here is a mistake, I said. Riven is riven. Tisk tisk. that sort of attitude will leave us stuck where we are now forever. Better to ask, what is riven? Someday, when I have time, I'll put that question to the test, I replied. You said you had something? The ghoul that was found, it is still around, Alec said. One of the guides told me while we were closing the breach. It's far, so nobody has bothered going after it yet. Until now. Normally, I'd be ecstatic. A ghoul, the very thing I kept harassing Bryce about. A chance to push my abilities to the max against the most frightening creature Riven had to offer. Except, after Kane's beating last night, I wasn't feeling thrilled about going into combat against a giant beast. I thought you would be more excited, Alec said to my uncertain face. Bryce told me that you always wanted to fight one. I had a rough night. And what better way to recover than by risking life and limb, Alec said. I could think of some, I said, but the curious itch was growing. I might be in rough shape, but who knew when I'd get another chance? Not only were ghouls rare, but you had to be in Riven at the right time, or other guides would take it down first. Fine, let's go. Not very enthusiastic, but it is a yes nonetheless, Alec said. He walked away from the fountain, heading east, away from the tar pit, which was west of the clock tower, and the warrens south. Normally, the east was a quieter district, a series of wide squares and misshapen structures, like someone playing with brick and mortar got carried away. Why the gauntlets, Alec? I asked as we walked along. Why? Alec replied. A family tradition, my friend. Family tradition? I'm a fourth-generation guide, Alec said. These gauntlets are over a hundred years old. Is there going to be a fifth generation? I needled my friend, and Alec laughed. Perhaps, but I don't think now is the best time for talk of family, Alec said. The world is in a dark place, and Riven even more so. 
Better I help cleanse the streets than take time away for children. If you say so. What about you, Carver? Have you found a love of your own? Do you hope for your own family one day, like our dear leader Bryce? I don't know, I said, Selena dashing through my mind. I've got other priorities, I guess. Other priorities, the man says. Then that is what I will say, too. Other priorities. Alec kept up the grin. Then, until we find that love who steals our hearts and makes us long for quiet nights with our families by the fire, let us wield our lives like a sword for the guides. Anyone ever tell you that you're crazy? All the time, Carver. And I never deny it. After making our way through the area surrounding the clock tower, we saw more spirits. These weren't the wandering dead that went through most of Riven. People who'd been killed of old age or accidents. No, most of these bore the hallmarks of disease, and the same one. You could always tell a disease death in Riven because the spirits, like the war dead, looked the same as when they fell apart. No ideal form. No relaxed way to go. The suffering transformed their spirit as it had warped their last days in life. The spirits we were seeing? Their hair, when they had it, was matted to their faces from sweat. Their arms and legs were thin, wasted away. Their eyes twitched open and closed, a sure sign that they'd spent most of their waning days asleep. The ones not moving towards the cycle were sitting staring into nothing. This is bad, I said. Where is this happening? I haven't heard of a plague. The war is across one ocean, Alec said. This is across the other. The streets broadened, blended in with broad courtyards surrounding strange buildings. One to my left appeared to be a half-finished castle, a turret spiraling upward, with chunks missing from the walls. Spirits sat on the stones like visitors to ruins, watching us as we went by. To the right were the Watcher's Tears, a series of stone bases that curved upwards to pointed tops a dozen stories high. Some of those points had been blunted, broken off with their blocks shattered on the ground beside them. Where the name had come from, I didn't know. Have you ever been out of the city? Alec asked as we went. In Riven, you mean? Yes, here, Alec said. To the walls? Never been that far. You know, Peter says that there's nothing worth exploring beyond this place, Alec said. But I think he is lying. Or he chooses not to see. Have you been? Alec nodded to the eastern edge, where the streets drain away to wide fields of the whitest grass you have ever seen. There are few spirits, but Riven goes on. Why? See, now you're asking the right questions. Why indeed? What is the point of this place? If it is just a house for the dead, why bother with all the rest? In front of us, slowly growing to tower over dead tree-lined boulevards and scattered structures, was the palace. Double the size of the factory in the tar pit where we'd closed the breach, the palace was a giant building covered in ornate carvings, symbols that I couldn't understand, that I'd never heard an explanation for. Domes dotted the roof, entirely black, the darkest things I'd seen in Riven's eternal gray. It's supposed to be here, Alec said, looking around, unless someone was rude enough to take it from us. I looked around, noted the lack of spirits. Where there'd been dozens wandering earlier, the palace was empty. The grounds were clear. That just made things creepier. Ghouls aren't supposed to be hard to find, I said. Perhaps we need to make it easy to find us. Alec replied. Before I could say anything, Alec pulled his spark tube from his belt, 
pointed it towards the sky and triggered it. Blue sparks flew up and burst. A moment later, the ground shook. A noxious roar, a mixing of anger, liquid lungs, and spit echoed across the stones. You see? We just needed to say hello, Alex said. The Ghoul One of the side benefits of crossing to Riven was that, when it wasn't getting beat up, my body in Chicago slept. I'd cross back and feel rejuvenated. It also meant that I never really dreamed. Or if I did, if my brain back in Chicago whirled through nightmares while I slaughtered spirits in Riven, I didn't experience them. So while I'd say the ghoul looked like a nightmare come to life, the truth was, I didn't really know. The ghoul was a slathering mass of arms and legs, a ball with appendages formed of other appendages, the result of sucking up countless spirits on its raging path through Riven. Eyes and mouths interspersed the spaces between the limbs, some of which held stones, wooden boards, and other rubble as weapons. Countless shards of ruined clothes, furniture, and other body parts roiled in the mass. Perhaps the worst part was the pulsing, the shuddering rhythm that shook through the ghoul's body every two or three seconds. The limbs bounced when that happened, with occasional loose bits falling off the ghoul's body to the ground, only to be grabbed by one of its passing arms and shoved back in. That is truly the most disgusting thing I've ever seen, I said, and I've seen some awful stuff. I must agree, Alec replied. I shall take no small amount of pleasure in ending its miserable existence. Alec straightened his arms as the ghoul continued its orbit around the palace towards us. The gauntlets Alec used changed when he snapped his wrists, sliding out metal plating to coat his forearms. Inch-long spikes shot out along the length of the weapons, each one glowing with wrangling fire. He reached into his coat and pulled out his mask, the riven version of the thorny vine one he wore back in Chicago. I slipped my black and gold mask on, then reached over my back and pulled out the crossbow, slid the lever to the blue wrangling bolt. I brought it up, turning the crank, and noticed Alec staring at the weapon. That's a nice piece of work, Alec said. After this, you will tell me who made it for you. A friend, I replied. The bolt snapped into place, ready to go. If the shot worked, the bolt should wrangle the ghoul just like any other spirit. Let's see if we can take the easy way out. I pulled the trigger, sending the shot sprinting towards the ghoul as it came closer. The bolt struck the ghoul's gross flesh and sank in, bursting into blue flame. The ghoul howled, an unearthly scream that ricocheted around my ears like the sound of rusty metals scraping against each other. Then the ghoul flailed, arms patting at its body, grasping for the bolt. One of the arms snagged it from the growing pit of pale fire and held the bolt away. Nicholas's invention kept burning, sending searing blue lines down the ghoul's arm. The creature dropped the bolt on the ground, still furiously batting at the burning area on its body. The blue fire died. Smothered out by the ghoul's arms, or by its sheer size, I didn't know. The lower left quarter of the ghoul's body was a black ruin, another first. Normally, the wrangling fire didn't actually burn, at least not physically. Interesting, Alec said. The ghoul shifted the burned area away from us, and with its dozen mouths gnashing, charged. Now, the real fun begins. Your concept of fun needs work, I said, but couldn't deny that part of me was happy Nicholas's bolt hadn't ruined the ghoul. It would have been too easy. The ghoul's charge was more of a shamble, catching itself on its mass of limbs and rolling forward. Arms cycling towards the top threw stones and rocks at us in an endless stream of projectiles. I sidestepped one, then two, while my arms worked the crossbow. 
I jumped the lever to the orange bolt, the fiery one, then noticed Alec was running towards the ghoul. If I used that, I'd burn him up. Back to the wrangling bolt. I felt the rock smash into my hands, a flash of white pain. The crossbow flew out of my grip, skipping across the stone. My right hand went numb. My left ached. Not a great start. Even though I couldn't feel my fingers, I knew where my lash was. I drew it, then circled to the right of the ghoul. Alec, about ten yards in front of me, rolled beneath a pair of large thrown stones, and then used his momentum to jump in the air. He struck the ghoul with a wild yell, his gauntlets catching hold. Then he began to tear the ghoul apart. One arm held on, while Alec used his other to grab the ghoul's many limbs and break them off, piece by piece. The spikes on his gauntlets drove into the ghoul, weakened the arm or leg Alec was grabbing, and then Alec ripped it off and flung it to the ground. A particularly long, thin arm went for Alec's head, and I snapped a lash. It snaked out, wrapped around the arm, and its blue-tinged tip bit into the wrist. I yanked, and the lash's pale fire burned the limb away. Its charred remnants broke from the ghoul and landed on the ground. The creature howled again. This time its screech inflected with pain, but not panic. Not fear. Not yet. The ghoul rolled, bringing Alec towards the ground, where the guide would be smothered beneath the creature. Jump! I shouted, as if Alec couldn't tell what was happening. He was trying to scramble up the front of the ghoul, but couldn't move fast enough. At the last moment, just before vanishing beneath the ghoul's bulk, Alec grabbed a passing leg and swung himself out of the way, rolling across the stone courtyard. I snapped the lash again, decimating the leg Alec had just used to save himself, but the ghoul didn't even notice. It started to reverse direction, rolling towards where I stood. We need a new plan, I said. There's too much of it to take apart. Couldn't agree more, Alec said, picking himself up. I like that crossbow of yours. Try it again? I'll need cover, I said, ducking another thrown stone. Consider it given, Alec replied. I broke into a run, getting out of the ghoul's way. Alec sidestepped the mass, then jumped on the ghoul again, pulling up the creature's side and leaving charred scars. In three long strides, I made it back to the crossbow. Somehow, the weapon still worked. Whatever Nicholas had used to make it, the man knew his stuff. I slid the lever back to the wrangling blue bolts. Then I heard a scream. The ghoul had Alec lifted in the air, a trio of long arms holding the guide's gauntlets wide, while more arms and legs kicked and punched Alec's body. One vicious swipe raked long, broken fingernails across Alec's face, leaving a trail of bloody marks. There wasn't time to take chances. I shoved the lever to the orange bolts, turned the crank as Alec struggled. Another rock hit me on the shoulder, but I ignored the pain. It wasn't dislocated. I could still hold the crossbow, and that's what mattered. I raised the weapon, aimed it beneath the ghoul, and fired. The bolt struck the ground at the ghoul's feet, expanding in an orange bloom. Rays reached out and latched onto the ghoul's legs and dangling arms climbing them to the creature's body. As I'd seen the bolt do to the container in the tar pit, the blazing rays disintegrated every part of the ghoul they touched. When the ghoul roared again, mixed in with the noise was a new tone. Fear. As its bottom legs were eaten away, the ghoul collapsed. Its arms still held Alec as the ghoul dropped into the expanding flames. I'd hoped the bolt's blast wouldn't extend far enough to get Alec, but with the ghoul literally falling apart, bringing Alec closer, I broke into a run, dropping the crossbow. Carver! Alec yelled as the fire neared. I can't get out! On it! Because the rays focused the fire on whatever they could grab, rather than burning freely, the ghoul had become a pillar of burning orange light. I ran close, close enough to try something stupid. With the flames burning up, 
Brushing the bottom of Alec's coat as the last of the ghoul disappeared into the writhing heat, I cracked the lash. It flew, wrapping itself around Alec and jabbing its pointed ends into the fabric of the guide's coat. Roll, I said, and then twisted and pulled, yanking Alec free of the ghoul's melting arms. I braced myself as Alec fell, using my legs to push us both away from the fire. The lash held, hopefully giving Alec enough momentum to clear the flames. When I felt the lash start to drag, I turned back to see if I had torched Alec alive. Who She'd Been My lash still wound around Alec's body. Filaments of smoke curled up from beneath the guide, but the man's breathing chest gave away that he lived. So, that was your plan? Alec asked, still lying on the ground. Burn the ghoul and I in one go? Make it look like an accident? Absolutely. I gripped Alec's hand and pulled him to his feet. Nobody would ever suspect a thing. Au contraire, they would, because who could ever believe you would be able to kill a ghoul, much less moi? Anyone ever tell you you're insufferable? I said, winding up the lash and sticking it back in its holster. My mother, every day since I was born, Alec said. But enough talk. We killed a ghoul, Carver. That is worth celebrating. I say we head back, go to Ezra's, and regale the masses with our tale of victory. This really went to your head, didn't it? I prefer to work alone for many reasons, Carver but I would be lying if I didn't say one of them was keeping the glory for myself. Alec continued singing his own praises, with the occasional mention of me, during the walk back to the clock tower. Eventually, I tuned him out, replayed the fight in my mind. We'd been lucky. Without that crossbow, the ghoul would have torn us apart. I'd have to thank Nicholas. So, I will see you at Ezra's? Alec asked as we slipped into the beds in the clock tower. You might have to take this one on your own, I said. I've got plans tonight. Plans, eh? What could be better than celebrating our victory? Before I could reply, Alec held up his hand. Don't tell me. It will only make me pity you all the more. Always a pleasure, Alec, I said. The guide grinned at me, then collapsed on his pillow. I followed and crossed a minute later. A cloudy afternoon gave me a moment's surprise. I thought I was still in Riven, the gray making the two worlds come a little too close together. I turned over, saw my minuscule apartment, and knew I was home. As had been the trend, I took stock of the mail stack and found a package sitting on top of the usual pile of bills and ads. On the flimsy box was a note, pinned several times to make sure it wouldn't fall off on the vent ride up. You didn't tell me it was local. Finding Selena was easy. Plenty of headlines. I've included some here for you. You owe me at least three juicy quotes for this. Opperman. Inside the package was a set of articles, all of them from Opperman's paper and written over a series of days. I took the longest one, the last one, out first. Revenge of the Ruined Selena Kyris isn't known to many of you, but rest assured, by the time this article is over, you will feel nothing if not sympathy for this doomed woman. She was killed by her last husband, who wielded a cleaver in making an end of his wife. Selena did not go quietly, however, as she delivered her own fatal stab to her husband's back. A discerning reader might wonder which attack came first. With Selina, there is no question. Kyris was Selina's maiden name, and it remains hers despite three marriages. And, before this last one, two other likely murders. Both of them in Chicago, and both of them declared accidents. The first husband, a Matthias Ferber, found squashed on the ground beneath their tenth-story apartment. Alcohol was blamed, broken bottles throughout the place. Selena, sobbing in the living room, given the innocent's due a properly weeping widow. 
The second, Bruce Evers, of an apparent heart attack at the old age of 33. Selena again at the scene, again describing a mess of a marriage full of drink and drugs, of failed business and failed love. Whether Bruce committed a secret suicide or Selena assisted, it didn't matter. Our Selena was set free. The third looked like it would stick. Wiley Rose, a stable butcher, that by all accounts found himself in love with Selena's sad story. Two children later, and it seemed Selena's bad luck had disappeared, until both mother and father turned up dead in bloody fashion. Wiley, it turned out, was not nearly so stable as he appeared. Friends had driven the man into debt, and the growing pollution in Chicago was forcing expensive adjustments to keep his meat pure. Selena responded to the stress in the same way this reporter and the Chicago police now believe she acted in every other situation. Remove it by means of untimely demise. Except Wiley wasn't a drinker, wasn't a drug user. Their house had no second story to fall from. So Selena turned to more direct means. I put down the article. The implications were clear. Selena had murdered her husbands, had escaped punishment, until the last one proved harder to kill. When I'd met Selena, it was in a side street, not that far from the clock tower. I'd been hunting an angry spirit in the area, the resonator taking me right to it. The spirit had been a hulking man, the pale fire of rage in his eyes. Selena had been backing away as the man went towards her. How could you ruin everything? The man had said as Selena retreated down the street. I unfurled the lash, walking towards them. Things weren't perfect, but they were going to get better. The man broke into a run at Selena, who turned and saw me. That moment is one I hope I'll remember forever. Her eyes lighting on me, and her mouth dropping open in a yell for help. Her face crying with what I thought was fear. Now, I think, it was the last goodbye to a life she'd chosen to end. I closed the distance, and, as the man reached out to grab Selena, my lash struck, wrapped around his chest, and pierced into his stomach. My blue fire washed his away, and a moment later, the man stood stock still and stupid. What did you do? Selena asked me. Gave him what he wanted, I said. Peace. The man turned and walked away, towards the cycle. Selena held my arm. A murderer clinging to one more victim. Unlikely Allies Part of me wanted to go right back into Riven, find Selena, and talk to her, confront her with the article, and get her story straight, learn if the only thing she wanted was another person to get close to, and, when things took a turn, end. But it was getting towards the evening, and I had another mystery that still needed solving. Barrington had said my mother was a guide, had died a strange death, if there was anyone that might have more information, it was Anna. And now was prime time for the broken beaker. The lab district at sunset wasn't quite the madhouse it would turn into later. For one, too many people were still pushing papers and bubbling brews in their buildings for the streets to be too crowded. For another, the alcohol hadn't been flowing long enough. Anna met me in the back room. Or, I should say, I found her there. At the bar taking a long slug of something dark with an empty glass beside her. Rough day? I asked, pulling off my mask and sitting. You think being a sneak is easy, don't you? Anna said, leaning her head on her elbow and turning to me. Never said that, I replied. Sorry, I'm just looking for a target. Me too. You can go first, if it'll make you feel better. It's nothing. A nice client that's going to get a bad end, Anna said. She was paying to see what happened to her father 
and I could see that she wanted to believe that he hadn't died in the war. You found him? Running around the tar pit, which, by the way, is turning into a disaster area. Avoid it, I said. We closed a breach there yesterday. Not everybody has the luxury of playing by your rules, Anna said. I saw the pale fire in his eyes, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. I'm going to meet with the girl tomorrow. Tell her that's her father in there. You're going to tell her that he's a mindless, enraged ghost? I'm going to tell her that he's at peace, making his way to the cycle, Anna said, taking another pull. I could make that happen, I said. Thought that was the right thing to do. Offer to wrangle the spirit. All it got me was a glare. You can. I can't, Anna said. That's what's messed up about this situation. I was about to speak, but Anna kept going, bowling me over with a string of words, slurs sliding in here and there as the drinks she took caught up with her. They never tested me. My parents kept it hidden, ignored it when I told them about my nighttime walks on the other side. That's illegal. Thanks, I know that, Anna said. I think they believed I'd grow out of it if I wasn't trained, that I'd have a shot at a normal life lived in this world. Except it doesn't stop. If you don't know what you're doing, you'll still cross over. It's dangerous. The guides have clinics for people who flunk out or retire. They'll train you how to avoid Riven. I ordered my own beer. Something about the direction of the conversation told me it'd be better with a drink. I didn't want to avoid it, Anna said. Like all of you guides say, getting to see the truth is a gift. Why give that up? Only I couldn't find much else to do until I found the sneaks. But now? Riven's getting more dangerous, Anna said. You see that. You know it. Bet you're all laughing there with your gear, thinking about all the sneaks getting taken out by spirits, chewed to pieces in that gray mess. That sounds like us, laughing as others die. Then why don't you help us? Do more than just warn us away. That's why I'm here, I said, and Anna bit off her next remark in surprise. Gave me a wary look. I can't make you a guide. Not yet, anyway. But I can help you. How? Guide gear is only for, well, guides, I said. Only I happen to know someone who can get you something to fight with. Something that'll let you take care of those spirits and give your clients some peace. Who? He's in Riven. I let a smile cross my face. Anna looked so suspicious it was funny like I'd put in all this effort just to trick a sneak into a bad situation. There's a catch, though. What do you know about my mother? Anna laughed. Sorry, Carver, I'm not telling you that. Not until you come through. I said you had to make me a guide, but if your magic man turns out to be a real thing, if I get my tools, then I'll tell you. There's few things as frustrating as getting locked away from what you want. My mother died, and I wanted to know why. Anna was the next link in that chain. But here she was, playing a hard game. That Nicholas could build her a weapon, I had no doubt. The problem was one of time. Riven was getting worse, and Graham was coming. I didn't want another cane crushing my head in while I still had so many questions. Deal, I said. Tonight, we go to Riven together. Think about it. A guide helping a sneak. Don't remind me, I said, taking a long drink. I'm going to. This whole time. You, a guide, need a sneak. Stop it. No. Team Game The first challenge was finding out where Anna crossed over. She'd mentioned that it was somewhere south of the clock tower, near the Warrens. Made sense, as most people dying in the usual ways showed up there at some point or another. Sneaks wouldn't have to venture too far to find their targets. 
As I went south from the clock tower, I saw plenty of sparks shooting up from various parts of the city. Guides were getting out in force lately, with the war picking up, and Riven getting more dangerous. Had to keep ghouls to a minimum. Had to keep breaches closed. Normally, I'd have been happy to see so much activity. Now, it would just make my job harder. I couldn't be seen with Anna, or I'd have to have a real good story for why I was leading a sneak around Riven. I told Anna to wait for me when she crossed. Running around wasn't going to do anything more than getting her killed. She hadn't taken that line very well, throwing me a raised eyebrow and replying that she'd been running around Riven as long as I had, thank you very much. I switched tactics and said I'd never find her if she moved around, and that worked a little better. I'll give you half an hour, Anna had said at the train station before we split. It had to be getting close to that time. I was at the entrance to the Warrens, the Ghoul's Gateway. Without Bryce, the crumbling arch was ominous, less a lead-in to excitement and more a warning of terrors beyond. My hand drifted to the lash. You're awfully slow for a guide, Anna said, stepping out from behind the arch. You're a terrible listener, I replied, unwrapping my fingers from the lash's grip. Told you to wait where you crossed. Figured you'd have a better chance of finding me here, Anna said, looking up at the gateway. So where's this friend of yours? Hold up, I said. There's a lot of guides around, so some ground rules. First, I lead. You're the one who knows where you're going. I'm going to leave you here if you don't stop interrupting me, I said, and Anna leaned against the arch with a shrug. Thought you could take it, Anna said. What with all your brave talk? Look, I pushed past it. I need to have a reason you're with me if we get found. That's going to be that you're a spirit I bound, because you have information on another angry spirit. I do, huh? Yeah. Make something up if they press you. That's all? Just make something up? I thought that's all sneaks did. Now it was her turn to get defensive. Made me feel good. The walk back to Selena's apartment, now also Nicholas's lab, was made mostly by ducking into alleys, using the periodic spark showers as signposts to be avoided. I listened for any noise. Fighting, footsteps, conversation. Anna, for her part, focused once we started moving and kept quiet. After an hour, twice as long as it would have taken on a normal night, we made it to the apartment. Nicholas greeted us at the door, taking Anna in with a close look from his goggled eyes. Assuming this is your friend, Anna said, because if you were to ask me who was making weapons and ribbon, a person decked out in goggles and a lab coat would be my first guess. I'm Nicholas Salzer, at your service, the scientist said, extending a dirty, gloved hand. Anna glanced at the offered palm, hesitated, then shook it with gusto. Anna Blanc, pleasure, Anna said. Carver's been telling me about your prowess. Years of hard work pays off, Nicholas said was doing quite well for myself back in the real world. Unfortunately, explosions can be a tad unpredictable. Nicholas, stop scaring her, I said, more afraid that Anna was going to ask Nicholas for the full story. We'd be here for hours, time I didn't have. She needs a weapon. You have any lying around? As I finished talking, I went by the scientist and into the apartment. From the doorway... I'd caught a hint of changes, and once I went through, wow. Gone was the long table Selena and I used to sit at. Even the chairs had been pushed to the edges of the room. A new, smaller boiler was out on the balcony, pipes streaking into the apartment and wrapping through a long series of machines that I couldn't identify. Some were obvious. A forge for heating metal, a stove that appeared to have several boiling liquids on it, and then three other contraptions that dominated the rest of the space that I couldn't identify. I don't have one ready-made, no, Nicholas said. Despite your predilections, Carver, I'm not a store. 
I do not have limitless stock on demand for you. Selena really lost the battle for this place, didn't she? I said, continuing my inspection. Selena? Anna asked from behind me. My cohabitator, Nicholas said. She was generous enough to support the mission at the expense of her own living space, yes. Where is she? I asked. Outside, watching the storm of sparks your fellows are setting loose, Nicholas said. Now, when you say weapon, what are you looking for? Something for her, I said. Easy to learn. Strong and deadly, Anna countered. Nicholas took a slow look at her. You're not a guide, Nicholas stated. Do you have any formal training in the arts marshal? I'm savvy, Anna said. I know how to throw a good punch. Enough bar fights have taught me that. Nicholas rubbed his chin, his wispy beard. He kept staring at Anna with an intensity that, with anyone else, would have been creepy. I knew, though, that behind those eyes, numbers were dancing a tango that would end with some devilishly cool device. I have it, Nicholas announced. Only, I cannot make it here. Or rather, I can, but I'm missing the necessary pieces. Of course you are, I said, and Nicholas shot me a glare. It was you who told me to abandon my lab, Nicholas said. Were we still there, all this would take is a night of work. Now, however, I'll need you two to go back to my former residence and collect a few items. We'll do it, Anna said. I sighed. Intruder I found her on the balcony, staring at the sparks popping up into the sky. Selena looked radiant in the gray light wearing a new dress that I'd never seen before. Nicholas made it, Selena said, without looking at me. I watched a series of amber sparks ripple across her eyes. A gift for letting him move in here. I didn't even know you could make dresses in Riven. Nicholas is a talented guy. We said nothing for a moment. Behind me, back in the apartment, I could hear Nicholas telling Anna more about his planned weapon. She was peppering him with questions, and if there was one thing Nicholas liked, it was answering inquiries. I found him, Selena said. Graham. Where? We spoke, Selena said, and now she turned to me. He wants me to bring you to him. That sounds like a trap. It is. Selena said. I don't want you to go. You told me he might have a way of bringing me back. And I think he does. But it's not a good one. Even if it's the worst thing Riven has ever seen, I don't have a choice, I said. Graham's a danger to everyone, including you and Nicholas. I can't just let him run around out there. I thought you'd say that. Selena slipped into a sad smile. Always running towards adventure. You're not so different, I said. I wanted to talk about what I'd found, what Opperman had told me, but there didn't seem to be a good way to bring it up. What would Selena think if she knew I'd had her investigated? It's easier when you're already dead, Selena said. Who's the new girl? She knows something about my mother. In exchange, I'm having Nicholas set her up. Nothing else? Selena raised an eyebrow a millimeter. And get on your bad side? I laughed. I've got enough people trying to kill me. No thanks. I leaned in, slid my arm around her waist, and brought her close. Tried to find a line, something smooth to say, and settled for a kiss. Selena didn't back away from it. We've got to go get something for Nicholas, I said. But when I get back, we're picking this up where we left it. So, you do like the dress. I love it, I said. Gave Selena a nod and turned to go back into the apartment. Carver, don't get yourself killed out there, Selena said. Not the plan, 
I replied, then walked back inside. I really needed to work on my goodbyes. Not the plan? What kind of a phrase was that? Let's get going, I said to Anna, as she and Nicholas huddled over a desk where the scientist was sketching something. I've got things to do tonight. The tar pit was getting a little too familiar. One of those places where I didn't want to spend a lot of time, but now, here I was again. Nicholas's lab sat in front of us. The main door is still broken from Kane and Spike's visit last night. You set him up nice, Anna said. I'm assuming that you've bound both of them? I glanced at her. It wasn't common knowledge that a guy could keep a spirit around if they wanted. I might have. Heard that's not easy to do, Anna said, leaving the sentence hanging there. I could have told her that the process was arduous, that you first had to befriend the spirit, or at least get it to accept what you were going to do. Then you had to find an area that the spirit could call home, a place that would be safe. For Selena, that had been her apartment. For Nicholas, his lab. After that, well, it took a handshake, a kiss, some form of physical contact. I'd bound two spirits, and binding more than one was very much frowned on by the guides. Binding was disruptive. It kept spirits from the cycle and established permanence in a world that didn't want any. Not to mention there was the potential for exactly what Selena and I were doing. Guide spirit romances were so forbidden as to be blinding offenses. Guides would take you and strip your connection to Riven, then charge you with a literal crime so you rotted in prison too, just to kick you in the teeth. It's not fun, I said, but for the right spirit, it's useful. I didn't let Anna get going with her next sentence, but walked fast inside the lab. Nicholas had us questing for a pair of parts to get Anna's weapon put together. First was a chain he'd been building as an eventual substitute for my lash. That was easy. The chain hung on a crude hook, slammed into the back of the far wall. The lab, apart from the chain, was a study in random destruction. Materials and machines were scattered around. Tables overturned and shattered. Yet, even with a cursory glance, it didn't look like things had been so ruined as to be irreparable. If we could guarantee Graham wouldn't be a problem anymore, then Nicholas would be able to come back here without much fuss. I'm not seeing the ball, Anna said, digging around. That would be the second item we needed. Nicholas described it as a beige sphere. I had asked what it did, and he said that he'd show us when we brought it back. I have it, said a new voice, soft and strong. Leaning on the lab's door, the beige sphere held in her hand was a spirit wrapped in a tight series of ashen bands. Her shoulders and arms were bare, but the bands covered the rest of her, leaving her eyes and her straight hair the only other parts visible. Rising over her back, I could see a pair of handles, or hilts. Guessing you're not going to give it to us? I asked, drawing the lash. Do you work for Graham? The spirit asked. Who's Graham? Anna said at the same time as I was saying, no. Then you can't lead me to him? The spirit ignored Anna, looked at me. Don't know where he is, I said. Anna flipped glances between the two of us. Then you're no use to me, the spirit said. She turned to leave. Give us the sphere, Anna said, her tone way too aggressive for someone that had no weapon. The spirit paused, turned to look at Anna. Do you know where you are, girl? The spirit said because threats here must be backed up by something more than words. They are. I moved forward, snaking the lash behind me. With a flick, I could have the lash streaking through the air towards the spirit's face. I suppose I could use the practice, the spirit murmured. Then, with a snap of her arm, 
she threw the sphere at me. I caught it with my left hand, but the motion meant I didn't crack my lash. The spirit used that moment to draw the weapons on her back, a pair of wooden batons with metal hooks on the top end, batons with a telltale line near the grip that indicated they could be twisted to ignite wrangling fire, a guide's weapon. I danced back as the spirit came at me with a spinning flurry of blows. The edges of those batons blurred by inches from my face, but those inches were the difference between dead and alive. I snapped the lash back, then cracked it forward as the spirit whirled into a half-crouch, glaring up at me with her batons ready. Then she did exactly what I'd hoped. The lash blitzed forward, and the spirit stuck one of her batons in the way. The baton blocked the strike, but the lash wrapped around the spirit's weapon. With a snap of my wrist, I whipped the baton out of her hand and sent it flying across the room. The spirit made the most of that vulnerable instant, charging into me. She used the baton in her left hand to strike at my right elbow, pinning my lash back. I felt her empty right hand reaching for my long knife. Couldn't let her get that and poke me to pieces. I grabbed the spirit's wrist as she made another grab for the knife and twisted it. I should have been strong enough to break it, but the spirit moved with my force, jumping and twisting so that her legs wrapped around my face. My eyes bulged as her knees pushed into my temples, her hands still pulling for that knife. Not what I'd expected, but if there was anything I'd learned as a guide, it was that most fights were dirty. The dead had no dignity. So I turned around, stumbling, and then ran at the wall behind me. I felt the spirit try to release my head, try to scramble away, but I held her legs with my hands, trapping her. Just before we struck the wall, the spirit arched her back, threw her arms out in front of her towards the wall, and, as we hit it, pushed. The sudden opposite force coupled with my legs hitting the wall to knock me, still holding the spirit, on my back. The spirit rolled off of me as I coughed up air. She hadn't escaped unscathed. I stood up and followed her as the spirit limped back to her baton, her left wrist hanging at a strange angle, probably broken from the impact. For a guide, the spirit said, looking back at me, you're a clever fighter. She picked up her baton then and came at me again. My left hand went for the knife but it wasn't there. As I looked up at the spirit, I realized why. Her wrist was at a weird angle because of her grip on the knife, hiding it along the length of her arm. The spirit with my knife ran at me, pointed right for my throat. Carver! Anna yelled from across the lab. In my peripheral, I saw her throw something at me. The other baton. I caught it as the spirit hesitated, staring at me. What, you're done now? I asked. A trade, the spirit said suddenly. The knife and the sphere for the baton. I glanced at Anna. Even if the spirit had some sort of fancy trick plan, I felt better without her having the knife. Deal, I said. The spirit threw the knife at my feet. I looked at it thought about picking it up and just going after the spirit with both weapons. Only, the spirit had no pale fire in her eyes. She had an agenda. She seemed to want to hurt Graham. I gave the spirit her baton back. She took it, and without another word, bolted from the lab. Was that strange? I said, watching the door the spirit had fled through. Because that seemed strange. She was killing you, Anna said. Not very impressive for a guide. Please, that was all part of my plan. Get her overconfident, then surprise, I said. Right, Anna said. That's what was going to happen. I ignored the remark. Went outside and saw the sphere on the street, left there as promised. Picked it up and ran my fingers over its smooth surface. It seemed to be stone, something Nicholas could have found anywhere in Riven. Come on, 
I said to Anna as she followed me out of the lab, chain in hand. Let's go. Next time a spirit jumps me, it'd be nice if you had a way to help. The New Weapon On the walk back to the lab, I kept turning over the banded spirit in my mind. While Riven had plenty of spirits and states between losing their minds and on dead-eyed journeys to the cycle, before Graham, I hadn't encountered any that were calculating. Aggressive, but not out of control. Now, counting Kane and Spike, there had been four in the last couple of days. Anna and I passed by a trio of spirits, standing on the thin sidewalk and staring at each other, confused. Newcomers, sharing that lost and dazed stare amongst themselves. Hold this, I said, handing the sphere to Anna. I want to try something. I went up to the trio and waved my hand in front of their faces. They looked like travelers, sporting jackets and trousers meant for a trek. Victims, perhaps, of an accident or disease in some edgy frontier. As my hand passed in front of their eyes, they tracked it. What are your names? I asked them. They turned at the sound of my voice, but said nothing. Angry spirits, like the one Selena found days ago, clung to their personality, to a warped version of themselves. Others, especially if they had some expectation of death, understood where they were and managed to bring part of themselves to bear on it gained a voice, even determination, until the cycle washed it away. These three, though, they were what I expected. Whomever they had been at the moment their lives left them was gone. What are you doing? Anna asked me. Confirming that Riven still makes sense, I said, at least in its own way. We left the spirits and kept going back to the apartment. The trio hadn't helped me figure out why the banded spirit bothered to attack, but at least Riven wasn't turning to a murderer's row of hostile spirits around every corner. I only knew one way, though, that a spirit could gain that level of reasoning, come up with goals beyond tearing the throat out of the next thing it saw. That was through binding, which a guide could do, which anchored a spirit to Riven through a piece of the guide himself. Graham suggested another that perhaps a strong-willed spirit could survive on its own, even bring other spirits under its power. If that was true, and Kane and Spike suggested it was, then Graham might be able to form his own army, bring bands of armed, deliberate spirits to ambush and annihilate unsuspecting guides. He was more dangerous than ever. I opened the door to the apartment and froze, Nicholas stood in the middle of the living room, holding one of the blue-tinged crossbow bolts and wearing a dark cloth vest with indigo lines running through it. You've returned, Nicholas said as he saw me. Now the test can begin. Before Anna or I could say anything, Nicholas stabbed himself with a crossbow bolt, blazing blue fire up and around the scientist. I felt a sudden rush as Nicholas severed our connection ran forward to try and pull the bolt out of the scientist's chest. But Selena stopped me, caught my arm as I went into the apartment. He thinks he has a way to stop it, Selena said as we watched Nicholas collapse to the floor. To block the cycle. It would mean you wouldn't have to bind us anymore. This is his idea of how to test that? I said, incredulous. If it doesn't work, you'll rebind him. Selena replied. You chose some weird spirits, Anna added. The fire burned down around Nicholas, eventually vanishing and leaving the spirit lying on the floor. We all watched him, waited. I'd never seen a broken binding before, had no idea what would happen next. Nicholas, you still there? I said to the scientist's prone form. He didn't reply. Should we poke him or something? Anna asked. Wait, Selena said. Give him time. 
Nicholas eventually stirred, stood up on his feet, his back to us. So if this worked, I said to Selena, he said he should be himself. When Nicholas turned around, though, I didn't see any trace of my friend. His eyes were as dead as any of the spirits I'd wrangled before, as devoid of comprehension as the trio on the street. Nicholas? Anna said to the scientist. He didn't say anything. Stared past us, towards the door. Took a step forward. Right, I said, moving in front of Nicholas. This one's gone on long enough. I reached out, put my hand on the spirit's shoulder, and found our connection. Brought the two of us back together, and rebound the scientist to me. When it was done, Nicholas blinked. And, behind those eyes, I saw the shimmering intelligence that had been missing a moment before. I take it the experiment failed? Nicholas asked. It did not go well, I said. You went blank, and we're about to march on out of here. I'm sorry, Nicholas, Selena said. That's all right, Nicholas said to her. Experiments are meant to fail, are meant to be tried again. Eventually, if one follows their hypothesis to the end, the idea is confirmed to be possible. Or, or we have no other choice, Selena finished. Right. Nicholas seemed to deflate. If we cannot devise a means to suppress the cycle, then we are tied to Carver here. When he eventually passes, then we will lose our anchor. Selena nodded, then slipped away, out towards the balcony. We watched her go. Nicholas, I said, do you think you're close? The scientist sighed, shook his head. Without a better idea of how the cycle works, I'm afraid I am only guessing. The vest was meant to suppress the frequencies your resonator picks up. I had hoped, perhaps, the compulsion came through along those lines. Keep trying, I said. You might get lucky. Anna held up the sphere, and Nicholas brightened. There's no better cure for a failed experiment than conducting another one, Nicholas said. Now, bring that bauble over here, and let's get started. Can't stop now. After Nicholas declared we'd found the right pieces, and that it would take him a day of focused effort to put the thing together, Anna left to cross back over. I went out to the balcony, where Selena was still standing, watching the occasional spark. So, you're still tied to me, I said. I hope you're not too disappointed. So clever, Selena said, rolling her eyes. So funny. I can't help it. Part of who I am. It's good that you know who you are, Selena said. It's easier to lead the life you're looking for that way. The hard swing to the serious. I had already made up my mind to leave Opperman's material alone for now, but if Selena wanted to dig into that side of life, I was ready. Do you know who you are? I asked her. Me? Sometimes I think I'm just a woman who wound up on the unlucky side of life. Other times I think that everything that brought me here is my own doing, that it's who I am. What brought you here? If Selena wanted to confess her past, and thus make revealing Opperman's work unnecessary, I'd take that chance. Choices, Selena said. While you're living it, life moves too fast for reflection. Here, though, in Riven, you're presented with as much time as you need. All the evidence of lives lived wrong. The other spirits. I look at them and wonder how they died, Selena said. Is that strange? That's basically my job, so I hope not. Right, but it's different for me. I want to know. Did they deserve it? Because you did? Crap. That was the wrong thing to say. 
I knew it as the words came out of my mouth. And it was confirmed when Selena frowned at me. What did you say? Selena's voice didn't hold the anger I expected. That you think you deserve to be here? A chance to change my words, to dodge the swinging axe, but no. I went for it. Because I knew I wanted to have this conversation. To find out whether the Selena I knew was a fraud. Whether she was using me as some new affection before stabbing me in the back. Or finding a way out of Riven with Graham. I do, Selena said, not even bothering to fight. Then, so do most people. I've done terrible things, Carver. Even so, they're not so awful as others. I didn't die terribly, this scar notwithstanding. I didn't suffer through a disease. I didn't watch my children die. I wasn't mutilated or drowned. It was instant. One moment there, the next here. If you hadn't found me, I'd be gone entirely by now. We all go eventually. Only, that's not really true, is it? Selena said. Graham's idea. The binding you've done. Spirits can live forever. And maybe come back. I studied her expression as she said those words. Looked for any sign of malice. Or her eyes slipping away from mine as she lied. There was nothing. Only honest conversation. You're going to take me to him, I said. Yes, Selena replied. Together. What if he can crack Riven? Open a way back. I'll be the first through the door, Selena said. Even if it would hurt everyone on the other side? Even your children? Selena's face went sad for a second, and she turned back to Riven's torn skyline. For another life, I would do anything. The words chilled me. There were a lot of terrible things Graham might offer her for that chance. Are you ready? Selena said. He'll be there tonight, but we can wait. If you're tired. I was. I was exhausted and burnt after this conversation. After the fight with the spirit in Nicholas's lab. But I was sick of Graham. Sick of what he was doing to my life. Let's go, I said. Take me to Graham. Duel. The building wasn't natural. Wasn't in its original riven state. I could tell from the imperfect shards placed on the square roof. From the bars put into the windows and the broken mortar around them. Could tell from the large, deep wood door with new hinges covering the entrance. The windows hadn't the slightest glow. No sound came out of the place, which was a half block in size. At least three stories. A big place for a single spirit to bother with. He's here, Selena said at my questioning look. How does he want us to come in? I said. Knock? Break through the door? At my words, Selena walked forward, took the handle that sat on the right side of the door, and pulled it. With silent grace, the door, large enough for Selena and I to walk in side by side, swung out towards me. Inside, the entrance held a single bench and clear stone walls. A passage went back briefly before opening into a wider room. Boring, but I guess it's functional, I said. Focus, Carver, Selena said, this time a flash of worry darting across her face. With all that talk of getting out of Riven alive, it was nice to see she still cared. Making stupid statements is how I focus. I peered down the passage. I'm finding the lack of a greeting suspicious. Follow me, Selena said. And so I did. Down the passage, 
where the lack of windows made the world dim. The room beyond, however, lacked a ceiling. Riven's light poured in. I guess in a world without rain or anything other than gray nothing, missing a roof wasn't a problem. One thing caught my eye. There he is, I said to Graham, standing at the end of the empty courtyard. The ash that fluttered through Riven's air had been collecting here, had built up until it formed a loose carpet. Indeed, here I am, Graham replied. Thank you, Selina, but you may leave us now. I wanted to tell her to stay, but stopped myself. What would she do? Would Selina blindly obey Graham and make it obvious I was screwed, stab me in the back, or get herself hurt trying to help me? Be careful, Selina told me. His weapons aren't only physical. Graham gave the comment a nod, and then Selina walked back the way we'd come, shut the door to the outside, and disappeared, leaving me alone with Captain Top Hat and his hammer. Why'd you wreck Nicholas's lab? I said. Because he was making things that don't belong in Riven, Graham said. That crossbow you wear on your back, that was never meant for here. Riven is where you get up close with the lost, and by doing so, earn your own self. That's a bunch of crap, I said. You've told me, told Selina, that you have a way out of Riven. What is it? So direct, Carver, Graham said. You remember that you used to be a guide? I said. That your job was to keep Riven safe? To keep spirits locked in? Look where it took me, Graham said. Tell me how, I repeated. Either Graham would tell me how, and then I could share it with the rest of the guides, and potentially Selina, or he wouldn't. In which case, I would wrangle him and send Graham to the cycle. Some things are better shown, I'm afraid. If you'll come over here, lie down, then we'll get started. That's not happening, I said. If you're not talking, I reached for the lash. Graham smiled, a creepy affair, as his eyes opened wide, dragging his wrinkled, scraggly face up around them. With pleasure. Graham broke into a loping run, setting the spiked hammer over his shoulder and holding the hilt. His left hand, still sporting the gauntlet, pumped with every footstep. I flipped the crossbow off my back, raised it, and fired. On the walk over, I'd slotted in a normal bolt and cranked the weapon. Figured having a ready-to-fire shot wouldn't be a bad plan. Graham tried to dart out of the way, but wasn't fast enough. My shot caught him in the shoulder, spun him around and to the ground. I drew the lash and snapped it as Graham tried to push himself to his feet. I hit his leg, but Graham twisted his ankle away from the pointed end. Still, the lash tore away parts of the spirit's clothes and the skin beneath. I sent the lash forward again, this time at his chest, an easier target except Graham's left hand snaked out and caught the lash, held it tight. I did nothing for a second, stunned. A whipping lash was fast, so fast that I couldn't believe anyone could catch it. Graham would have had to anticipate the move, already getting into position before I'd snapped the lash. Then the spirit pulled hard, yanked me forward. By instinct, I dug in my heels and realized what a bad call that was when Graham used the resistance to pull himself up to his feet. He lunged, swinging the hammer. I dropped the lash and darted back, the spirit swing catching only air. I pulled out the long knife, sidestepped to Graham's right towards the side with the hammer. His weapon took space to get a good swing, and if I could get close, get inside his reach, 
there'd be openings. I kicked my right foot, throwing up a cloud of the ash that had gathered on the courtyard floor. It flew towards Graham's face, and as soon as my foot hit the ground, I pushed off towards his right side. The spirit didn't move fast enough, the ash forcing him to block his face with a hand. I cut in, grabbing his hammer arm with my left and stabbing with my right. I felt the knife bite in and expected the pale fire to burst out, crawl over Graham, and end the fight. Only it didn't. The knife burned blue, but Graham jerked free before any pale fire touched his clothes, swiped the hammer as he backstepped. I couldn't get out of the way, the hammer catching my left shoulder as I tried to keep a grip on the knife. Graham couldn't get much power behind the hit that close to me, but there wasn't a light way to get slammed with a large hammer. The spike brushed my shoulder, the rest of the head crunching me down to the ground. I used the momentum to roll, ignoring the ache from my left side. A second later, the hammer struck the ground where I'd fallen, denting the courtyard's floor. There are two ways, Carver, Graham continued. Two ways to bridge the gap between Riven and your world. One, you already know. Graham let me stand up. The spirit wasn't pushing his attacks. Why? Clog Riven with spirits? I felt something against my foot and noticed I'd rolled near my lash. Without taking my eyes off of Graham, who seemed content plucking the crossbow bolt from his left shoulder, I crouched and regained my lash. Yes, and what a terrible choice that would be, Graham said. Chaos. No control over who went across. At one time, though, I thought that would be the only way. The crossbow was behind me, only a few feet away. If Graham stayed on his monologue, I'd have a chance to get it. Get another shot off. This one straight into the spirit's busy mouth. Until I found you, Carver, Graham said. Until I found out who you were. I hesitated. What do I have to do with anything? With you, Carver, I can control the breach. Control the bridge between Riven and our home, Graham said. Giving you control has to be the last thing I want, I said, yanking up the crossbow. I didn't see Graham launch the hammer. Didn't see it whirl through the air. I only felt it when the spiked end embedded itself in my chest and pushed me into the wall. I felt my ribs break. Couldn't focus. My vision pulsed, shook at the edges. But I could see Graham walking towards me that same manic grin on his face. I grabbed the spark tube from my belt as I slid onto my knees. Standing was too hard. I pressed the button on the tube's end. Didn't even watch the sparks fly high into the sky and burst. Unfortunately, Carver, you don't have to be awake for this. Only alive. At first. Graham closed. Perhaps it is fortunate. I hear it's much easier to die in one's sleep. Rescuers Graham reached out, grabbed the hammer, and pulled the spike out of my chest. I slumped forward. For some reason, my body didn't want to stand up, didn't want to do anything. There was pain, sure but on top of it sat an overwhelming sense of defeat, of being broken. Why do you bring me to the factory? I asked. I wasn't really talking, more wheezing out the question. If you wanted me alone, you had me then. The other guides were there, Graham sounded annoyed. That one that's been trying to track me, he was following you. None of the spirits would have killed you if they'd won. You would have been saved. Graham crouched in front of me, gripped my face with his hand, and lifted it up. 
The eyes are perfect. The hair, just like hers. What? I coughed. I wanted to be sure, Graham said. Now we can begin. Graham grabbed my shoulder and pulled me forward, dragging me along the ground. In front of my eyes, Graham's hammer swung low, bouncing off the surface with every step the man took. Tiny sparks flew with each contact, mesmerizing. And then Graham dropped me, right in the center of the courtyard, turned me so my eyes faced Riven's gray sky. Graham seemed to fall inside himself, as though thinking hard on something. Then his eyes snapped wide, and he smiled at me. A little while longer, and then everything will be ready, Graham said. I truly hope you've enjoyed your life, Carver, and that at the end you can feel well-lived. Truth was, I wasn't paying attention to what Graham was nattering on about. That's because, flashing in the open air above our heads, was a series of blue sparks. A face appeared, looking over the edge. Graham, staring at me over his hammer, didn't notice Alec. Didn't move until the guide slammed down on Graham from above, knocking the spirit down into the ash. Alec didn't give Graham a moment to recover. Jabbing the spirit with his gauntlets, spikes digging in, Alec launched Graham across the courtyard. The spirit rolled to a stop near the edge. You are still alive, Carver, Alec said to me. I know we are late, but you choose the farthest places for your fights. Sorry, I said. The weakness in my voice killed Alec's friendly grin. His eyes narrowed, and he looked over at Graham. We will get you home, Alec said, all joking gone. Hold on, my friend. I turned my head to follow Alec as he sprinted towards Graham. Alec led with the right jab, his left swooping for a deep uppercut. Graham, recovering faster than Alec expected, twisted to his left, dodging the jab and putting Alec out of position. Graham kicked out with his leg, catching Alec in the stomach. The guide took the blow and wrapped his arms around Graham's leg, pushed up, tried to break the spirit's knee. Then I saw what the thing on Graham's wrist was for. Graham clenched his left hand into a fist, and the gadget pumped. A short wire shot down the gauntlet, appearing to glow blue as it went, then flew off Graham's wrist right into Alec's neck. The wire snapped, choked Alec, and then crackled with pale fire. Alec dropped Graham's leg and fell to the ground, rolling, trying to free himself. Graham went back towards the hammer, made it three steps before, with a whistling noise, a spear landed in the spirit's chest. No, not a spear, half of Bryce's volge. Graham looked down at it, surprised. Graham, Bryce called from the courtyard's entrance. It's time for your mistake to end. Spirits couldn't die a second death in Riven, but they could be hurt, weakened and wrangled, sent to the cycle. Graham reached for the volge and pulled on it, breaking it free from his chest and letting it fall to the ground. I noticed, though, that he straightened slowly, his smile gone and his eyes lacking their manic sparkle. What Graham didn't notice was that I was crawling, tugging my way through pain and agony towards Alec. I heard Bryce run through the courtyard behind me. You look familiar, Graham said, his voice lead now, dead with effort. What I look like doesn't matter, Bryce said. What does is that you don't belong anymore. The cycle calls, spirit. In front of me, Alec writhed on the ground, his neck turning black where the fire burned. His hands, protected by the gauntlets, were trying to pull the wire off and failing. 
I grabbed the knife on Alec's waist and pulled it out of its holster. Be still, Alec, I whispered. Alec obeyed, somehow calming his pain enough to stop struggling. I slipped the knife against the wire, a dark line coated with burning blue, and cut through it. As soon as the wire split, the fire vanished. Metal clashed behind me, and I turned to see Bryce engaging Graham in a deadly dance. Bryce had nabbed the half on the ground, and, his volge still in two parts, Bryce was a dervish, sidestepping, parrying, and getting under Graham's longer hammer blows. I could see Graham was slower, too, the injuries catching up to him. The spirit wasn't talking anymore, either. No cocky asides or strange questions. No rest yet, Alec muttered, massaging his charred neck. The guide rose, then turned to the fight. Graham noticed, and as his eyes caught Alec, Bryce struck with the side of the volge, knocking Graham in the head. When Graham straightened, Alec stood next to Bryce, ready. This is the end, spirit, Bryce said, twisting the handles of his volge. The weapon's edges glowed with blue fire. At the same time, Alec twisted his wrists, his gauntlets wreathing themselves with the same flames. Graham, leaning on his hammer, looked at the two guides. Then his mouth opened in what seemed like a silent scream. I heard noises above, on the building's second floor, the simultaneous pounding of feet. A spirit landed in the courtyard, then another, and a third, jumping from the balconies, lining the open space. Two landed between Bryce, Alec, and Graham. These weren't normal spirits, either. Like Cain and Spike, these had weapons. While they didn't have the pale fire in their eyes, they had murder. Run! I croaked at my friends. It wasn't worth having them die for me, especially as I was feeling worse. My body's will to push through the injuries was fading, pain again overtaking my ability to do anything other than curl up. Graham was the first to look at me, and I saw something in that sinister expression I did not expect. Concern. Carver cannot die here, Graham said, speaking to Bryce and Alec. An exchange. Your lives for his. A deal we should take, Alec said to Bryce. As much as I hate admitting it, we are not favored in this match. Agreed, Bryce said. The spirits parted, allowing the two guides to get to me, to lift me up and carry me from the courtyard. Live, Carver, Graham said as they carried me out. Come back to me and do what you were meant to. The words followed me into unconsciousness, chasing me into the dark of Riven's oblivion as Bryce and Alec carried me through its gray streets. Dream State I hadn't dreamed in decades, but when I saw the tree above me, its bare limbs stretching towards a ghost sky, I thought I'd found my way into one. Carver, Selena's voice stirred into my ear. How are you here? I turned to look at her. Selena stood at the base of the tree, eyes wide. Selena? Was all I could think to say. Graham's plan didn't work then, Selena said to me, coming closer. Or did it? Selena reached out a hand towards my chest. Her fingers touched the edge of my coat, the edge of my shirt, the edge of me, and passed through. Selena raised her eyes to mine drawing her hand out. You're not here. Not all the way. I'm not dead, I said. At least, I don't think so. Not yet, Selena said softly, her face looking down. You're close. Almost a spirit. 
Where did you go? When Selena looked back at me, her eyes shone with tears. I'm leaving, Carver. Going to where Graham can't make me hurt you. Make you? You've seen it. Selena looked behind her. I could see, in the far distance, the outlines of the tar pit smokestacks. He can influence spirits, but that's not all of it. I could have resisted, could have pushed him back. You wanted to cross. I said the words knowing they were true, and yet not blaming her for it, not hating her for wanting to go back to life. I did, Selena said. I still do. That makes me dangerous. I tried to help when Graham was focused on you. I found your friends, led them towards the fight. Selena passed her hand through my own. I didn't feel anything other than a cool otherness, a sense that my body and mind were in two different places. They saved me, I said. You saved me. I don't know, Selena replied. If you're here, then it might be too late. If you die, then I won't be bound. I've done enough hurt, Carver. I'm done with it. Where will you go? To the cycle, Selena said. It's always there, you know. Like a song my daughter used to sing in the summers. Easy to ignore, but if you listen, you can find it. Selena leaned in, her lips searching for mine. And when they met, I felt nothing. Selena's face passed into mine and then drew back. She laughed. Appropriate, don't you think? Selena said, for a last kiss between ghosts. Don't leave, I started. It's not your fault. Stop, Selena said. Focus. Stay alive. She took a step back. When you wake up, try to remember me. Selena left me there. I tried to follow, but my legs weren't listening. The dream state left me stuck beneath a tree, able only to look after her as Selena went through the barren park and over a hill. I felt a tug, like a heavy wind pulling at my back. The edges of everything blurred. The dead grass flowed together. I tried to focus on Selena as she went further and further away, as she vanished. Then, a mar, a dark spot in the fading scene, another person, following Selena through the park, moving slow, the spirit from before in Nicholas's lab, dark and banded, her hair flickering in the wind. I tried to yell, to say something, but my mouth didn't work. My body wasn't there. The world was pulling away. At the last, the dark spirit turned and stared at me. I could see her eyes, the roiling heat burning in her gaze. As she turned back toward Selena, I woke up. The Leader Come back, Carver, Bryce said as he slapped my face in the clock tower. Pull it together. My eyes flickered open and brought with them a thousand aches. It was getting really old waking up this way. Deserving to die. Good, Bryce said, and then he looked behind me to someone else. Alec, bring the salt. As I groaned, lying there, pathetic, in the bed, Alec came over with a small bowl. In it, clumped, was the dried-up essence of Riven's non-water. Inhale, Bryce said, as Alec put the bowl beneath my nose. When I breathed the crystals in, my chest expanded with an icy chill. 
The freezing sensation went throughout my body, stretching to the ends of my fingers and my face. Every instant of pain obliterated in the face of that cold. Now, cross, Bryce said. Don't wait. At first, I thought the cold itself would prevent me from focusing on anything. But I embraced the chill. Used it. Sank into the numbing ice. In that frozen bath, I found my apartment and fell towards it. I woke up for the third time in an hour. Only this time, I was in my own bed. In Chicago. In the real world. To be sure, I stood up, raised my arms to test if my body listened. I looked outside the window and counted the zeppelins coasting by in the sky, which was an emphatic blue. Early morning. My chest still hurt. While washing myself off in the cramped bath I shared with others on my floor, I traced the bruising around my lungs, a particularly dark circle where the hammer's spike had pierced. Every breath carried with it a sting. But I was alive. I showed up at Ezra's close to lunchtime, a couple of hours later than usual, but I figured Bryce would be understanding. What I didn't expect, though, was to see Peter sitting at our table, having coffee and chatting with Bryce. Alec there as well, looking exhausted and wearing a shirt with a high collar that hit his neck. Peter was a giant of a man, tall, thick, and coated with long white hair to go with a full snowy beard. The leader of the guides complimented his physical stature with a deep navy cloak. Gold-lined tracings of the guide logo, that circle and incomplete square, appeared at random on the outfit. Looking at the man gave me a sense of power, of stature, and his warm smile as he saw me made the inspiring whole come together. Here's the missing man, Peter announced when I came in. Carver, Bryce tells me that you had a close call last night. Wasn't my best hunt, sir, I said. Any hunt you live through is a good one in my book, Peter replied. I was about to sit down when Peter stood and looked towards Bryce who gestured towards our private room in the back. It was so much easier to get service out here that we didn't use it except for calls, our meetings that we wanted kept secret. The four of us crowded into the small chamber, and I grabbed my own mug of the dark stuff. The taste of something hot and real was a wonderful sensation, especially when, for much of last night, I thought I was never going to experience it again. Thanks, I said before Peter could get started. Both of you. For everything. If you keep ignoring my rule about going alone, Bryce said, I'm going to let Graham have you. What I'm curious about is how we found you, Alec said. Eventually we saw your sparks, but before that there was this beautiful voice. It kept saying you were in trouble. Strange, I lied. I don't know what that would have been. Riven has its peculiarities, Peter interjected. Alec looked like he wanted to press the point, but Peter ignored the guide. I'm here to talk to you about one of them. There's a tower on the southwest side of the city, at the very edge of the Warrens. A number of guides have gone near the area and disappeared. What I'd like to know is what's going on. Is it a ghoul, a breach, or something worse? You want us to take a look? Bryce asked. With the recent casualties, there aren't many full city compliments left, much less ones with your level of experience. Peter said. Consider it a favor to me. If the tower is indeed a problem, don't engage. Report back, and we'll organize a large effort. 
We spent the next hour talking over the tower's precise location, the identities of the missing guides, and when we'd go on the trek. Peter pushed for doing it that night, and Bryce agreed. My mentor's words about guides never getting vacations buzzed in the back of my mind. Here I was, barely scraping through, and they wanted to throw me into the fire again. Still, this was the path I'd chosen. If I didn't want to walk it, I could get blinded from Riven and set loose, which wasn't going to happen. After Ezra delivered sandwiches and we devoured them, Peter stood up. I think I've said all that needs saying, Peter said. I'll be back in the morning to see how it went. Then the leader of the guides turned to me, stuck out his hand. I shook it, hesitating a second. Carver Reed, Peter said. It's been a long time. Peter walked out of the room. Bryce and Alec followed soon after. I sipped the rest of the coffee, confused. I'd never met Peter before in my life. Deals Upon Deals You're late, Anna said to me as I walked into the apartment. Back in Riven, my injuries were gone. Physically, anyway. Mentally, huh, let's not talk about it. It was a busy morning, I replied. Walked past her into the noisy mess of the living room. When Nicholas went full on into a project, his sense of cleanliness vanished. Most of the machines were churning away, and Nicholas himself was bent over a workbench. Nicholas, I said, raising my voice over the noise. Is Selena here? I hadn't seen her in the bedroom or through the window on the balcony. I remembered the vision from the night before, but had no idea if that was real. I have seen no sign of her since she left with you, Nicholas replied without looking up. Have you lost her? She left, I said. I felt heavier. Selena was gone. Once she made it to the cycle, everything that she was would be erased. Everything we had shared in this gray city of the dead would only live in my memories. Nicholas stood up from the workbench, turned around, holding a two-foot-long metal rod in his hands. At one end was that beige sphere, locked into the rod. She left? Nicholas echoed. Not what I would have expected from her. She seemed so hopeful after yesterday. It was an impossible dream, I said. I could feel Anna's eyes on my back, and Nicholas waited for more, but I didn't say anything. Didn't want to get into Graham and all the rest. That wasn't what we were here for. Anyway, Nicholas said, after a too long silence, I'm finished early. This is your weapon, Anna. It is a mace with a special flourish. He presented it to her, and Anna raised the weapon gingerly. I could see the muscles tighten in her right arm, heavier than she expected. Now, Nicholas continued, when you carry the weapon, you keep it like this. When you have a fight in tight quarters, you keep it like this. But when you have room, then you change it. Nicholas reached above Anna's grip and twisted. The spheres fell off the top of the mace and dangled for a moment, until, with a click like a gear winding, a ring of inch-long spikes popped out. Pale fire made its way down the chain, starting from the rod, and eventually covered the sphere. Is that not a perfect weapon? Nicholas said. Anna, staring into the fire with her mouth slightly open, nodded. The best place to learn a new technique was the Warrens. Populated with spirits, but with plenty of other guides around if you got into trouble, the Warrens were as safe as danger got in Riven. Anna and I made our way through the ghoul's gateway, Anna cradling the mace in her hands. He gave you the holster for a reason, I said, looking at Anna's back. It's going to be more comfortable than carrying that thing. 
I want to get used to holding it, Anna said, and I didn't bother arguing. Everyone has their quirks. Hold up, I said some minutes later, as we approached the middle of the Warrens. From my belt, I pulled off my resonator, set it on the ground, and let it do its thing. What's that? Anna asked, and I told her. So, wait, you're saying you have this tool that lets you find angry spirits, and you never told me? That could be so useful. It's for guides only. I thought these were too, Anna waved the mace around. Besides, you seem to be bending all kinds of rules. I do what I have to. Anna rolled her eyes. What's with you today? You're sad, moping around. Does it have something to do with the other spirit, Selena? On the ground, the resonator glowed orange. North, but not quite back where we came. We'd be walking alleys to get to the target, and doing it quietly. I'd already popped sparks to indicate we were in the area and keep other hunts away, but a guide could always be chancing by. I have a lot of questions that need answering, I said. So after this, when you learn how to use that thing, you're telling me about my mother. That was the deal, Anna said, her tone different, distant. Good. I didn't want to sneak thinking she was my best friend all of a sudden. Anna kept quiet as we made our way north, following the resonator. The tool became brighter as we drew closer, bringing us into a ruin of what would have been a seven-story apartment building, a basic structure with stairs running up the center. Ready? I asked as we went in. Been waiting my whole life for this, Anna said. A chance to wrangle a spirit? I'm ready. I couldn't stop a small smile. That's what I'd said, too, on my first time. Bryce had been there, watching my every move. Now, I'd do the same with Anna. Except if we were caught together, I'd lose access to Riven forever. Rookie Moves The spirit was in the next room, and we could hear it growling to itself. We were on the fourth floor of the apartment building, and it was ugly. Cracks lined the floors and walls. Doors were non-existent. What furniture there was looked like it had been torn apart with absolute fury. One chair had legs in multiple apartments. Fuzz from cushions meshed with the ash floating in the air. You'll go in first, I said to Anna, who stood in the hall next to me. Say hello. When it turns, you'll confirm that it's the target. Then you swing. No special dance? No ritual? Anna said, laughter in her eyes. I shook my head and waved her forward. Anna rounded the corner into the room, and I followed. The spirit was hunched over the ruins of a bed. It was really just a splintered wooden frame and a single pillowcase. But the spirit... A middle-aged man caressed the frame with a slowness at odds with the noises coming from his mouth. Hello? Anna said, taking me literally then. The spirit paused, straightened, then turned his head to look at Anna. Glowing bright in his eyes were the telltale signs of crazy. Pale blue fire. You're not my wife the spirit said. Correct, Anna replied, raising the mace. Then you don't belong here, the spirit replied. He bent down, snapped off a part of the bed frame. Anna smashed him in the face. The spirit crumpled to the ground, groaning. Anna glanced back at me, grinning. He's not gone yet, I said leaning against the door frame. Anna jerked back as the spirit made a grab for her leg. You have to use the flail. Oh, right. Anna twisted her weapon, the sphere popping off, spiking out, and growing the blue fire. 
The spirit was back on his feet, one hand holding the bed frame and the other his head. It moaned, lurching towards Anna. She met the advance with a two-handed swing of her flail, the chain pulling the sphere hard and fast behind the rod. The spirit put up its bed frame piece to block. Anna's flail simply shattered the spirit's poor defense, blowing apart the wood and continuing on to crumple into the spirit's chest. The blue fire spread out and enveloped the spirit. Your first wrangling, I said a moment later, as the spirit walked by us on its dazed path to the cycle. Well done. Thanks, Anna said. She glanced down at her weapon, back in mace mode. Have to remember the fire. That's when we noticed the noise from the next room. A crying sound. A young one. I pulled out the resonator and confirmed. The signal guiding us to this building had been strong. Looked like the sound was coming from more than one spirit. You ready for round two? I asked. Ready, Anna replied. Then lead on. Anna went past the splintered bed frame, deeper into the apartment. An empty living room with a balcony, and then a second bedroom. Sitting in the middle of it, a girl. She looked up as we entered, her eyes a perfect burning blue. What happened to you? Anna asked the child. The girl tilted her head. She was wearing a flowery dress, one that I'd seen on Chicago kids going to parks. It lacked a certain charm when the kids wore their masks along with them. But here, on this spirit, the dress was perfect. You're not my mommy, the girl said to Anna. Then she looked at me. You're not my daddy. That's right, Anna said, squatting to get eye level with the girl. Anna, I said, that's not a real girl anymore. I'm not a real girl, the spirit said, standing up. She barely came up to my waist. You are, Anna said. You were. I caught the slight change, the tense of the girl's calves, but Anna didn't. Wasn't ready when the girl lunged at her. I pulled Anna back, and the girl's grabbing hands fell short. Anna scrambled away, back to her feet as the girl hesitated, unsure which of us to target. Don't think of her as a girl, I said. You have to see them all as spirits, things that need to be cycled. Anna nodded, but she held the mace loosely. When the girl lunged again, Anna tried to counter, to bat the girl away with the weapon, but Anna didn't put enough effort into the swing. The mace went high, the girl ducking under it and attacking Anna's leg grabbing and crawling up Anna's coat, biting and clawing her. Stop it, Anna yelled, but that wasn't going to mean anything to a spirit. The girl reached Anna's face, her mouth opening and going for Anna's cheek, when my lash wrapped around the girl's body, pulled her off Anna, and cloaked the spirit in blue fire. We both watched the girl as the fire died away, as her eyes blanked, and she stood up, and walked from the apartment. The only sound was Anna's hard breathing. They're not people, I said. They're spirits. I know, I know that, Anna replied. It's just hard sometimes. You can't let it be. One mistake with nobody around to help you, and that's the end of it. I get it. I'd agree, but the only way we'll know for sure is when you make it through the next few nights alive, I said. Harsh, maybe, but Bryce had said much the same to me. Riven didn't do charity. Didn't give people an opportunity to learn. I think I'm done for tonight, Anna said, staring at her mace. I didn't argue. When we reached the bottom floor of the apartment building, I paused. Now... About my side of the deal? I said. Tell me about my mother. Tracing the Lines
I've been thinking about how to tell you, Anna said. I think it'll make the most sense if I go back to the beginning. I'll walk slow, I replied as we moved through the Warrens. Remember when I met you on the train? Came up to you with the card? It's not easy to forget. Most people don't approach a guide. Right. That wasn't an accident. I knew you were going to be on that train, Anna said. I knew because I'd been following you. Someone hired you? Why else does a sneak do anything, right? Anna said. All about the money and that's it, according to you. Prove me wrong, I said. Anna laughed. Prepare to be embarrassed. I wasn't hired to follow you. I was hired to find your mother. Find her? But she's dead. In Riven. She would have died decades ago, I said. There's no way her spirit would still be here. That's what I thought when the client told me. When I found the death certificate, Anna said. The client told me he was confident she was here somewhere. And I believed him. Why? Because the client was the lead guide for Chicago. Liar, I said without thinking. Bryce would never hire a sneak. Anna took the opportunity to dish me another glare. Her annoyed face went well with the broken side street we were going down. A smattering of lampposts leered over the cracked road. Storefronts full of shattered glass stared out at us. Spirits wandered by on their winding paths to the cycle. Apparently, you're not listening, Anna said, because he did. Told me to look for a Catherine Reed, to search Riven, and if I found her, to tell him immediately. I decided to drop the Bryce issue for the moment. I could bring it up with him later. Did you? Find her? Close, Anna said. It took a long time. A lot of asking random spirits, following rumors and riddles. Eventually, I found where she lives, which is how I found out about you. What do you mean? She's keeping a diary, Anna said, writing down bits and pieces. I think it's so she doesn't lose herself entirely. I thought about Selena, her talk about falling out of sync with herself, losing what she was to Riven's unchanging eternity. Do you have the diary? Anna shook her head. I read it for a while and then ran out of there. The later entries weren't pretty. She's getting angry, Carver, and I didn't want her to find me there. We'd reached the busted up building that served as Anna's crossing point. The place looked like it had been a cheap hotel. Floors full of crumbling identical rooms. A faded sign out front, missing half the name so that the place looked like it was called the Grand Reg. So you found the diary, I said. Why didn't you go to Bryce with that? I wanted to find you first, Anna said. She looked away from me, because I thought I could use the information. Use you. You did, I said. Congratulations. I'm not proud of it, but I'm not sorry either. Anna turned back to me, defiant. You can make it up to me, I said. I'm busy tonight, but tomorrow you'll take me to my mother. You sound like you're giving me an order, Anna said. I don't like it, says the person who just admitted to using me. We made a fair exchange, Anna replied. But I'll do it. Have to admit, I'm curious to see where this goes. You're not the only one. Anna crossed over a minute later, leaving me alone again on Riven Streets. The walk back to the clock tower gave me plenty of time to think. My mother, still alive in Riven, as a spirit anyway, maybe not yet angry. She could tell me what happened to her, tell me who I was, 
and where I came from. Family Visit I pressed a small switch outside the front door to Bryce's house, a three-story thin building in the middle of a quiet neighborhood on Chicago's north side. Bryce and his family lived in comforts worthy of a guide who'd been patrolling Riven streets for decades. The switch, when I pulled it, bounced back up. On the inside of the door, small light would have come on. I heard the chime as it sounded. The usual way to say hello. Running thumps came a second later. The patter of small feet. And then a click as the center part of the door twisted to reveal a lens a way for them to see who was on the outside. I waved at it. The children, a boy and a girl, stepped back from the door, giving nervous glances at each other. My mask was a little scary. My large black coat didn't help. The door jerked open, and Bryce stood on the other side. Carver, a little early for dinner, Bryce said. Not that we were expecting you. Sorry, but I didn't want to wait. What for? What's this about? Bryce asked, turning back to the kids for a second and waving them away. You have somewhere we can talk in private? As much as I wanted to ask Bryce about the sneaks in front of his family, I figured there was a chance things could get emotional. It wasn't entirely out of the question that anger could come into play when you get to talking about how your mentor, your best friend in the city, decided to have your family investigated without telling you. In the back, Bryce said. Come in. I stepped in through the door, and Bryce shut it behind me. As soon as the door clicked closed, I heard the purifiers kick in, sucking the haze out and leaving the inside air refreshed. I pulled off the mask and hung up my coat. The inside of Bryce's house was like the perfect family home, Warm lights glowed along their wall strips, while the smell of cooking food, food infinitely better than anything I made in my apartment, floated through the vents. The kids had run away from the door and were back in the living room, off to my left, fiddling and fighting with the radio. On the walls were paintings and pictures, every professional one matched in size by a drawing from one of Bryce's two kids. Even the earliest ones, the smatterings of paint or sketches with a marker that bore no resemblance to anything. Seeing all of it told me why Bryce didn't have people to his house, why I'd never been inside before. This place was a sanctum, a castle apart from the deadly terrors of his daily life. This is something else, I said. Bryce laughed. It's something you only understand when you have them he said, nodding towards the kids. It looks like a lot of work. Think of all the free art, Bryce said, and it's refreshing to hear their laughs after a long night in Riven. Bryce led me back behind the stairs, past the kitchen, to a room that had a series of windows and a booth around a table big enough for eight. I looked for a door to close, but there wasn't any. Then Bryce flipped a switch on the wall. All the noise from the kids, from the house, and outside vanished. Dampener, I said. How much did that cost you? It was a gift, Bryce said, from Peter, when I had the kids. Did you know that they're twins? Didn't catch that. Peter said I would need a place to get away. He was right, Bryce said. You wanted to talk? This is where to do it. No one can hear what you say. I met a sneak, I said, and waited for Bryce's reaction. The guide sat back in the booth, but otherwise didn't let anything flicker across his face. She told me about my mother, that you were looking for her. Now Bryce rubbed his chin. I figured this was going to happen sooner or later especially when the sneak disappeared. She didn't. She went looking for me instead. It was a risk that it would get back to you, one I don't regret taking, Bryce said. 
going to have to give me more than that, I replied. How much did she tell you about your mother? I relayed what Anna had mentioned, what I'd found, about her death after giving birth, and the evidence that she still lived in Riven. The only time Bryce showed any expression was at the end, when I mentioned the diary. She was my mentor. Catherine taught me everything, Bryce said, like I taught you. When she died, I didn't understand. It was so sudden, and the doctors had no explanation. Then I found her, in Riven. Catherine wouldn't talk about what happened, but she helped me anyway. For years, we continued working together over there. She would lead me to breaches, or find angry spirits for me to take care of. Until a few years ago. Until you arrived. What do I have anything to do with it? I said. You're asking the wrong person. At first, I thought maybe she'd finally gone over to the cycle. Guides can resist the call for a long time, like Graham. If they have enough reason, they can stay. I thought that reason was you. But she left. That doesn't make sense. Bryce stood up and went behind me to a cabinet in the wall, opened it, and took out a bottle of something dark and spicy, poured a couple of glasses. Catherine did a lot of things without talking to people, Bryce said. Kept a lot of her own secrets. Still, it wasn't like her to just disappear. At the same time, I had you to train. Chicago to run. A family. I didn't have the time to look. I took a long sip of the drink. Felt the whiskey light up my tongue and traced its sweet fire down my throat and into my stomach. If my mother was in there, if she had stayed around this long, then there was a chance I could still find her. After the tower, after the mission, I'm going to have the snake take me back to where she found the diary, I said. You should come with. Bryce nodded. Your mother was a wonderful teacher. If she's still there, I would love the chance to see her again. We spent the rest of the drink talking, Bryce sharing memories of my mother with me. Hunts they went on, and more random details, like what she preferred to drink, where she liked to eat in Chicago. For the first time, my mother began to seem like a real person. Why didn't you tell me all this before? I said as we went back to the front door. Dinner was ready, and I had no right to keep Bryce and his family from their food. Because I was ordered not to. Bryce actually seemed angry. Peter himself told me not to bring it up. Not till you were ready. And that he would decide when that was. You're breaking the rules? I said. Didn't know you had it in you. We already talked about it, remember? Bryce said. I'm retiring. I don't care about the rules anymore. He glanced at a clock ticking away along the wall. Better get going. We're meeting Alec in a couple of hours. My mother. The guide that trained Bryce. I couldn't. No, I could believe it. But what stuck with me, more on the train ride to my apartment, was the idea that she might still be there, waiting for me. One more hunt, mother, I muttered. Then I'm coming for you. Chicago's Finest Riven felt different with a group of guides. A trio like ours made the dark shadows tame, like we could beat anything and anyone. I wanted some angry spirits to come out. Another ghoul, maybe. It would be so easy. Alec led us through the Warrens, towards where Peter's tower stood. We passed guides on the way, groups out filling their quota. Most greeted us with a wave or a short conversation, but their faces 
brought my mood down. Things aren't going well, are they? I said to Bryce. Everyone looks stressed, tired. The war is getting worse. You've been outside of the loop, Bryce said. There was a bit of accusation in that voice, hinting that perhaps chasing after Graham might not be the best use of my time. We're closing breaches almost every day now, and we're finding them later because there's too many. Is anyone trying to talk to the countries? Tell them the risk? That's why Peter's here in Chicago. He's spending all day at the spire trying to pitch our case. That whatever they're fighting over isn't worth it if Riven falls apart. If it does, then their wars won't matter, Alec chimed in. We'll all be dead anyway. Bryce did not look amused. Beyond the Warrens, the large apartments dwindled into smaller bits of buildings. Stores, warehouses, and broad tracts of land covered in containers. Train tracks went through and off to anywhere, nowhere. After thirty more minutes of marching, we could see Riven's wall in the distance, and, rising above it, the tower. At first, I thought it was just another apartment building, a lonely one rising up from a bunch of single-story homes. As we got closer, though, I realized the tower wasn't like the rest of Riven, not an ancient construction of unknown origin. This thing had been built by our hands, or by spirits. From the outside, the tower looked like a hodgepodge of materials, stone stacked on top of stone, but in different shades, with different design. The tower was a product of stolen stuff, a collage of crap pilfered from other buildings and shoved together. If that isn't the ugliest building in Riven, I started. It is, Alec said. My question is, why? Who would build something like this? And for what purpose? I think that's what Peter wants us to find out, Bryce said. At its base, the tower was as wide as a block. Massive. The top was easily a dozen stories high. Thankfully, the door was easy to find. A hole in the mashed-up stone. Like the rest of the tower, the door had been made with crude nails and boards stripped from other homes. Who wants the honors? I asked. I don't suppose we should knock, Alec said. Peter said guides are dying here, Bryce said. We don't need to let them know we're coming. Bryce went by me to the door, and, bulge drawn in his right hand, pulled it open. The door wasn't locked, and the hinges didn't make any noise. The inside, unlike the gray of Riven, was lit with soft yellow fire. We walked into the first room. The fire came from a series of small torches that lined the pool in the middle, a pool filled with more of Riven's strange water. Behind it, climbing up the wall, was a stair. Along the sides of the room were more doors, leading to who knows where. I'm going to admit it, this is not what I expected, I said. Stay quiet, Bryce said. Keep your eyes open. Welcome, 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 a hearty voice exclaimed. Coming down the stairs was an enormous spirit, fat and wearing what looked like a robe made of bedsheets. I'm so happy you came. The master has been waiting for more friends. I glanced at Bryce. Alec did the same. Our leader stared at the fat spirit, his mouth slightly open. Who is your master? Bryce said, recovering. Oh, you'll meet him, the spirit said. Of course, we must be polite. The master so doesn't like the ash in the air. I'm afraid it's all over your clothes. The spirit gestured at us. He wasn't wrong. Any long walk in Riven was going to leave you coated in ashy stuff. If you'll kindly step into this pool and wash yourselves, then we can begin, the spirit said. Wash ourselves? I said. Does your master know where we are? 
Cleanliness isn't exactly a thing here. Carver, Bryce warned. It's quite all right, the spirit interjected. Remember, it is you who chose to come into my master's tower. Therefore, it is you who should abide by his wishes. Where is your master? Alec asked. Can we talk to him? The spirit pointed to the pool. I looked at the water. The clear liquid reflected the flames from the torches, creating blurry shades of yellow and orange along the walls of the room. Guides occasionally drank the non-water, and it didn't seem to have any effect. But I'd just had the salt of it the other night, and it had chilled me to the core. I don't like this, I said. Agreed, Bryce said. He turned to the spirit. We'd like to see your master. We're not going to wash ourselves in the pool. The spirit's bright smile shifted to a deep frown, and he shook his head. I'm sorry. There really is no other way. I bet we can climb up the outside, Alec said. Bryce nodded, and the three of us turned back towards the exit, only to see, standing in front of it, three other spirits, also dressed in robes, armed, not with the usual rocks and sticks that spirits might find, but with swords, long knives in their offhands, guide weapons. Around us, the doors on the floor opened, and more spirits came out. All of them had guide weapons, spears, axes, and more exotic ones, at least a dozen, maybe more. So many, Bryce said. So many guides here. The master has many friends, the large spirit said. He always wants more. Please, wash yourselves. We were outnumbered, and the spirits looked like they knew how to use those weapons. There was a chance we could fight our way out of here, but the odds didn't look good. The pool, I said. That's my vote. You see this, Alec said. These weapons, they came from the guides that died here. We either fight our way out, or we share their fate. We don't have a choice, Bryce said. We'd be slaughtered. We take the chance on the pool. If we die in there, Alec said, I'm going to find both of your spirits and beat them to death again. The three of us went into the pool. I felt the water seeping along my boots, up my legs, and up to my waist. It was cold, so cold. In seconds, I lost all feeling in the lower half of my body. Please wash off your arms and head, the spirit said. Then we'll be ready to go see the master. I glanced at Bryce and Alec, who shrugged. I reached my hands in the water felt my fingers go numb as I cupped some of the stuff, lifted it up to my head, and poured it on. The Tower's Lord It's truly fascinating how we can go back and forth about how you have to be conscious and yet unconscious. We put ourselves in two places at once. We are not truly alive here in Riven, but dying here, we die there. I opened my eyes and saw the gray Riven sky above me. Only there was glass, a skylight, an actual skylight in Riven. I'd never heard of someone being able to make that here, not even Nicholas. I realized my hands were tied. My legs corded onto a board. I could turn my head, saw Bryce to my right and Alec to my left. Only the truly fascinating part happens when you kill a man while he's crossed into Riven. Then you have a true marvel. For he's not a spirit, no, not quite, but no longer a living thing. I couldn't see the speaker, but could tell he was in front of me. I tried to sit up, but could only lift my head forward, 
and not far enough. At first, it seems like this purgatory would be worse than actually dying. You want to go to the cycle. Then you find that perhaps all is not as bad as it seems. You find purpose, even in this place. Bryce? I called. Alec? I'm awake, Bryce said. Who are you? Who am I? The speaker said. That doesn't really matter anymore, does it? My spirits call me master. Before, I had a name then, when names mattered. Who is this guy? I said. I think he's lost it. Oh, I have, the speaker said. There's no denying it, which is why I'm trying to get it back, trying to find my way out. Graham? I didn't think that's who it was, but I couldn't help but try. Don't talk of him, the speaker's voice burned. That man has no idea what he's doing. He's reckless, arrogant. I prefer a more methodical approach. Barth? Bryce said. Is that you? Barth, the speaker said. I suppose that may have been once. I suppose that it may be again. No, no, will be again. That's right. Concentrate. I thought you died years ago, Bryce said. Our heads were still strapped down. I watched Bryce stare at the ceiling and talk to the man. The speaker scurried into view. A hunched-over, lanky figure wearing the same robes as the spirits. Pale and ghostly. He leaned over Bryce. Time is measured in moments here, Barth said. Death is not the release some prefer to believe. For some, it is a trap. A trap that they have to find their own way out of. What are you talking about? Bryce asked. Let us go. Oh, I will, Barth said running a finger along Bryce's chest. The way out is just a matter of finding one. Just one is all you need. Barth scuttled out of sight, back to the other side of the room. I heard him messing around with various objects, clattering things against the ground. Bryce continued to ask for release, but Barth didn't bother to answer. Now, here they are. I can't choose, you see. Too hard to know who should go. These can help, Barth said. A moment later, I heard a trio of knocks, small objects bouncing off the floor. When the noise stopped, Barth giggled. Why, look at that. It's number two. What an excellent choice, Barth said. I felt my board lurch, slide along some lever until I was upright, my feet a foot above the floor. Beneath me, looking up at my face with a broken grin, was Barth. On the ground, I saw what had made the choice, what had made the noise. A trio of skulls, two of them resting with their eyes looking up at me, the third on its side. You see? Your friends? They chose you, Barth said. Trapped. When you're tied down, you feel like all you want to do is escape. I wanted to break my arms and legs free and run. Having a trio of skulls at my feet didn't exactly calm me down. Neither did the crazed glint in Barth's eyes. Bryce, I think I might be in trouble here, I said. Stay calm, Bryce said. Look for a way out. A way out, 
with my arms and legs tied? There wasn't an easy option. In front of me, Barth returned to his desk and dug through a pile of random tools. Some knives, a hammer, and a couple of saws, among other smaller knickknacks. I got the distinct feeling that any and perhaps all of them would be used on me. I touched my fingers to the board. Wood, but frail. Thin. If I pressed against it, maybe I'd have a chance. I tried to clench my fists and hit them against the board. They bounced off. I couldn't get enough force. Barth, meanwhile, hummed a tune. One I recognized. A song from twenty years ago, but that still played on radios today. Barth hummed the simple jingle while he straightened his murderous tools. Lean forward, Alex said from my right. I can see the lever holding you. It's not very strong. You can throw it off. Okay, another thing to try. I lunged my head forward, tried to pull my body with it. The board groaned, but didn't shift. Again, Alex said. Barth seemed oblivious, laying out the tools to the side. So far, two knives and that little hammer. Was not looking forward to whatever he was going to do with those. I went forward again. This time, I heard a crack, the board starting to give way at the back. Barth heard it too. The strange man turned to me, his eyes blazing. So you like to play with things that are not yours. Break my toys. That is not very nice. New friends should be respectful. I'm definitely not your friend, I said. Not yet, maybe, Barth said, grabbing a long, thin knife and coming towards me. Soon you will be. As Barth reached towards me with the knife, I went forward again. This time the board snapped free, and I fell ahead, smashed myself into Barth as he came close, and knocked us both to the ground. My forehead hit his, and the world jerked for a moment. The ropes holding my arms and legs kept me from catching myself, so as I rolled off Barth, my face smashed into the floor. Not my best move, but at least I was free from the lever. Barth was muttering some incomprehensible nonsense as he pushed himself away from me. I reached for the knife, my hand still tied, but without the lever holding me in place, I was able to slither myself across the floor, shove with my toes and my hands towards the blade that Barth dropped. The madman seemed too distracted to notice. My left hand closed around the hilt of the blade when I heard a scraping noise. I couldn't look up, couldn't see what Barth was doing, but that sound probably meant pain was fast approaching. With my left hand, I spun the blade around, twisting the hilt through my fingers to bring the edge to rest against the cords. Now it was a matter of getting a strong enough grip to actually cut them. Carver, roll right, Bryce said. I didn't think, kicked off the floor with my toes and tried to shift the board. I felt the wood hit something soft, and Barth squealed in pain. I heard him fall to the ground, another clatter as he dropped whatever tool he'd picked up from the table. I adjusted my left hand again, trying to get a solid grip. I finally had it between two pairs of fingers and worked the knife up and down. The cords were thick, and I didn't have much pressure. Or time. Help me out, I said. What's he doing? Friends shouldn't talk out of turn, Barth replied. Not who I was hoping to hear from. I can't see enough, Bryce said. He's got the hammer, Alec called. Then I felt the impact. Barth had jumped on my back, on the board, pressed me into the ground. He hit the board behind my head with a hammer, pressing my face into the stone, grinding my jaw into the rock. The weight also pressed down on the blade in my hand, pushed it against the cords, and let it cut faster. A couple of seconds later, and I felt the sting as the knife cut through the cords and into my own wrist. I focused, leaned hard on my right side as Barth continued to pound with the hammer. 
Aline gave my freed left hand just enough space to plant my palm against the ground. I pushed. Barth was a small man, and when I shoved the board over, he flew off and rolled across the ground. I grabbed the blade again and, with my free wrist, cut my legs and right hand loose. Stood up from the board in time to see Barth swinging the hammer at my face. I got my right hand up, caught Barth's wrist before he could bring the hammer down, and then ripped the hammer away from him. Didn't your mother ever teach you to play nice? I said, brandishing both weapons. Barth shrank away, dancing back behind his desk. New friends are nasty, not very nice at all. If they don't want to see the way out, then they will stay here, in the dark. The man gave a blood-curdling shriek, and I heard pounding on the stairs. The tower shook as Barth's spirits responded to their master's call. This place was about to get really, really crowded. Trick Play I threw the hammer into Barth's face, smashing his nose and knocking out his scream. He collapsed behind the desk. I went to Alec, who was a few steps closer than Bryce, slashed his left hand free. Behind you, Bryce called. I let go of the knife and spun around. The fat spirit that had greeted us stood at the top of the stairs, wielding a familiar lash. The friendly face he'd worn was gone, replaced by malevolent insanity. With his eyes wide and mouth gibbering nonsense, the spirit attacked, snapped the lash at my face. If there was one thing I knew, it was how to get around my own weapon. I dove beneath the crack as the spirit attacked, tucked into a roll and somersaulted into the spirit's ankles, like knocking down a building. The spirit tumbled back and fell at the head of the stairs. I heard outraged cries as other spirits tried to shove past the new blockade. I saw Alec, having freed himself, stand over Bryce and cut him loose. I grabbed the arm holding my lash, tried to tear it free, but the spirit was strong, shoved me away, and stood up as we wrestled, used his bulk to push me into the desk. The stone edge pressed into my back as the spirit bent me over. A little help here, I called. There are too many, I heard Bryce's voice, strained. Spirits were running up into the room now. In a moment, we would face the same overwhelming odds as the bottom of the tower, be killed in the same fashion as we would have then. With my left hand grappling for the lash, my eyes staring into the blue-black void of the spirit's pupils, I scrabbled around the desk with my right. As my back exploded with pain, my spine rubbing into the stone, my right hand landed on something it could grab. I shoved it into the spirit's face. A saw blade was quite a bit less effective when used as a knife, but even glancing off the spirit's mouth, the attack bought me some surprise. The spirit leaned back slightly, gave me just enough room to slip out from under him. I wanted space, a chance to figure out some plan of attack. Bad idea. The spirit snapped my lash again, and this time I couldn't move fast enough. The lash wrapped around my legs and threw me to the floor. I felt the point scrape around my knee, but ignored it. Had to ignore it. The spirit was coming right at me with his left fist raised, which would hurt a lot more than the lash. As I raised my right hand in a pathetic defense, I noticed something. I still held the saw. The spirit punched down towards me, and I twisted the saw blade up to meet his fist. The spirit punched into the tines and howled, jerked his hand back and took the saw with it. With my left hand, I grabbed the lash's cord still wrapped around my leg, and pulled it free. The spirit didn't notice, was more focused on the saw sticking out of its hand. Understandably. I stood up as the spirit yanked the saw free. As he looked towards me, I struck out with a lash and took him down, wrapped my weapon around his neck, and purified him with wrangling fire. The spirit collapsed, and I took a breath. On the right... 
Rice and Alec were faring better. They'd managed to trap most of the spirits on the stairs. Kept the fighting to where the two of them, armed with a knife I'd handed Alec and a strange curving sword that Bryce must have picked up from another spirit, could limit the number of enemies at once. Get to Barth, Bryce yelled. We can't hold them forever. I nodded out of reflex. Bryce definitely wasn't watching me. Turned behind the desk to see where Barth had fallen. Only to find he wasn't there. A new door, however, was. A section of the wall behind the desk was open. A dark path that required crouching to get through. There were no torches along the walls. No light whatsoever, except, in the distance, a gray glow. Coming from that glow was Barth's babbling voice. I stepped along the tunnel, moving slow in case of any sort of strange trap or ambush. Normally in Riven, I wouldn't have suspected anything. Spirits weren't the type to lie in wait. Only this one, Barth, seemed to play those kinds of games. At the end of the hall, I stood up into what looked like a bedroom, a flat mattress on a stone floor, scattered papers, some bound together, ashy wood sticks piled in an urn. Going by what I could see on the paper, Barth was using the ash to write with. I am so close, so close to finding the way. You cannot abandon me now. I need more chances. Barth was pleading out loud to the air. But to what? To who? I stayed still as Barth shook his head, as though receiving some sort of an answer. I know you said this was the last group, but there are always more. I am so close. Barth continued to whine. Graham is a monster. He will turn on you. Not I, your loyal friend. Who are you talking to? I said. Bryce and Alec were fighting for their lives out there. I couldn't sit here listening to Barth babble to nobody. Barth turned slowly, like a person waking from a long nap. Glared at me. You were supposed to be my key. Now I have nothing. He has abandoned me. Good for him, I said. Call the spirits off or I end you. Now. I held out my lash, making it very clear exactly what would happen if Barth didn't follow my instructions. To my surprise, Barth opened his mouth and spoke in that frequency only spirits could hear. A moment later, the man gave me a sideways nod. What you want, it is done. My friends have retired back to their quarters. Speaking of friends, I said, let's go back. You're going to tell us everything. Outnumbered. Back in Barth's experimental chamber, I found Bryce and Alec leaning against the desk. Both had nasty gashes, cuts, and bruises from fighting with the spirits, but at least those enemies had disappeared. The spirit I'd wrangled had already walked off on his journey to the cycle. That was your doing, yes? Alec said, looking at me. How did you make them go away? I made Barth a compelling offer. Your lives for his, I said. Barth, Bryce said, turning to look at the man. What happened to you? I heard you were killed. Years ago. Barth shifted his eyes between us, giggling to himself. He wrung his hands. Can he still talk, or has he lost all of himself? Alec said. I didn't touch him, I said. He can talk. I've been here for so long. Barth blurted, yet no one knows how to tell the time. So long and always working, always trying. What were you trying to do? Bryce asked. He told me to find a way back, that we would need one, that he would need one. So I searched, 
searched for so long, Barth continued. This place, there are doors that can be opened, can be walked through, if you know where they are. He's not talking about the tower, is he? Alex said. Sounds like Graham, I said, talking about getting out of Riven. Barth's eyes lit up at the word. He became even more excited, swaying now as he spoke. Yes, Riven, that's where we are. That's where we don't belong. I was trying to find a way to open the door. And the spirits? Bryce asked. Guides, Barth replied. One of them might be the key. Open the passage back. You sleep and you come over here. You are a door. I was trying to open it. How many guides did you kill? Bryce's voice changing to a darker mood. So many, so many over the years that cannot be counted, Barth said, and then his face dropped. He stared at the ground. Now it is over. He is letting me go. Who is letting you go? I asked. Is that who you were talking to back there? Barth shook his head. My master does not let me see his face or know his name. I must do as he commands until he releases me from his service. It sounds like he's released you already, Alex said. Barth cackled. We shrank away from the man. There was something crazy going in his eyes. Released? Yes, after one more task. The tower started to shake. A growing boom echoed up from below. I grabbed onto the desk to steady myself, while Alex and Bryce leaned against the wall. Chunks of stone fell from the ceiling, shaken loose. Cracks appeared in the skylight. I have failed, my master said. Failures must be buried with their friends, Barth muttered. I say we leave, I said. Seconded, Alec added. The three of us made quick steps to the stairs. Bryce and Alec started down, and I took one look back at Barth, waving for him to come with, but he ignored us, simply stared up at the skylight as it shattered, tears running down his grinning face. I flew down the stairs after Bryce and Alec. My feet barely touched the steps as they swayed back and forth with the tower. There didn't seem to be other floors, just a long spiral down to where we saw the glowing pool and the torches. Falling rocks splashed by as we tried to make our way along the sides. When we passed by a stone-carved window, I looked out, glanced down to try and see what was happening. Wrapped around the base of the tower were the spirits, hacking and bashing and tearing apart the base, using guide weapons to shatter stone and destroy the foundation. A normal person with normal energy might have found the process impossible, but the tower was rickety from the start, and the spirits were tireless. They swung with every ounce of might they had every single time. The tower began its final collapse. I felt it from the window, the walls weaving in, and the steps starting to pull away. I grabbed the outside, reached to the window frame, and pulled myself through, pressed my legs on the frame of the falling rock as stone and glass shredded my back, jumped into the gray haze. Binding I didn't see the roof that I landed on, but I felt it. My shoulders slammed into the hard stone, and I felt a pop, but aside from that searing pain, I rolled to a stop, alive. Used my right hand, the shoulder that still worked, to push myself upright. I was on a small house with a pointed roof. The slant probably saved my life. I looked at the tower, or where it had been, and figured I'd fallen ten to twenty feet. 
Now the tower was a pile of rubble and broken boards. Around it stood the circle of spirits, at least 15, the destroyers of their own home. They stared around, lost with their former master buried in that pile. Somewhere in there, too, were Alec and Bryce. I crawled to the edge of the roof, hung down, and dropped the remaining eight feet. Managed to keep my balance and made it to the ground. I went over to the rubble and looked at it. Tons of rock and broken wood. Twisted beams and crumbled mortar. No way I was going to clear it all by myself. There was another option, if I could pull together the energy. The spirits all around the tower were familiar. They wore guide coats and clothes, and most still held weapons made for guides, ones that could, with a twist or a tap, produce that pale blue fire. From what Barth had said, it wasn't hard to make the connection. All of these spirits that he'd bound, every last one of them, had been an experiment gone wrong, an attempt to find the door back to the real world. Every time it failed, Barth bound the guide into service. The one closest to me was an older woman, bearing a pair of lethal-looking pickaxes. At least, I assumed that's what they were, short handles with pointed heads on them. She stared at me as I walked up. You were a guide once, I said, making things up as I went along. Now I'm giving you a chance to help your friends, to do one last thing for who you were. The woman tilted her head, stared at me, her eyes blank. I'd never tried to bind a spirit that had already been bound, but nobody had told me it couldn't be done. I reached out with my right hand and grabbed hers, which still held the pick. Help us save them, I said. I focused on the touch, the feel of the woman's hand on mine. The spirit's skin was cool, but I fought past that. It was like tracing a point of pain, a pinprick or a bug bite somewhere on your body. Only here, I was looking for a way into hers, a spot where my life could bleed into the shadow of her own. When I found it, I took a breath and gripped her hand tight. It felt like a rush of blood to my face. Who and what I was, a living person crossed into Riven, flowed through that pinpoint into the spirit and tied her to me. A moment later, her eyes lost their blank look, and her face fell into a smile. My name is Teresa, the spirit said. I was a guide once. I know, and now I need you to save two more, I said, pointed to the rubble. I need you to dig them out. Find Bryce and Alec under there. Teresa nodded, let go of my hand, and started to dig. Hauled one block after the next off of the pile. I went to the next spirit, and the next, and the next. Bound them, one after another. Each one took a bit of myself with it, and by the tenth spirit, I was struggling to the next one. Limping and pale, gulping Riven's non-air with heavy breaths. The rubble was clearing. The spirits were tireless, shifting off the tower and its garbage, diving underneath and hunting for any sign of Bryce or Alec. After I bound the eleventh, I collapsed onto the ground and watched. My left shoulder ached, and the rest of my body didn't want to move. It wasn't tired, so much as dead. There simply wasn't enough of me to do anything other than keep me awake. Barth must have been incredible at this, to bind so many spirits. Years of practice. Or maybe the cost of keeping a spirit went down over time. Or maybe that's what drove him insane. Losing so much of himself for so long. One of the spirits gave a shout, and then, with another's help, pulled Alec's body from the rubble. He was wet, soaking. He must have dove into the pool as a way to save himself. Alec, I said, as the spirits carried the guide over to me. He didn't respond. I didn't really expect him to. Lay him down. Press the water from his lungs. 
The two spirits did as I asked, and began compressing his chest. There was a chance that his bones were broken, but I didn't think that would matter if the man was already drowning. Two presses in, and Alex started to cough. Spat up water everywhere. But he was alive. Another shout came up, and soon Bryce was lying next to Alec, his body more battered, also soaked from the pool. The water that had captured us at the start had served to save our lives. Both of the guides were broken, lying there unconscious, but alive. I had to get them back. Had to get me back. Thankfully, I had plenty of help. The Lost Ones I braced myself, but it didn't matter. I still let out a yelp when Bryce shoved my left shoulder back into its socket. We stood beneath the clock tower, surrounded by the spirits I'd bound. They all had the glazed look of the lost in their eyes. I'd released them, one by one, when I took hold of their hands, and, like soaking up the warmth from a fire, drew my own life back. After all the hits you have taken, Alec said, leaning against the wall next to the door inside, this isn't too bad, no? Pain is pain, I said. It hurts. I don't like your decision, Bryce said to me. You should be crossing with us. Recover, and then come back tomorrow night. I shook my head. I have to go. I don't know whether it will last until tomorrow. I knew what I said sounded dumb, and Bryce's arched eyebrow didn't do anything to calm that feeling. Except I couldn't tell him about Selena. Couldn't say that I needed to go after her, find her, and either bring her back or protect her from the dark spirit I'd seen in the vision. Retiring or no, I didn't think Bryce would be a big fan of our guide spirit romance. Let him go, Alex said. Sometimes a man must be by himself. Find his own way. Trust me, self-discovery has nothing to do with it, I replied. Then be careful. You have your sparker? Bryce asked. I nodded. Somewhat incredibly, the spirits had been armed with our weapons, had worn our guide belts. I'd only noticed when we got back to the clock tower, but it made sense. Might as well arm your spirits with the best weapons available. Having bound them, they didn't reject my request to return our stuff. I'm going to find Peter and tell him about what we saw, Bryce said. Tell him about Barth. He might have an idea of who Barth was talking to. I'll meet you at Ezra's when I'm done here, I said. Don't go getting yourself into much trouble, Alex said. We won't be running around to save you. Stay away from Graham, Bryce warned. When we're ready, we'll take him together. The two guides went back to the clock tower and crossed over. I started the long walk south. I tried to remember from my vision where Selena had been going, and I thought I recognized the park. On the far edge of the Warrens, back towards Barth's tower, but then curling further south than west. I was tired. Despite Bryce's first aid efforts, Pain poured in from everywhere. By this point, though, that was starting to be the usual state of affairs. Every step, every twitch, another opportunity for my body to remind me that it was not happy. The walk gave me a bit of time to reflect. Barth and Graham both seemed to have the same master, someone that had power over them, either through binding or other leverage. The way Barth had been talking... It seemed like this had been going on for a long time. Years. They all wanted a way out of Riven, which meant that this master, whomever he was, was probably already here. The only other option, the only people that could bind spirits to their control, were guides. To bind a spirit for years and exert that level of control? To command Barth to trap and murder his friends? to force Graham, that deadly force, to do his bidding? Whomever this master was, I wasn't looking forward to meeting him, if I lived long enough to do it. After an hour, I reached the park, 
at the very edge of the Warrens. On the south side, the big apartment buildings disappeared into the parks, which bled into what we called the shambles. By far the worst part of the city, at least in terms of what was left. Crumbling, half-built homes, buildings collapsed against each other, streets that weren't paved, but were only chunks of rock that wound around remnants. If there was a war zone in Riven, this place was it. It was also the fastest way to the wall. Once you got around the wall, you could leave. Once you made it outside, though I'd never been, it was supposed to be a straight shot to the cycle. So, as I walked into the shambles, I saw plenty of spirits, some bearing the blank-eyed look of lost ones heading to the cycle on their own. Others, the mute march of a wrangled soul, ones that had met the wrong end of a guide's weapon and were now on a straight path to destiny. Here, though, was the end of my vision. Behind me stood the tree that I'd seen when I was half dead. Where I stood now, smashing down some white threads of grass, was where Selina had walked, where the dark thing following her had passed. Tracking For the first time, I wished I had a sneak with me. If Anna had been there, I'm sure she would have had some idea for how to find Selina. Part of me wanted to turn back right then, cross over, give tonight up as a first attempt, and then come back later with Anna. But the bigger part of me realized that Riven was getting worse. If someone like Barth was out here hunting and killing guides, and Graham was doing the same, how much time did I really have before one of them caught up with me? So instead, I tried something new. The first street that I walked down was crowded. Plenty of spirits bustling out of the city, but a few stood around, watching the procession. Those were the ones I was looking for, the ones with a little bit of themselves left, the ones that could hold a conversation. I went up to a woman who, sitting on a listing bench, looked like she was counting the spirits walking by. Her mouth moved silently, as her eyes tracked each and every one. You still here? I asked, coming up beside her. Depends on what you mean by here, the woman said, turning to look at me. I'm not so sure where here is. You ever hear of Riven? Because spirits came from people dying anywhere, there was no guarantee that they knew that Riven existed. Many had no idea what had happened only that they were somewhere else and didn't feel normal. I'd found the spirits who understood were easier to deal with, less prone to panic. I have no idea what that is, the woman said. If you're asking if I know that I'm no longer alive, I think that's rather obvious. That's something anyway, I said. Can I ask you a question? I tried to be polite with spirits especially when I was just getting started. It's hard to know what could trip a spirit off, send them into a rage. With the streets crowded, the last thing I wanted was a fight that would attract attention, or even bring other spirits to the brink of anger. You've already made me lose count. Well over 9,000 in the last four days, the woman said. So I suppose you can ask, yes? I didn't flinch at the number, who knew how many people all across the world went through Riven? How many were sent on by guides? How many more naturally went to the cycle? Nine thousand? Just on this street? Who knew if that was a lot or a little? Have you seen a woman with a moonlight dress? Her hair is auburn, down below her shoulders. She has a scar on her face, I said. The woman shook her head. I'm only counting. I don't recall anyone like that. Before I could say anything else, she turned back to the street and started again, at one. She'd probably continue like that, counting onward and upward until the cycle finally took hold of her. Still, as Riven existence went, that was one of the better spirits I'd seen. The next one was a young man in soldier's fatigues. Surprising that he looked so normal standing there in the middle of the street, playing games with the spirits as they walked by. On one, he pulled down a pair of trousers. 
on another, he tussled their hair. None of the spirits cared. They moved on, without reaction. Having fun? I said to him. Fun, the man said. There's nothing else to do. I'm waiting for something to happen. Waiting for one of them to have a reaction, to come at me. Anything to feel even a little bit alive. They tend to respond to aggression, I said. But you can't really hurt each other. You'll just wind up losing what's left of your mind. The thing is, the man said, I thought I lost it when the artillery fired. Then I woke up here, and all my mates were gone. Wandered around this place for three days, and then found this line of people. Figure I'll just keep going with them, but it gets boring walking all the time, you know? Have you seen this one? I described Selena. The man shook his head. Only got here a few hours ago, the spirit said. Can't help you there. I've seen her, came a crusty voice from behind us. A head poking out of a window on a building that looked like it once held a store, but was now a crumbling pile of broken boards and brick. She passed here yesterday, looked awful scared for a spirit. Do you know where she went? I asked. I would have felt better if the spirit came out of the building, rather than hiding behind a window, but I wasn't in a position to choose. I followed her, the voice said. I know where she went. I can show you, if you give me that knife of yours. Striking deals with spirits. Another one of those things guides weren't supposed to do. Except there's one thing the spirit didn't know, and that's the fact that I could end it at any point wrangle and clean up what remained of his sanity, and send him on a quick trip to the cycle. I'll give you the knife if you take me to her, I replied. The crusty voice made its way out of the building. I did a double take. The spirit wasn't an elder, but a gentleman in his thirties, maybe even younger. Only he leaned over and walked with a broken bit of board that served as a cane. I would have said it didn't make any sense, except spirits came to Riven in their own best image, came with what was left of their minds and what they happened to recall. If the spirit was so used to hunching over, so used to having a cane and talking with a voice ground to gravel by age, then that was what he became. We left the pranking young man behind, and the spirit with the cane led me deeper into the shambles. Off of the main path, and through winding alleys bordered by buildings in various states of collapse. You're a guide, aren't you? The spirit said. Good guess, I replied. Wasn't a guess. The only ones who come after spirits and Riven are you guides. I felt something at the end of that sentence, like a lingering question, a phrase left hanging in the air, as though the spirit wanted me to ask for more. So I did. Why do you say that? Because I don't think you're after the spirit. I think you're after the guide following her, the man said. The guide following her? A real nasty piece of work, the spirit said. Not one that I'd like to meet when I go to the other side. The other side. Not many people called it that. Guides didn't have the patience for it. If you're angry, you're angry. There weren't sides to cross. There weren't emotions and feelings to protect. In Riven, it happened to every spirit at some point, and that's all there was to it. We came to a split in the alley, three branches heading off in different directions. In front of us was a larger home, two stories, and still mostly put together. In fact, as I looked at it more closely, the building looked clean maintained, and repaired. The spirit you want is in there, the man said. Now, about our deal, the knife. Why? I asked. What do you want with it? The man shook a little, closed his eyes for a moment. Some days are better than others, but I feel it coming on. The call is growing. When I lose it, when I lose who I am, 
I want to be able to end it. You won't be able to, I said. I'd heard that before, too. Spirits that knew where they were, knew what was coming. Wanted a way to wrangle themselves, erase who they were as they fell into an angry mess. You've got two choices. Give in and go to the cycle now, or hold out, lose yourself, and then a guide will find you and set you on your way. I said, give me the knife, the spirit argued. That was our deal. I reached under my belt and grabbed a knife with my left hand, held it in front of me. The spirit turned and reached for it, his eyes bright. I twisted the hilt, sent the blue fire down the blade, and stabbed it into the man before he could react. I could see his eyes go wide as the fire rushed up and down his body. You wanted to be free, I said. Now you are. I sheathed the knife as the spirit, walking straight and leaving the cane on the ground, started his journey to the cycle. I started mine into the house. Family Found For the first time in Riven, I encountered a locked door. When I twisted the handle and tried to pull the door open at the back of the house in the shambles, it didn't move. Beneath the handle was a keyhole. It was new, shiny, and unlike anything else that I'd seen in Riven, at least anything outside of a guide base. Whomever lived here had resources, knowledge, and perhaps most importantly, the will to make a home in this world. So I set out to destroy it. First, I tested the door by force, pushing against it and getting nowhere. I didn't want to do a shoulder charge, given the sorry shape of my left arm, still aching from my jump out of Barth's tower. I could lead with my right, but if I hurt that arm, I'd be useless. I gave the door a kick and got nowhere, except I heard a noise coming from inside the house. Muffled. I leaned close to the door, stuck my ear against the wood, and listened. Is there someone out there? The voice barely came through, like a blunted whisper. I recognized the pitch. Selena. I took a look around. The alleys dividing the house from the other buildings were wide enough to make scaling up a different structure and jumping onto the house a risky move. I went around to the front and found what had been a second door, but it had been bricked over. There were three windows, all on the second story. Others on the first floor were sealed in like the front door. Whomever lived here wanted this place as a fortress, not a home. I took out my lash and tied the end of it around the back door's handle, walked back as far as I could until the lash was tight. I pulled it across my chest, gripped the lash hilt with both hands, and tugged. I couldn't keep my grasp. I felt the door start to give, but as it moved, the lash slipped out of my burning hands. I needed a better grip. The answer was right in front of me, in the street. The cane left by the other spirit. A lever I could use to increase the pressure. I took my lash handle and some of the slack in the line and tied the end of the lash around the cane. Then, holding the cane in my hands, I pushed put all my weight into it. Behind me, the door groaned, and I heard the crackle of wood giving way, splintering under more pressure than it could handle. With a crackling roar, the door fell free to the ground. I ate a mouthful of dirt as the sudden loss of resistance shot me into the alley and sprawled me along the stones. But what were a few more scratches at this point? Selena? I called as I went in the house. Are you up there? The inside, or at least the part where I entered, was immaculate. The walls, while still bare stone, were clean. Any cracks had been patched over, broken blocks replaced. The floor was smooth stone, like a modern house back in Chicago, before any wood was laid down. Ahead of me, on the ground floor, was a dark room. Without any windows, 
The only light that came in was from the door that I'd just torn open. The room looked empty. Carver? Selena replied. I'm up here. To my left was a set of stairs leading up. Stone steps with boards placed over the top to make for easier footfalls. Also, when I stepped on the first one, it creaked. A good way to detect an intruder. I made my way up and walked into the strangest room I had ever seen. The entire second story was a single large chamber. It may not have always been so, but now the whole place was patterned over with boards along the ground. Windows let in gray light, illuminating a series of rudimentary wooden tables covered with tools, weapons, and books. And, tied to one of them, Selena, in the same dress she'd worn in my vision. Only instead of one scar on her face, Selena looked like she'd taken the brunt of a hundred blows. What happened? I said, coming over and cutting her free. Who's doing this to you? Carver. Selena hugged herself and glanced around. Carver, it's your mother. Dear Diary, I should have been more surprised. My mother? The dark spirit following Selena? The comments sank in and washed off me. Perhaps I'd seen something of myself in the spirit's eyes when she had turned back, hazy and distant, in my half-dead vision. Where is she? I asked. She comes and goes, Selena replied. I don't know where she is now. All she talks about is Graham and you. Me? That's why she took me, Selena said, glancing down. She wanted to know everything about you, what you're like, your hobbies, all of it. She beat you up for that? No, she hurt me because Graham told her to. Selena went over to one of the tables, covered in books. I think he has some power over her. Controls her like the other spirits. Except not everything. Sometimes she even says she's sorry. I followed her, looked down at the books. They weren't the kinds that I saw back in Chicago. More like binders with papers shoved between the covers. Cheap organization. Selena opened one, and we looked at the first page. Unlike Barth, my mother had access to pencils. Actual writing tools. Stolen from a guide base, most likely. I see her writing in these all the time, Selena said. I think it's her diary. I hear her repeat things to herself, like she's trying to remember. Don't you want to leave? I said. Get away? Remember when we talked about family? When I told you about mine? This is your chance to find yours. Selena pointed to the first sheet of paper, the first entry, dated just a few days after I was born. June 21st, 1890. At least, that is what I think the day is. Hard to tell in Riven. If that is correct, then I was murdered three days ago. Killed because I chose to love the wrong person. Bryce, though, is still here. Still helping me set up this place. He's agreed, if I start to fall apart, to bind me. June 22nd, 1890. We've made the plans. Bryce agreed to keep an eye on my son, Carver, who is still alive. I'm not sure why, but at least I will know his life, if only secondhand. It gives me some hope in this ruined world. I looked up from the table. Bryce had a hand in everything. Even though I'd bounced around from guide to guide as a child, even moving around the country, it had always been Bryce showing up to take me from one place to the next. He hadn't been doing it out of charity. He'd been doing it for my mother. Who killed her? Selena wondered aloud, continuing to flip through the pages. I can't find where she says. She might not know, I said. The hospital said she died in her sleep. 
Here, look at this one. Selena pointed to another entry, farther along. October 10th, 1896. We met again today. He says he's still holding on, but I'm not so sure. I don't know how he can survive so long without being bound. Bryce cautions me against the meetings, but he can't understand. I suppose Bryce could use the binding, could compel me not to. I don't know that he has the courage. Who is the he, she mentions? Selina asked. I don't know, I said. She might name him in an earlier entry. Bryce had bound my mother, kept her alive and riven all this time. He told me that she disappeared when I started coming in. Had Bryce released her then? December 25th, 1900. Carver continues to grow. Bryce tells me that my son has crossed over, that he's already approved for training. At once I am filled with joy at the idea of seeing my son and filled with fear that the guides understand what he is. Even Bryce doesn't know. The risks are so great. If we had the time to read all of these, Selina said, instead of flipping through. Go to the end, I said. The last ones. Selina nodded, and we moved down the table to the last set of pages. These hadn't yet found their home between covers. Unlike the first entries, the writing here was fractured. Ideas didn't seem fully formed, and the handwriting skipped around. Jagged edges to rounded letters, words written over others. April 6th, 1917. The spirits say our country has entered the war. Bryce tells me that Carver is doing well. I fear Graham is stronger. I need to find him. The next few entries rambled, lacked cohesion. Bryce must have released her at some point, I said, and Selina nodded. But why? I think your mother is the only person that can answer that, Selina said. June 3rd, 1917. I saw Carver today. If Graham comes for him now, my son will not survive. Perhaps, though, I can find an opening. Graham is distracted, extended. All it would take is a single strike to end all of this. Two days ago, my mother had been watching me. From where? We both heard it the creak of the stairs. I put myself in front of Selina and drew my lash and knife. If it was my mother, there was no telling what she would do, and I would be ready. The spirit walked up the stairs without hurry, taking each step and, at the top, turning to look at me, just like the spirit had in my half-dead vision. Her wild hair bled down into the bands covering the rest of her body, the same spirit I'd seen at Nicholas's lab, the same one who'd stopped the fight as soon as Anna called my name. Carver, the spirit said, staring me straight in the eyes. You shouldn't have come. Release. Sorry, I didn't see a sign, I said to the spirit. You should really warn people to keep out. The spirit cocked her head at me. Also, I said, nodding back at Selina, I wasn't leaving her. Didn't she leave you? The spirit said. That's what she told me. That cemented it. The banded spirit in front of me, baton showing on her back, was the spirit that had interrogated Selina. Was my mother. She had her reasons, I said. I'm here for mine. The spirit moved closer, shifted so that nothing stood between the two of us. Selina stepped back towards a corner of the room, getting out of the way. I wondered for 27 years if this day would ever come, my mother said. Some of those days, I wanted nothing more than to see you. 
to tell you of this world and the one you live in, to share the same love my own mother shared with me. Other days, I wanted to destroy you and the threat you present to everything. People keep saying that, I said. Nobody tells me why. Because of who you are, Carver, my mother said. The product of love between a spirit and a living person. Now I was confused. I was born in a hospital, not in Riven. My mother reached over her shoulders and drew out her batons. The motion was slow, deliberate. I saw her eyes close briefly as she readied herself. Your father died before he should have, my mother said. I think you know that love does not end with death. Her eyes slipped past me to Selena. Yes, I knew what she meant. So what does that mean? My mother didn't give me a clue, didn't give me a hint, just rushed me, both batons swinging up over her left shoulder in a twin strike towards my face. I sidestepped, flicking the lash around the leg of one of the tables and pulling, sliding the table into my mother's side and sending her rolling across the floor. Catherine Reed caught herself on the wall. It means you're a key, Carver, my mother said, that with you, they can create a breach that goes both ways, from Riven to the real world and back, which is what Graham kept talking about. My eyes flicked to Selena, who didn't look surprised. Graham had told her. That's why she'd led me to him in the first place. A chance at getting back home. Barth was probably looking for the same thing, only without the precision. Kill enough guides, and he might get lucky. My mother pressed off of the wall in a running start, jumped onto the nearest table, scattering her own diaries, and sprang towards me. I tried to lash again, hooking another table and twisting it on its side like a wall. But Catherine was too fast. She skipped over the top of it and tackled me. I hit the floor and tried to roll, tried to get my coat between the batons and me, protect my face. She struck my left side first, the small hooks on the end of the batons tearing through the fabric. I dropped the knife and grabbed her right hand mid-swing. She raised the left, this time aiming right at my eyes. You're going to kill your son? I said, and my mother hesitated. Then I threw her off of me, rolled the opposite way, and scrambled to my feet. I don't want to, my mother said, straightening. Graham doesn't want that. Who cares what Graham wants? I replied. I must, my mother said. She broke into another run, but this time whipped a baton towards my face. I brought up my left hand and blocked it, the impact numbing my left arm, but it freed up my right hand to strike with the lash. I caught her legs, wrapping around her knees, and bringing my mother crashing to the floor. She hit hard, her arms not ready to catch herself, and groaned. Sorry, I said, and meant it. The point on the end of the lash was in my mother's ankle. If I twisted the grip, I could send the wrangling fire into and over her, cleanse her clean. But that might mean losing answers. What does Graham have on you? I am bound to him, my mother said. I thought Bryce bound you. For a time, my mother said. She struggled against the lash, but I placed my foot on her back, pressed her down. It didn't feel good, but I figured it was a better option than letting the fight get back on. Until Graham broke it. He broke it? My mother, trapped against the floor, still managed to nod at the batons. If she used them on herself, the fire could cleanse, could break a bond. It frayed me. I shouldn't have tried to take Graham alone. That was after we found you in Nicholas's lab? I was following Graham and saw you, my mother said. I hadn't seen you since you were in my arms. I thought you were another of Graham's soldiers. Nothing has made me so happy 
as seeing you that day. You tried to kill me. My mother laughed. I kept my foot on her back. I'm far from perfect, Carver. So you found Graham? Eventually. My mother sighed. We were equals before, Carver. A pair that hunted riven spirits in tandem, bringing down ghouls and worse without a problem. Only Graham has changed. Another mind lends him strength. When we met, I tried and failed to break him free. He bound me. I'm going to release you. Now. Before my mother could object, I twisted the hilt of the lash and sent the fire streaking down the cord. The pale flames crawled over her, burning brighter, without heat, before dying out. I stepped off of the spirit and watched as she rose to her feet, stared at me without emotion or intelligence. She's gone? Selena asked. No, I said. It's more like she doesn't know how to use herself. For the first time in my life, I reached out and took my mother's hands in mine. She looked at our grip as I felt for the pinprick, the point at which I could join my life to hers. And when I found it, I sent a part of me into her. Mother? I said. Catherine? She looked up at me, and, instead of a blank nothing, her face had the hard edge of driving desire. Carver, my mother, bound to me, said. We have to free your father. Revelation Graham. As she said the words, it all fell into place. My father was the one that had died early, fallen ill, and passed before his time. A guide that had crossed over as he faded from life in the real world, and so remained a spirit in Riven. I have so many questions, I said. Only we're running out of time. Out of time, my mother replied. I've already been in Riven too long, I said. I have to cross back. We made quick work of the jaunt back to the apartment, dodged guides when we saw them, but Riven's growing danger served to keep us hidden. Nobody searched for spirits anymore, not when breaches were right in front of you. I left my mother in Selena and Nicholas's apartment, where they promised to stay until the next night. Exhausted and sore, I went back to the clock tower and crossed over. It was late morning in Chicago. I'd been in Riven for a long time, nearly 12 hours. My body back home felt refreshed, but sluggish. I ignored the stack of mail, went to the train, and downtown to Ezra's. Assembly I caught Alec on the sidewalk outside of Ezra's, on his way to somewhere else. He didn't look thrilled, but brightened when he saw me. Ah, the brave one. Good to see you're still alive, Alec said. Tried my best, but I'm still here, I replied. Bryce in there? Bryce is in shock, I think. Peter thanked us for Barth, then said the guides didn't have the men or the time to investigate another crazy spirit. I waited for Bryce to explode, but our man is like a stone. Bryce is one of a kind, I said. You have a minute? Alex shrugged, and when I asked, followed me back into Ezra's without complaint. Standing in the air purifier was a normal delay in any day. Now it made me anxious. Everything had me on edge. I wanted to sit down, have some coffee, and get some opinions. Bryce was standing up as we walked in, and, after seeing our faces, the man sighed and sat back in his chair, waved his hand at the bar for another pot of the black stuff. Thanks, I said, sitting down. I need some of that. You look like it, Bryce said. Alec, fill you in? There's no way I can get any help? Bryce nodded. 
The breach count is too high, and the number of guides we've got too low. Peter ordered us not to go after Graham. I was shaking my head as soon as Bryce finished. Not an option. Are you hearing this, Bryce? Alex said. Perhaps Carver spends too much time around me. My bad habits are starting to rub off. I ignored him, looked right at Bryce. I found my mother. I found Catherine. Bryce took the information in and sat with it for a moment. I took a sip of the fresh coffee, and Alec took turns looking at each of us, wondering who was going to talk next. How is she? Bryce finally asked. You can ask her yourself, I said. Tonight, you two are going to help me, and Catherine. We're going to go after Graham. We didn't do so well with that last time, Bryce said. It wasn't fair, an ambush, Alec interjected. Another try, with all of us together? Graham has no chance. Agreed, I said. This time, we'll have my mother helping us, too. If Peter finds out that we're disobeying orders, Bryce said, he could blind us. You're talking like an old man, Alec said. You, the one who is retiring? What concern could you have? Bryce laughed. How you've made it this long without getting blinded is a mystery to me. Peter would never dare, Alec said. I'm far too charming. That's definitely the reason, I said. I launched into the details, explained about Catherine's house in the shambles, about how Graham had bound her, how they thought I was a key to cross back from Riven into the real world. He's not wrong, Bryce said to Alec. They keep it quiet, that the right guide can serve as a gate. How do they do that? Alec said. How do they turn a living, breathing guide into a hole between Riven and reality? It's not easy, Bryce said. From what I understand, from what Catherine told me, is that it takes killing the guide in Riven and in the real world at the same time. The spirits meet in the middle and create the hole. I've got a solution, Alex said. Carver, I'm sorry, but if we kill you now, then we are all saved, correct? I glared at him. Ha. So it's tonight then, Bryce said. We go after him. One more time. Bring an end to it. Promises. The frame was up and the crews climbed all over the metalwork at the construction site, where, what seemed like an infinity ago, I followed the directions on Anna's card. This time, the foreman took a look at me and turned away. Didn't bother to wave. I hadn't cleaned out his sneak problem. Too bad. The door was open when I walked down the hallway to the room full of riven maps. I didn't bother being quiet. Lawrence gave me a scowl as he came out of one of the back rooms to greet me. Didn't think we'd see you again, Lawrence said, since you decided to do nothing for us. Is that what she told you? I replied. No help with the spirits, she said. Trust me, Anna's getting her own benefits from this relationship, I said. Speaking of, she around? Lawrence glanced behind them. She's back there wrapping up a consultation. I took a seat at the table and let my eyes run across the maps. Lawrence sat across from me. So how far have you gone? I asked, gesturing at the maps. Beyond the wall? Lawrence laughed. You guys really stick to your spots, don't you? Of course I've been beyond the wall. We can't just take the first spirit that walks into our path. We gotta work for it. Sometimes we get clients looking for someone that died a week ago. They're not sitting in the center of town waiting to be found. What's out there? I asked. Beyond the wall? I'm curious. Depends on your perspective, Lawrence said. I could see the change in his stance. He leaned forward over the table, and his eyes lost a bit of bite. His mouth moved away from the frown and into a thoughtful line. 
I think it's beautiful. Rolling forest. Not alive, of course, but the white trees with the dark leaves. The mountain in the distance. You should see it. That's just south and west of the city, towards the cycle. We haven't gone much in the other ways, but I've come close. One direction it looks like plain white grain as far as you can see. In another, it's rocks and hills. Like whomever put Riven together was trying to see how many different places they could cram into one little world. Behind Lawrence, the door opened, and a haunted-looking man came out and scurried by us. Didn't even bother to look my way or notice my mask. Behind him, Anna walked up to the table and took a seat next to Lawrence. He was telling me about the adventures you have outside the walls, I said. Lawrence likes to play a dangerous game. It's not fun out there, Anna said. You think the spirits are mean inside Riven? Try going beyond the walls. Things there will tear you apart in seconds. We go in groups, and we're always ready to run. Clients have to pay big if we go outside, Lawrence interjected. How about him? I said, nodding after the man who just left. Is his case a big one? Another lost loved one, Anna said. Only a day old. We'll find her, probably still in the Warrens. What I really like about the two of you is how you so obviously care for your clients, I said. Now you're one to talk, Lawrence said. All you do is burn people's memories into oblivion. You don't give a crap if they were someone's father, son, or anything. Wrangle him and let him go. You ever think maybe their families would want to know? Lawrence, Anna said, now's not the time. Fine, I said. You want to disagree on how we do things? Tell me how you can keep Riven from being overrun while still telling every family that their uncle went crazy and tried to take a chunk out of us. Lawrence opened his mouth, but, at a look from Anna, shut it and leaned back in his chair. Why are you here, Carver? Anna asked me. We're going after Graham tonight, I said. Told her all about my mother. The plan with Bryce and Alec. I don't want you in the fight. So why did you come at all? Because I want you to cross over with us. Then follow us and keep your eyes open. If something looks strange or there's a trap, I'll give you my sparker. You launch it and warn us if things look weird. I can do that, Anna said after a minute's silence. But I need you to help me first. Help you with what? I said. If you need cash, I can get Bryce to pay what he owes you for the investigation. You did find my mother, after all. No, back in Riven, Anna said, glancing at Lawrence. Do you have time now? Anna, Lawrence said. I don't think... What is it? I asked. We'll have to cross over, Anna said. You're being evasive, I replied. Because I don't think you'll like it, Anna said. If you want my help tonight, though, you have to help me now. Lawrence looked annoyed that I was being asked, which made me want to say yes. Besides... I had hours yet before tonight, before our raid. Fine, I said. Let's go. Anna led us to the back rooms, a pair of small chambers that only held beds. She went into one, shut the door, gestured for me to use the other. As I went in, Lawrence grabbed my arm. If you hurt her, Lawrence warned. I won't, I said. I need her for tonight. She'll be safe. She'd better be, Lawrence met my eyes. You're not the only one that needs her. Hidden Entry I crossed over into a sturdy, windowless room. Stacks of random stuff littered the area, from makeshift weapons to sketches of Riven's territories to lists of active investigations hanging on the walls. Anna was already there, setting her mace into its sheath. I was unarmed. All of my gear besides my coat was back over at the clock tower. Cozy, I said. It doesn't attract attention, Anna said. 
She seemed distracted, not looking my way or bothering with her usual snappy replies. Without anything further, she opened the door out and led us away. The room sat in the basement of a ruined apartment building, its upper levels leaning to the side and crumbling away, so any guide would avoid the building for fear of its collapse. I pointed that out to Anna, and she shrugged, kept on moving through the Warrens. Every so often, the two of us ducked into a storefront or slipped down an alley to avoid a passing pair of guides. I didn't recognize any of them. Other regions of the world were active at this point of the day. Stop, I said as we hunkered down behind a collapsed wall and waited for another group of guides to pass. I've gone along with you this far, but I'm unarmed and have no idea what you're leading me into. I need you to teach me, Anna said, to bind a spirit. Why? You've heard about the disease on the other side? The one that's spreading? A little? A couple of people I care about caught it, Anna said. They didn't survive. On the street in front of us, the pair of guides went by, looking at their resonator and oblivious to us. Anna, I started, but she was already moving. I followed, frowning. I wasn't in a great position to argue against binding spirits, but I'd barely made it away from Barth's tower with my life. Every unnecessary binding took a part of you away, strength and vitality that might be better kept at home. We reached a dilapidated ruin, a store that was nothing more than a collapsed roof and a single empty doorway. They're in here, Anna said, ducking in. I followed her in where the roof filtered some of the gray light, casting shadows throughout the rubble. At the back of the building, after stepping over and around chunks of broken wood and rock, Anna leaned down and opened a trap door, grasping and hauling on a metal ring. The door banged open, scattering ash flakes into the air. Someone had hung thick glass along the stairs leading down. Riven's gray light reflected its way into the depths, letting us see where to set our feet. You did this? I asked. It took a long time, Anna replied. Glass is hard to find. At the bottom, the light illuminated a short hall that ended in a dark iron slab, lifted and pressed with crude hinges into a faltering doorway. Lawrence helped, Anna said as we went up to the door. We had to dodge so many guides setting this up. I think that's part of why he's so hostile towards you. Everybody has their reasons, I said. What's behind the door? Anna didn't say anything, just reached out, grabbed the edge of the slab, and pulled it open. The slab creaked as it swung, revealing a room in shambles and a pair of spirits inside. That's when I noticed Anna had drawn the mace. The spirits turned towards us, a man and a woman. I caught the resemblance in the slight light. Their faces, height, everything matched the sneak standing next to me. I also saw the pale fire in their eyes. They're your parents, I said. I need you to help me bind them, Anna replied, not taking her eyes off of the spirits. Both of them were edging towards the doorway. Make them whole again, like you did with Nicholas. How long, Anna? I said, stepping back from the door, from those burning eyes. How long have they been down here? Almost a year, Anna whispered. I found them right away, after they passed. The two spirits started to growl, to hiss, crouched and readied themselves to run at the door. I grabbed Anna and pulled her back, slammed the slab shut. Your parents aren't in there anymore, I said. It's been too long. They didn't even recognize you. I thought you could bring them back. I thought binding would... A bound spirit is shielded from the cycle, I said, from its call. Like my coat keeps me safe from their bites. Binding doesn't do anything to the spirit beneath. The things in there aren't your mother and father anymore. 
Anna stared at me. Not a single tear dropped down her face. I had hoped, Anna said. Except, I think part of me always knew. When they stopped talking to me, when their eyes shifted, that they were gone. That's why we can't bind everyone we love, I said. We have to find them fast, before the anger takes hold, or the cycle claims them. I put my hand on her shoulder. You can give them peace, Anna. Send them on their way. This time, when I opened the metal slab, the two spirits were waiting by the door. They lunged, right into Anna, swinging her burning flail. Anna's aim was true, and moments later, the two spirits, black-eyed and blissful, walked up the stairs and outside of the basement. I'm sorry, I said. Anna didn't reply. She walked up after her parents. I followed, and we looked at the two spirits as they wandered down the road together into the hazy distance. I wanted to become a guide to save them, Anna said after a long moment. You did. Anna nodded. We stayed there in that ruined building, watching the ash drift and swirl along the empty apartments, until Anna gave a heavy sigh. You did your part, she said. I'll be there tonight. Thanks, I replied. There's one more thing we need to do first. One more stop. When Nicholas opened the door and I saw my mother standing behind him, I was stunned. What a change a single day of freedom could do for you. She'd lost the banded outfit, and, with Selena and Nicholas helping, now wore more traditional guide garb. With the cloak I'd brought her from the extras in the clock tower, she looked less like a terror of the night and more like a real person. The grit and grime from decades running around Riven wasn't entirely gone but she looked fresh. It feels strange, she said when I gave her the compliments. For so long I've been on my own, whatever I could cobble together out of the things I could find. Well, if you really try, Nicholas started before I held up a hand. Not everyone has your talents, Nicholas, I said. So, you think you're ready? My mother nodded. Graham is only going to get worse. He's going to find more breaches and compel more spirits to follow him. I've been meaning to ask, I said. How is he doing that? Is he actually binding all of them? Catherine shook her head. He talks to them. Graham's been a spirit for a long time, Carver. He calls to them in the voice that you cannot hear and gives them a cause, a home for the lost. You're saying Graham's forming relationships with these spirits? I'm saying that when you die, you cross into Riven, devastated and alone. Graham speaks to you, tells you what you are, where you are, and then offers you a way home. Catherine glanced towards Selena. It's a persuasive speech. The promise of a new life works on the hardest of hearts. When I first met Graham, he led me to a factory, ambushed me with an army of spirits, only all of them burned with anger. I didn't think a spirit would listen to anything past that point. It would be more difficult, Catherine said. However, it wouldn't surprise me if Graham found a way to connect with them. A rock rolling down a hill is difficult to budge, but if the effort is large enough, you can change its course. If I might change the subject... Nicholas interrupted. I would like to show you my latest tool. I believe it will be quite useful. One of these days, Nicholas, I'm going to teach you how to talk like a real human, I said. I believe that is an opinion, Carver, Nicholas said. My motor speech is not unqualified for... I get it, I said. Please, talk. Look, Nicholas said. Then he rushed over to a table that had a coat lying on it a large, thick, black number. He held it up, and in the gray light, I could see lines running all across it. 
down the back, along the arms, as though the entire thing were an art piece instead of clothing. It is beautiful, isn't it? Nice design, I said. Only I already have a coat. You'll like this better, Catherine said. Trust me. Nicholas gave my mother an appreciative nod. He slipped the coat on, shrugged. When Nicholas moved his shoulders, all of the lines on the coat lit up briefly, went bright blue for a second, before flashing back to the normal color. If a spirit touches one of these, they'll burn, Nicholas said. Selena and I, with the help of your mother, tested it earlier today. Perfect for wrangling when you're desperate. I ditched out of my coat and tried on the new one. A perfect fit. If what Nicholas was saying was true, and my mother seemed to agree, then this was a great addition. Nicholas, I said, have I ever told you how wonderful you are? Not enough, Nicholas said. Remind me to tell you next time, I replied. I looked around the living room with a new coat on, but didn't see Selena anywhere. Catherine caught my roaming gaze and nodded outside. The balcony, of course. Selena's favorite spot in the place. I figured a do-or-die mission against Graham required at least a cursory goodbye. Just in case. All together now. I found Selena outside on the balcony, looking over the skyline. There weren't as many sparks right now. The hour was a little odd. Too early for the night crew, while the day would be wrapping up their hunts. At least for my part of the world. You really like it out here, don't you? I said. Like? Selena replied with laughter on the edge of her voice. It's more that this is the only part of the apartment that's open. Nicholas has taken it all over. And now, with your mom there, it's crowded. You need to breathe. I was never one for crowds, Selena said. I prefer my own freedom. That's a little dramatic, isn't it? All you have here is freedom. You could go anywhere. I don't know that I really could. Selena turned away from me. If I venture much beyond this place, I might be found by another guide. Might be attacked by an angry spirit. Or I might find someone like Graham, who could mess with my head. We're going after him tonight. You won't have to worry about him anymore, I said. You know what? Selena replied. I still like it. Worrying. Having something to be afraid of. You always talk about how you love the hunts and going out there and having adventures. I like it too. I was thinking about that, I said. After this, once Graham is out of the way, let's go. I'll get Nicholas to make you some gear, and we can hunt together. Go with you? Bryce and my mother? They went on hunts for decades together. She was a spirit the whole time. I can teach you, and we can be a team. Explore all of Riven together. I watched her face. I didn't know how she was going to take the idea. On the one hand, it had to be more interesting than her current existence, wandering the streets around the apartment, playing test subject for Nicholas's experiments. On the other, she'd never been trained. She wasn't a guide or a soldier. Violence might be in her nature, but not the same way as it was for me. Yes, Selena said, and for the first time in a long time, her smile looked genuinely happy. I might not like all of it, but anything would be better than this. Besides, I would get to see you in action more often. See whether all the bragging you throw around is really earned. Believe me, it is, I replied. That means you have to come back alive tonight. Selena said. You can't let Graham win, because now you owe me. I owe you? You do. I'm the one that led you to your mother, after all. I believe I rescued you, I said. Only because I let you. I pulled her close then, laughing. There were few moments in my life when I'd been able to do that, 
Just enjoy seconds of free fun. No angry spirits attempting to kill me. No sarcastic undertones about how everything was grim and dark and doomed. No, for that moment on the balcony, Selena and I were two people enjoying one another and delighting in our words. I heard a new voice come in through the apartment. Bryce and my mother's happy exclamation at his arrival. I guess it's time to get ready, I whispered. I guess so, Selena said. A kiss for luck? Make it two. Chasing Graham Back inside the apartment, things were like a family reunion. Bryce and Catherine hugged each other and launched into questions and stories about what had happened over the last few years. Alec pulled Nicholas aside and asked him about the various things in the room, what this machine did, whether Nicholas could make Alec something fun. Selena and I, we stood and watched. When Anna came in a minute later, the whole thing was thrown into entertaining chaos yet again. The sneak, Bryce said. She arrives. She's carrying a weapon, Alec noted. A weapon, Nicholas said. That's a most rudimentary term. What Miss Anna carries is a thing of art, a wrecking ball that is nonetheless the embodiment of finesse. Nicholas is right. I'd avoid the wrong end of that one, I said, stepping into the fray. Introductions all around. Then we should go. I'm guessing Graham's not going to let us walk right in like last time. I hope not, Alec said. All of us, together? How unsatisfying if our foe is not at his best. As names were exchanged and roles described, I noticed Bryce flicking his eyes to Selena and I. Selena, who stayed towards the back, gave her name and nothing else when it was her turn. I'd probably have to answer questions about that later. And if this were a month ago, the thought would have had me worried. Now it seemed so trivial. Who cared? With everything at stake, there was no reason to worry about some love in my life. It took another hour, but we finally left the apartment. The five of us, myself, my mother Catherine, Bryce, Alec, and, trailing behind, Anna. She hadn't pushed against the role of reinforcement. I think seeing the kind of experience we had on the front lines communicated the type of fight we were walking into. That, perhaps, she wasn't ready for this yet. The walk to the tar pit seemed faster this time. Maybe it was because we all kept talking, laughing on our way to what promised to be a difficult fight. Like I said before, Riven took on a different cast when he traveled with a group. The deadly didn't seem so deadly anymore. The gray ash was more like snow. The ever-present, muted light seemed dramatic, creating the perfect atmosphere for us to visit a final end upon our adversary. We were four blocks into the tar pit, blocks away from the building we'd fought Graham at earlier, when our target strode out in front of us. Graham still wore that same top hat, carried that hammer with a spike, sported the long overcoat, that maniacal grin. Catherine, Graham called. I see you swapped sides. That's a shame. Amazing what free will can do for you, Catherine said. You should try it sometime. If you think free will is amazing, have a look at this, Graham replied, then brought a pair of fingers to his mouth and whistled. At least, that's what I thought. I couldn't hear anything. Catherine, though, winced. This isn't going to be good, Catherine said. Get ready. A moment later, the ground began to shake, a rumble of hard thumps pounding their way towards us. Alec threw me a look and I knew exactly what he was thinking. Ghouls. They burst onto the street, two of them, different than the one Alec and I had fought. The one on the right barreled towards us in a rolling mass. Instead of an endless supply of arms and legs, it seemed as though this ghoul was only made out of the former. No eyes, no mounds, 
just a thousand arms hooked into a central ball. The one on the left, that was even worse. It moved slowly, a pair of giant two-story legs curled up into a ball with a maw full of teeth, as though a million smiles had been shoved together, all their mismatched incisors jammed into one another to form a jagged infinite. We'll take the one on the right, Bryce called. We? I asked. Catherine and I. Like old times. That left Alec and myself. I waved to Anna to fall back, stay out of harm's way. Then I faced the monstrous thing. Each of the ghoul's toes were as large as I was, their gnarled nails protruding like dirty sheets of glass towards us. Alec threw a wink my way. At least this one doesn't have arms, Alec said. He ran towards it. Wait, I said drew my crossbow, and flipped one of the orange explosive bolts into the slot. Turned the crank as the ghoul came closer. Aimed. Fired straight into one of its many mouths. My aim was true, but then, from the target, a giant tongue snaked out and batted the bolt away. The missile struck a factory roof and exploded, well away from the ghoul. Guess we'll need to try something else, then. I lowered the crossbow. Besides, such a technique is no fun, Alec said. Alec met the ghoul's feet head on, rolling underneath an attempted kick. Springing at the back of the leg, Alec grabbed hold of the ghoul's calf and climbed up. His serrated gauntlets left burning blue gashes everywhere they touched. The ghoul howled its displeasure, but didn't seem to have a way to get to Alec or at least that's what I thought, until I saw that tongue come out again. The slimy thing snaked out, around and back behind its own leg, gripping Alec and pulling him off. Alec struck the tongue with his gauntlets, but the spirit ignored their burning pain and flung, with a sharp crack, the guide to the ground. Alec bounced off the street and lied there, groaning. Not our best start to a fight. The ghoul came closer, reached up a foot to step on Alec, and as it came down, I rushed underneath and jabbed upwards with my long knife. The ghoul's foot stomped onto the point, and it howled, a crazed scream that bore no resemblance to anything I'd ever heard before, high-pitched and ripping with static agony, like an emergency radio broadcast losing its signal. The ghoul tried to raise its foot back off of my knife, and lost its balance, fell backward, and collapsed its bulk onto the street. I followed the fall, climbed over the foot, and began running up the leg, uncurling my lash as I went. I saw the tongue come out, looping its way into the air, pointing at me and darting down. I snapped the lash, and it wrapped around the tongue as it came towards me, pulled to the side, jerking the tongue to the right as it went by missing me by inches. Then I twisted my hand and sent the pale fire running along the lash through the point and into the tongue. The ghoul spasmed at the pain, ripping the lash from my grasp and flailing around trying to get the burning cord off. That gave me time, time to run up the rest of the leg to the edge of that mouth. I pulled the crossbow off my back, used a lever to crank a blue bolt in place when the ghoul started to snap towards me, to stand up. If I fell from the lip of the mouth to the street, I was going to get hurt, bad. Or worse, I could fall into those teeth and get carved up into a thousand pieces. Stay focused, Alec called, and as the ghoul tried to get its feet under it, my friend carved his way into the ghoul's right ankle, pounded on it with his gauntlets, and burned through the support, lifting the ghoul upright. I kept myself balanced, my feet on the edge where the ghoul's leg ran into the bottom of its mouth. Precarious, but as long as the ghoul was lying on the ground, I could stand. The lever clicked when the bolt was tight, and I aimed it into that gnashing maw, around the flailing tongue, and fired. This time, the ghoul couldn't deflect it, couldn't dodge it, and the wrangling fire burst out inside the beast. 
an inferno of pale blue reckoning. Unlike the first ghoul, the one Alec and I had fought around the palace, this one didn't disintegrate into nothing. Rather, the wrangling fire split apart the spirits that had come together to form the ghoul in the first place. The blue fire spread up and down the length of the ghoul's body, and out of it crawled a dozen soldiers, their spirits looking around in utter confusion. They'd stand that way for a moment until the cycle took hold and began urging them along their final journey. I picked up my lash from where, when the tongue ceased to exist, it had fallen. Then I looked to see whether Bryce and my mother were still alive. Cornered The easiest way to describe how my mother and my mentor fought was to say that it was like watching a tornado of razor blades. The ghoul looked hapless and lost as it flailed its many arms around, trying to catch Bryce and Catherine. My mother, with her hooked batons, used every swing to give herself leverage for her next one, looping around the ghoul at lightning speed and leaving slashes of blue fire everywhere she touched. Bryce, his volge split into two halves, stabbed and rolled along the outside of the ghoul, darting in and out of the grabbing arms and leaving burning holes wherever he struck. By the time our ghoul finished disintegrating into a mess of spirits, its opposite was less a creature and more a ball of blue gashes. In a few moments after that, the pale fire lines that the two guides had left were burning up and over the ghoul. Another ten soldiers emerged from the ghoul's vanishing corpse, blank-eyed and ready for the cycle. I think we killed ours through luck, I said. They took care of theirs with skill. You mean you didn't intend for me to get thrown into the street, Alec said, because I was hurt and you didn't seem to care. I was waiting for my moment. Next time, perhaps you wait a little bit less, yes? Alec replied. I don't know. It worked out pretty well. Alec shook his head and walked over to greet Bryce and Catherine. Showered them with compliments on their victory. I looked for Graham, but the man had disappeared. He vanished right away, Anna said, coming up. I guess he didn't think his creatures would win. He's buying time. I said, or maybe he thought he would get lucky. With what happened to Alec, he wasn't far off. You have to take close calls as victories, I said, especially in Riven, especially tonight. After we collected ourselves, the five of us continued heading deeper, towards Graham's building. Catherine and Bryce chattered back and forth most of the way, commenting on how nice it felt to be back together doing what they did best. It almost made me jealous, seeing the two of them talking so fast with one another. A relationship with my mother that I would never have. That close friendship and the bond of countless shared experiences. At least, I didn't have it then. Maybe now, there was a chance. Graham's building stood in front of us, glowing from the inside. It was hard to tell from what, but in the gray light of Riven, it looked as though some sort of green lightning flashed from inside the building steps. We all stared at it, out there in the street, in silence for a moment. Anybody have any guesses? I asked. Not a guess, Catherine said. There's a breach in there, a big one. That's what he was waiting for, Bryce said. He must have noticed so many soldiers crossing through at this point claimed the building, and waited for the breach. If we don't take him tonight, he's going to push farther. There's no if, I said. Graham is going to the cycle. We're ending it. Anyone ever tell you that you have a flair for this sort of thing? Alec said. The dramatic, I mean. It gets old, doesn't it? Anna added. I'm trying to pump us up, I said trying to be a team player here. We all appreciate it, Carver. My mother gave my shoulder the lightest, most patronizing pat. Thanks. It was time to get this fight underway. The strategy was simple. Bryce and I go in the front door while Alec and Catherine scale the wall, 
get up that second story and take care of any ambushing spirits, so Graham couldn't get the drop on us like he did before. Anna keeps an eye on the outside, lets us know if there's problems coming in, fires the sparker if she needs to. Ideally, Bryce and I would keep Graham engaged long enough for Catherine and Alec to complete the sweep. The four of us trap Graham in the courtyard and finish it. Bryce and I made it all the way to the front door before things fell apart. A Hammer and Lash I reached for the twin handles on the door to get into the building, but as my hand came close, the doors blew open. The force knocked me back down the steps. When I looked back to see what slammed the doors open, I saw a mad spirit biting at my face. Then Bryce's Volge cut through the spirit and flung it away, burning it up with pale blue fire. I scrambled up to my feet and was set on by another pair. I worked the knife and the lash, sending the first one to the ground with pale blue fire wrapping around its legs while I kept the second dancing away from the knife's point. There were more spirits behind it, a wave of them bustling out through the door. Bryce whirled into them, going through a dance and sweeping the Volge up and down, raking through spirits as they tried to grab hold of him. There was no place for caution here. Slowing down would mean being overwhelmed. Should we help? Alec yelled from the outside of the building. He was almost at the second level, my mother already climbing over through the open windows. Stick to the plan, Bryce said. The man was braver than me. I wouldn't have minded Alec's gauntlets right about then. I charged the second spirit and caught it by surprise, lunging forward with my knife and spearing it. The spirit fell away, blue fire crawling all over it. I continued up the stairs, back to the door. I'd fought with Bryce enough times to know how to work with him, how to use the lash to catch any spirits that he missed with the spear, and soon we were making our way through. Spirits fell, one after another, caught by the pointed burning end of my lash, or Bryce's volge. Except there were always more, and they clogged the hallway. Bryce and I would get tired eventually, make one mistake, and get torn apart. When I yell, dive back, I said. Bryce grunted in acknowledgement, dodging a spirit's raking hand. I noticed all the spirits here were wearing soldiers' uniforms, but different ones, with various countries' styles on them. Riven didn't discriminate, and neither did Graham. The soldiers who died bitter enemies worked together to kill us. I slipped the lash back in its holster and drew the crossbow, flipped the second of my three orange bolts into the firing slot, and turned the crank. I watched as I turned the lever. Bryce ducked under a pair of grasping arms, only he wasn't quite fast enough, their hands grabbing and tearing at his coat. Another two spirits dove at his legs, knocking Bryce on his back. Bryce swept the volge down across his body, cutting off the spirit's wrists and freeing himself from their hands, but the endless wave was going to crash over him. Get back now, I called, and pulled the trigger. Aimed the bolt just above the first row of spirits. As it flew, the bolt sank just enough to strike one in the back. I didn't see the impact, but saw the orange-blue explode upward and outward, its rays decimating their way through the ranks. Every time Nicholas's energy leapt to another spirit, it feasted on the creature and then jumped to the next one. As Bryce scrambled back, the front wave of spirits surged forward, reaching for him and trying to escape the doom at their backs. One by one, they went up in the orange fire. The last one, its hand an inch from Bryce's feet, evaporated into nothing. What was that? Bryce asked. Secret weapon, I said, looking at the empty hole in front of us. Let's go. They're gone, Bryce said, looking at the empty hall, standing up and matching my stride. I don't know what's going to happen if those spirits don't make it to the cycle. Promise I won't use it too much, I said. I figured there were always more spirits. It wouldn't matter a whole lot if a few dozen never made it home. I hoped. We scrambled down the hallway and looked into the courtyard. 
or what had been the courtyard. The ash-covered grounds, where I'd been torn apart last time, were covered in the glowing green mess of a breach. On the other side of the hole, we could see the bright flashes of an ongoing battle, a trench full of bodies as bullets flew back and forth and exploded in front of our eyes, a portal to a world just as deadly as the one we were in, a window into our home. You think I'm a monster, Graham said, stepping out from behind a pillar. You think it would be so terrible for all of these poor souls losing their lives in a meaningless fight to come back and have another chance. And I'm the evil one? That's not the way it works, Bryce said. It's a one-way road. There are no guarantees. No second chances. Then you won't mind following in their footsteps, Graham said. The spirit that had been my father charged Bryce and me, his hammer raised. Behind him, from the breach, more spirits crawled out. Whatever time the crossbow had brought us, it was running out. Desperate Times Bryce snapped his volge together and met Graham's strike head on, clashing his weapon against Graham's hammer swing. With his left, Graham raised his fist and sent a burning wire right into Bryce's face. The wire wrapped itself around Bryce's head and lit up, causing Bryce to backpedal and drop his volge. Graham followed, raising the hammer for another swing when I hit him with my lash. The whip curled around Graham's hammer arm and I pulled it back towards me, spinning the spirit around and bringing his malevolent gaze to meet my own. Haven't we already had this fight? Graham growled. Don't we know how it ends? This time it's going to be different, I replied, and pulled back on the lash again, drawing Graham towards me while keeping his hammer arm extended. No way for him to swing the hammer with any momentum. I had the knife ready in my left hand, until a spirit tackled me from behind and drove me to the floor. I felt Graham jerk the lash out of my grip as the spirit on my back clawed me through my cloak. I thought about activating the coat Nicholas had given me and burning away the spirit. I held back. Graham didn't know about the coat, and I wanted to keep my surprises hidden. Incoming! Alec yelled landing next to me and pulling the spirit off. His gauntlets wrangled the spirit, and their flame culled its anger. No ambush on the second floor. All the fun is down here. Thanks, I said, pushing myself to my feet. I looked up as Catherine joined us on the ground, mixing it up with Graham already, trying to keep him off of Bryce, who was busy peeling off the burning wire. My mother was faster than Graham and kept him moving, occasionally landing strikes with the batons, while Graham used the hammer more to create distance than actually try to hit her. If I could get behind him with my knife... I'm going to need some help, Alec said, looking behind me. I turned that way and saw another five spirits climb out of the breach, their pale fire eyes turning towards us. Keep them busy, I said. We get Graham. This fight is over. Not entirely true, but I figured if Graham was gone, then dealing with more spirits wouldn't be a problem. So I ran at Graham's back as Catherine circled him away from us, ready to thrust a stab in between Graham's shoulders. As I closed, I noticed my mother's eyes slip away from Graham to meet mine, and that was all the clue that Graham needed. He turned a swipe of his hammer into a full spin, bringing it to meet me. I had to throw the knife up to block, and the hammer battered it away, sending it bouncing along the ground and leaving me weaponless. Catherine tackled Graham from behind, striking him with her batons. The baton's blue fire burned, but Graham shrugged her off, threw her into the wall at the edge of the courtyard. He's too strong, Bryce said. We have to work together. My mentor stood, slowly, a burning line crossed his face, running along Bryce's nose and cheek, then around and behind his head. 
Bryce held his bulge up, set his feet. I drew the crossbow, and Graham looked at both of us, laughed. Even with all of you here, you can't hope to win, Graham said. You'll be overwhelmed in minutes, torn to shreds. Careful, I said. Your crazy is showing. I fired a blue bolt right at him. Graham moved fast, ducking it, but the move gave Bryce an opening. His bulge slashed across Graham's shoulder, and Bryce quickly turned the swing, sending the bulge back, point first, and stabbing into Graham's back, pinning Graham down into the ground. I can't hold them! Alec yelled. The call came at the worst time. Bryce and I looked and saw ten spirits, with more crawling up behind them. Alec was a dervish, slicing up the spirits as fast as he could, but I saw more than a few scratches on the guide. As I looked, four spirits converged on Alec, two grabbing his arms, while the second pair raked at Alec's chest and face. Help him, Bryce said, but we'd taken too long. Graham caught the hesitation, and, still on the ground, swept Bryce's legs out from under him. With the bulge still sticking out of his back, Graham stood, turned to me. Carver! I heard my mother's voice, glanced as she threw my knife back to me. She jumped into the fray next to Alec, batons flying and scattering the spirits holding my friend, buying us a bit of time. When I turned back, Graham raised his hammer. Come on, Graham said. Show me that you deserve to be a guide. I hefted the knife, tiny next to Graham's hammer. But before my father could come after me, he screamed. Pain, surprise. Bryce had knifed Graham in the leg. Bryce was about to twist the hilt when Graham, reaching behind his back, pulled out Bryce's volge and, in one smooth movement, stabbed Bryce with his own weapon. I yelled, but I wasn't sure what. My vision went hazy, a film of red cast over everything. Anger, terror, and frustration boiling over at seeing my mentor and teacher for these last twenty years struck so terribly. The volge stood up like a sinister grave, marking Bryce as he shuddered on the ground, speared. Knowing nothing else, seeing nothing other than Graham standing over Bryce, I charged, took two quick steps, and leapt at the spirit. Graham twisted at me as I hit him and knocked him over Bryce, drove him into the wall, and stabbed him with the knife. But even then, even with surprise and reckless anger working for me, I couldn't catch hold. My knife tore through Graham's coat, but he slithered out of its reach, pulled me aside, and pushed me away. If you had given yourself to me, Graham said, then your friend would still be alive. Never, I said, though Graham's words struck home. I could have. I could have given him the path he wanted, the path back, and none of this would have happened. I saw, in the corner of my eyes, Alec and my mother, overwhelmed by the growing number of spirits, driving them back towards us, raking and tearing at their arms and legs. In front of me, limping, weak but still deadly, Graham. One hole back to the real world, one life, and this could have all been erased. Don't give up, I heard Bryce's voice, slight, scratched. Close the breach. I saw on his belt the same device we'd used earlier, the tablet with the sapphire. It glowed, ready. I returned Graham's glare with one of my own. I'm not done yet. I threw the knife at Graham, and he raised the hammer for the block. I used that time to run towards Bryce, reached down and scooped the device off of his belt, ran towards the center of the breach. Give me an opening, I shouted. The two guides, one current, one former, pressed their backs to one another, and then, using broad strokes, cleared out a path. 
a small hole through which I could see the rippling green glow of the breach and the war happening on the other side. I ran through that hole, squeezed between a thousand grasping fingers, and dove into the center of the breach, pressed down on the sapphire, and felt its glow explode out around me. Azure tendrils reached out into the green and began to tear up and shatter the image of the real world to bring Riven back together. The spirit stopped fighting as the sapphire's tendrils reached out and caught them too, wrangled them as the device closed the breach. Except one. Alec didn't see Graham coming, didn't see the hammer as it smashed down into his back, the spike crushing through his coat. With his left hand, Graham blasted my mother with another wrist wire, circling around her leg and knocking her to the ground. As I stood up from where the breach had been, Graham looked over at me. If you want her, follow. Graham picked up my mother with his left hand and dragged her away. I ran to Alec's crumpled form, sprawled out on the ground. A dozen pacified spirits stared at us. He wasn't in good shape. Alec's chest barely rose and fell. His eyes were closed. I looked over Bryce and saw the same. The man's hands weren't moving. The volge still stuck there, pinning my mentor to the rock. I wanted to help them, to drag them back to the clock tower. But if I let Graham get away, then this was all for nothing. Forgive me, I said as I stood up and left. I went out to the street. Graham was a block away, moving quickly with my mother in tow, a pair of shadows sifting through Riven's haze. Anna? I called. I'm here, Anna said, stepping out from behind a building. Shoot the sparker, I said. Bryce and Alec need help. The blue lights launched into the sky. I had her use all of it, create a show. Any guide seeing that would know there was something wrong. Any guides in the tar pit or the central part of Riven City would see that and come running. If Bryce and Alec were going to make it out of this alive, it would be up to them. A Final Choice My heart burned at leaving Bryce and Alec behind. Nobody wanted to abandon their friends. But if I didn't follow, Graham would have my mother. He'd just set up another breach. Find another army like the one we'd already dealt with. Anna looked at me like I was crazy, but she stayed by my side. You sure they'll be found? Anna asked. There'll be dozens of guides in Riven right now, I said. Some would have seen the sparks. They'll come. They'll come. What happened in there? I told her as we walked, replayed the desperate fight, the back and forth against the overwhelming spirits. We had expected a breach, but not for one so large, with spirits so angry. As I talked, we kept moving after Graham. Anna matched my speed, and we caught up to the spirit. As we closed, Graham looked back at us, my mother in his left hand and the hammer in his right. I could see my mother wasn't moving. He'd either knocked her out or threatened her with something so terrible that kept her from fighting. If you come any closer, Graham said, it will be the end of her. Follow me at that distance. I thought about using the crossbow, taking a shot at Graham's back, but the statement made me curious. Follow where? Graham was taking us westward towards the edge of Riven City, towards the wall. She said you were my father, I called to Graham as we moved, that you two were a team. Why would you do this to her? You don't always have control, Graham said, and for the first time, I picked up a note of sadness in his voice. We met a spirit. His name was Barth, I said. Anna next to me, took the cues and kept silent. Must have been a sneak's instinct. To listen when there was important information at play. Barth was a fool, Graham said. 
He had no method. All he had was hope. What do you have? I asked. I have you, Graham said. I have my son, the key. We left the tar pit and moved into the last bit before the wall, a section of wide open pavilions, a place that would have served as a market if Riven had ever been a real city. In front of us, the wall appeared through the haze, five stories high and made of stacked stone. I'd only seen the wall on a couple of occasions, both long journeys with Bryce. Few of the wall's stones had any cracks, and the stairs on the inside that led to the ramparts were all there, as though Riven City devoted what energy it had left to keeping the wall intact. Who is controlling you? I said. Barth mentioned you, mentioned a master. I can't tell you that. Graham said. The master forbids it. You never mentioned anything about a master, Anna said to me. I thought this was all about Graham. Tonight it is, I said. Tomorrow, maybe not. Graham led us to the stairs up the wall, to a tower next to the gate leading outside. With my mother still in his arms, Graham began the limping walk up to the top. We followed waiting until Graham gave us the nod to come up behind him. Halfway up, Graham told us to stop. Here, you'll have to make a decision, Graham said. Carver, you've come this far. You've seen your friends fall, your mother captured. How much more are you willing to lose? I asked you once about a gateway home. Now I ask you again. Give up yourself and save the ones you love. I took a deep, unsatisfying breath of Riven's non-air. If I charged Graham now, he'd either kill my mother or use his better vantage point to strike me down. So I did the only thing I could. Take me, I said. I'm done. What? Anna said her eyes going wide as I went up the steps and left her behind. Carver, what are you doing? Don't worry, I said. It's just the end of the world. I stepped out onto the top of the tower. Behind me, Riven spread out like a charred ruin, its gray and ashen structures falling apart forever. Still, it was a home of sorts. I'd wandered its alleys, climbed its buildings, and explored its secrets for so long that it didn't seem like an alien place. In fact, I realized, Riven was more of a home to me than Chicago, than the real world. On the other side, over the wall, a dense forest began a hundred yards from the gate, interlocking trees of white and thick clusters of black leaves. Not truly alive, not entirely dead. The forest continued onto a horizon where, barely, I could pick out the outline of a mountain. Somewhere back there, according to rumor, was the cycle. If I looked over the wall to the left, I could pick out spirits working their way around from the shambles and entering the forest on the long walk to nothing. The master wanted this place, Graham said. Likes the view, I suppose. I don't care. Let's get this over with, I said. Graham set my mother down, and I saw her eyes open. She looked at me, her face curling into a question. I lied down on the cold stone next to her, and reached out with my right hand, found hers, and gripped it tight. Graham stood over us and raised the hammer. I saw it, the same look Graham had in his eyes earlier, the same expression Barth had. He was receiving instructions. I have been getting here, Graham said to nobody. We are ready to begin. We laid there, my mother and I, for what felt like forever. 
It was moments. But when you have a maniacal spirit standing over you with a giant spiked hammer, the seconds feel long. He's not there, Graham said, glaring down at me. With his left hand, he gripped the collar of my coat and pulled me up. Where are you? Back home. Nowhere you'll ever find me, I replied. Then did as Nicholas said, shrugged my shoulders, and let the lines on the coat ignite. Graham jerked back as the fire ran up his arms. I was ready for the fall, caught myself, and made my move. Took the knife from my belt with my left hand and stabbed forward, twisting the hilt. Graham didn't expect it. The knife slid between his ribs, and the pale fire spread out over his body. There was nowhere to slip away, no way to dodge. As the fire crawled over him, Graham's eyes met mine. He smiled. Redemption I stood over my father, or the spirit that had been him. As the pale fire died away, Graham stood up and stared at me with blank eyes. No expression on his face, ready to go to the cycle. Bind him, my mother said. We need what he knows. I reached out and took Graham's hand. He looked at me, then down at our grip, expressionless. His hammer sat on the ground next to us. Just a moment ago, he'd been perhaps the deadliest thing in Riven. Now, he was nothing. I could just let him go, all the way to oblivion. Instead, I searched for the pinprick, found it, and nearly passed out. I was exhausted. I already had three bound spirits. My mother, Selina, and Nicholas. Another would take too much out of me. I might be able to walk, keep that sarcastic mouth of mine, but in a fight, I would be useless. Thankfully, I wasn't the only one in the tower. Anna, I said, you want to be a guide? I don't like the way you're saying that, Anna replied, coming up the steps. I need you to bind him. Take Graham and make him yours. Anna hesitated. Are you sure that's the right thing to do? It's the only way, I said. If we ever want to figure out who is behind this, we'll need Graham. I'll walk you through it. Please, my mother said. I glanced at her and saw something I didn't expect to see in her eyes. She was giving out a pleading look. I realized she didn't want Graham to go. Didn't want to lose the man that she had loved. The man she'd worked with for decades. Didn't want to see him vanish into nothing just when she'd found her own way back to a new life. Anna saw that, or at least I thought she did, because when Anna looked at me next, her face was determined. Anna walked up and took Graham's hand, pushing mine out of the way. Tell me what to do, Anna said. Concentrate on your touch, I said. Where you feel his hand, you'll notice something small like the tiniest poke you've ever felt. I feel it. Anna closed her eyes. What do I do? Focus on it, I said. You'll feel it open, like a drain wanting to suction you away. Let it. The only clue was her sharp intake of breath. Anna shivered, and her hand clenched even tighter on Graham's. Then it was over. When binding a spirit, you knew when you'd filled that well, when the drain stopped asking for more. Anna stepped back from Graham, let go of his hand. My father's spirit looked at her, still in that ridiculous hat, and nodded. Thank you. New Roles The doors opened on the eighth floor of the Chicago Medical Center. I took a breath, 
the sweet, sterile, real air coming in through my bruised lungs. Stepped in with Anna behind me and walked past a series of patient rooms towards a large one in the corner. One that had a doctor I recognized standing outside, studying sheets of paper. Carver Reed, Dr. Barrington Farth said as I walked up. Who's this? A new addition to our group? Anna, Anna said. And maybe. Not up to me, I said. Anna, this is Dr. Farth. He oversees any problems the Chicago guides have. Two of those problems are in there right now, Farth said. Close calls. I'd prefer you keep to the usuals. Broken bones and bruised egos. They're alive? Dr. Farth looked at me over his glasses, his eyes at once skeptical and admonishing. I believe they'll stay that way, though I'd be more confident if they kept out of Riven for a while. I nodded, and Dr. Farth stepped aside, waving us in. The room had two beds, facing a large window, looking out over Chicago's cityscape. Each of those beds held a guide. Bryce in one, Alec in another. Of the two, Alec was the only one awake, and the heaviness of his eyelids said consciousness was hard to maintain at the moment. Tell me, you took care of him, correct? Alec asked. She did, I said, nodding to Anna. He's bound to her now. That would be a feisty binding, Alec said. Be careful not to lose him. Would hate to have to clean up after your mess. I'm not the one in the hospital bed, Anna replied. I shouldn't be here long. Just broken ribs and a punctured lung. Crossing isn't as effective when you're nearly dead. Giant hammers will do that to you. I said. Bryce stirred in the other bed. It was hard to look at him. His skin was pale, and the jagged red outline of a burn traced its way around his eyes. From what I could see, large bandages wrapped around his chest, evidence of more than a few injections to kill the pain. He pulled himself awake anyway. I know what you're thinking, and I can still see that ugly face of yours, Bryce said. Graham didn't quite blind me, didn't quite kill me. You heard what I said, I replied. Graham's done with, it's over. It's not though, is it? For you, anyway. What do you mean? Barth and his master, you're not going to let that go, are you? Eventually, I said. I meant it but I wasn't in great shape. Alec and Bryce weren't either. Anna was fresh to the experience, charging back in after some unseen enemy that had managed to control two of the more powerful guides out there wasn't what I wanted to do that afternoon. You should know, Bryce said. I'm not coming back. I said I was retiring, and this is it. You'll have to tell Peter for me. You're not coming back? I should be dead, Bryce replied. It was a miracle those guides from New York found us, brought us back and kept us awake long enough to cross. Dr. Farth says some of these wounds won't heal. I can't risk leaving my family behind. We kept talking for a while longer, but I didn't remember much after that sentence. My mentor was gone, wasn't going to be back with us. If we were going to go and find this master, Anna, Alec, and I would do it without Bryce. Carver, Bryce said as we made to leave the room. His eyes had closed. Alec was already asleep, a real sleep. Finish it. Find the one who did this to us. Make them pay. I will, I said. Anna and I split on the way to Ezra's. She had to touch base with Lawrence and get back to some of her clients. 
I had to have an unpleasant chat with the leader of the guides. Peter looked confused, sitting alone with the coffee at our table. When I came in, the man gave me a half-hearted grin, stood up, and reached out to shake my hand. As I told him what had happened, that grin replaced itself with a frown. At the end, he shook his head. A guide retiring in a time of war, Peter said. If it were any other, I would call him a coward. But Bryce has put in more years than most of us. He deserves it, I said. Of course, Peter replied. Though I'm disappointed that the three of you disobeyed my orders. Went after that rogue spirit, despite the risks. But we won, I said. Graham is gone. To the cycle, Peter asked. I wasn't sure how to answer the question. Anna wasn't a guide, and therefore was forbidden from binding spirits. I could say that I bound Graham, but then Peter would want to know why. That wasn't a road I was ready to walk. So I just nodded. I'd tell Peter everything when it made sense. The leader of the guides sighed at my gesture. Then at least one more soul is put to rest, Peter said. Now, with Bryce leaving and Alec incapacitated, Chicago is in need of a leader, a guide to represent the city. You. I'm not ready, I said, without thinking about it. It doesn't matter, Peter replied. There's no one else. I have to leave today. I'm heading overseas to try and do what I can to put an end to this war. I leave you in charge of the city, Carver Reed. May you protect her well. With one last sip of his coffee, the leader of the guides left me in charge. The Next Chase I thought my apartment would be a wreck. When I got up to my floor, I noticed my door was knocked ajar, hanging out on one hinge. Whomever had gone in there had done so in a hurry. Inside, though, the only messy thing was the bed. Sheets thrown away to other sides of the room. Evidence they had been moved to check if I was underneath. I figured the plan had been to kill me in both worlds at the same time except they couldn't find me in this one. The danger with Riven and crossing from places you didn't know is that you couldn't be sure where you'd come in. You might be miles from where you wanted to be or appear in a dangerous place without any of your equipment, without any backup. So before we started our run last night, I moved what I needed from the clock tower to the Warrens, to the small room that Anna and Lawrence crossed into every time from the construction site. Nobody had been here when Graham was ready with his hammer. And if the lock wasn't going to open, why destroy the key? I put my door back as best as I could, laid down on the bed, and crossed into Riven. I didn't expect them to come back for me, whomever it had been, because unless they had me strung up and ready to die in Riven, it wouldn't do any good to kill me back home. The apartment was crowded now, Nicholas working at a feverish pace to load out Selena, Catherine, and now Graham. The four spirits were huddled together in the living room, discussing what they wanted for weapons and tools. And when I entered, they fell silent and looked at me. I held up a hand in a friendly wave. Any ideas? I'm working with him, Catherine said. Unfortunately, it seems whomever bound him did a good job covering his tracks. It's like there's a hole in my mind, Graham said. A blank spot. Try and find a way through, I said, because I don't think he's going to stop, whether that's coming from me or tormenting others. Selina came up and took my arm. Let me show you something Nicholas made for me. We went to the balcony. Selina wasn't wearing the same dress she had been before. Now she wore a thick coat 
one that reached down to her ankles with sleeves that covered her wrists. A guide cloak, with her hair pulled back tight. She turned away for a moment and reached into the coat's pocket and pulled out a pair of blades. One long and thin, like my knife. The other thick and wide, a cleaver brought to larger proportions, meant for more than cutting meat. Along the cleaver's front edge, spines struck out like angry teeth. Nicholas made it from some of his old machines, Selena said. He thought it would be fitting. You were killed with something like that, I said. That's why it feels right, Selena replied. Now I need practice, a teacher. Selena looked at me and then out from the balcony. The occasional spark lit up the gray sky as Riven continued its constant dance. Spirits coming and going, guides finding and finishing the ones that wanted to stay. For the last few days, I hadn't been filling a quota. I'd been hunting a single spirit. It would be nice to get back to the usual until we found the master. Are you ready for your first lesson? I asked. I've been waiting for a long time. Just because I love you, I said, doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Selena gave me a wicked grin. Nothing with you ever is. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Riven by A.R. Knight. Read for you by J. Ossing. Presented by Black Key Books. This program was produced by Simplify Productions. Text copyright 2017 by A.R. Knight. Production copyright 2023 by A.R. Knight. All rights reserved.